3, 2, 1, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are, and for some ungodly reasons to have a boredom to watch the shows that I'm producing. Welcome to the 13th edition of the World Sofa Report. As always, alongside with me is my co-host, Viktor Krajnik. Shalom. The 13th episode. Uh, isn't that supposed to bring bad luck or something? Uh, well, at least we're not taking it on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> So it doesn't apply. Yeah, it's only a, it's merely a Thursday, mm. um, but you know we'll see whether uh, towards the end of the show maybe some smoke will blow out of a camera, <laughs> or, or one of these lights will <laughs> explode, or something, or maybe we get the coof. I mean, you know. Mm-hmm. But. Uh, things can happen. Uh, we remind you that this show exists solely because you support it financially, so please keep shekel him, uh, because otherwise uh, the show gets quarantined, as it happened <laughs> <laughs> over the yeah, last it month. For a month we, um, I started personally getting the, um, what could you call it, the... Sofa anxiety? No, you can't exactly say it's sofa anxiety, but it's it's the podcast withdrawal syndrome. <laughs> withdrawal, <laughs> right, right. But it was for a noble cause. I mean, we had to trigger some protests in this country, change the health minister and you know, things like that. I mean, so, <laughs> there were very important issues to uh, take care of uh, while the, both of the podcasts were quarantined. And besides, you got the occasional podcast episode mm. three. Uh, so it's not like it was all... Uh, what would you call it, dearth uh, on this channel. Uh, if you want to curse at us or send us news or God forgive, uh, forbid to praise us, topics at freedomalternative.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, we promise to attempt to read them. Uh, <laughs> don't forget to subscribe on our BitChute profile as well. And by the way, Gibbs Crypto, so we can maintain that profile there. Uh, just with the last video, the interview with the chap from 1776 mm. turned out to be a very good uh, investment, uh, having a, a bet you'd back about backup because for some reason, uh, YouTube decided that constitutional awareness is uh, mm. is an adult-only topic. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> Yeah, we, we, uh, we realized that that South African chap of ours uh, noticed that it's an age-restricted video. Y- yes. Probably yeah. because you talked about the uh, guns and Second Amendment, <laughs> which uh, is apparently haram uh, by YouTube standards. Yeah, but standards. you know, isn't Second Amendment being taught in schools, like, to seven-year-olds? Uh, yeah, but, um, but, but but don't you know, on uh, when, when in Rome you behave like Romans, when in when on YouTube you behave like... Uh, like, how, the like, soy, however, uh, like the soys who run this <laughs> platform, right? Uh, but yeah, yeah, you know, but they decided that it's an adult-only topic. Um, I filed a complaint against it. Usually I win these kinds of complaints. Maybe I'll win this one too. But if I don't, it is what it is. Uh, so yeah, that's why it's useful to have a BitChute backup because at least on BitChute they don't really give a damn. Yeah, and, about... they, st- and they stopped sucking gas recently. Uh, yeah, well, most recently it also started to kind of work uh, in the sense that I no longer regret daily giving them money, <laughs> uh, but merely weekly. I mean, the uh, last Romanian language episode uh, took two days to uh, have it up, so it's still kind of terrible, but not as terrible as it was uh, one year ago. Yeah, we, we got to show the Joe Rogan to move on the shoot mm. <laughs> so that they start moving their asses when it's, when it's about for multi-hour long podcasts. <laughs> yeah, 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 right, right. I mean, yeah, probably if Joe Rogan would open up a, a podcast or a channel on BitChute, mm. uh, it would become uh, more friendly uh, for <laughs> six hours or five hours long mm. videos. Uh, speaking of which, since we've been uh, out for uh, quite some time, hopefully we don't go too much over the four-hour mark. Um, then they'll break the tradition too much. I mean, in nearly 13 episodes and already talking about breaking the tradition, <laughs> that's not good, a good sign. Maybe yeah. I'll forcibly edit it <laughs> so, <laughs> so I can stay somewhere yeah. around the four hours. Yeah. Do, do you indeed have a lot of stuff happen since uh, we've done the previous episode? Uh, yes, and the, in addition to the P, to the news that, the, uh, that we are going to present, obviously we're going to have to make uh, connections with various other pieces of news that are not on the file for this episode. Mm. In any event, starting off, of course, with America's Reuters, the United States Senate readying legislation on semiconductors, says Biden. U.S. Senate leaders are preparing to introduce legislation on semiconductors, Joe Biden said on Wednesday, as the nation wrestles with an ongoing shortage of the critical technology used in a range of devices from cars to computers. We're working on that. Chuck Schumer and I think Mitch McConnell are about to introduce a bill along the lines, uh, Biden said during remarks about his own plan to boost the nation's infrastructure. Schumer and McConnell's offices did not immediately comment. The White House is said to hold a virtual summit on the issue on Monday that he is expected to include senior U.S. auto executive 
including Ford Motor Corporation Chief Executive Jim Farley and General Motors Chief Executive Mary Barra and White House officials Brian Deasy and Jake Sullivan. Uh, on Monday, a U.S. auto industry group urged the government to help as it warned um, uh, that the global semiconductor shortage could result in 1.28 million fewer vehicles built this year and disrupt production for another six months. It called for setting aside some money for automotive uh, chip production. Biden in February ordered several federal agency actions to address the chip crisis and is seeking $37 billion in funding for legislation to <coughs> supercharge chip manufacturing in the United States. Automakers have uh, been hit particularly hard by the global chip shortage after many cancelled orders when auto plans uh, were idled during the cough-cough pandemic. Broadband internet, cell phone and cable TV um, <clears throat> Companies urged the White House to remain technology neutral in addressing chip issues. Yeah, good luck with that. Industry group NCTA, the Internet and Television Association, said in comments uh, to the Commerce Department this week that providers are facing chip delays, resulting in delays delivering some cable TV boxes, as well as delays in receiving network switches, routers and servers. Shortages in semiconductors and the associated delays will result in hundreds of uh, millions of dollars in impact to the broadband and cable television industry this year. Uh, airbag, aircraft maker Boeing uh, said in the comments f uh, filed with the Commerce Department that the primary risk to the semiconductor supply chain is the lack of uh, critical domestic manufacturing uh, capability. So, is the state really able to fix the semiconductor crisis? Well, considering how the state functions, <laughs> especially the US state, the, the mantra is throw enough money at the problem and the problem will go away. And as, and as an update to this, uh, uh, Intel in the in in, in the last uh, conference, which they had, I think a week or so ago, they they've mentioned that they're gonna open three new three new foundries in the in in the US, particularly at least one. I'm pretty sure it will open in Arizona, mm -hmm. and and they will and they will finally start to con to contract some space in those foundries for other companies, except to, except whatever whatever Intel is making in terms of chips. That's a significant progress, uh, but let's re but let's remember that de that decades ago the, the, there used to be significant uh, foundries for both chips and memory, um, for example Texas Instruments back in the 1960s to the 1980s, and uh, they they went bust because they became too expensive and they couldn't compete with the likes of TSMC or Samsung. Uh, they could, the best they can do, which is what they're trying to do right now, is to at least stimulate some domestic production. And and I'm not really sure if if in, if Intel made that move, expecting uh, expecting them to get a piece, a slice of the pie, when mm -hmm. it's when it's about this stim this stimulus, or they just simply did it themselves and this came after. Mm -hmm. they, they most likely had some warning that that this was bound to happen. But uh, there may be some shekels mm -hmm. in it. Yeah, uh, but uh, the thing is, so basically, Intel you you, you uh, say that it may uh, wager on this this piece of legislation passing mm -hmm. and coming through, which may I mean, if uh, if Mitch McConnell says it will, then it probably will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so there's that, mm -hmm. but um, maybe that will solve some of the issues uh, at but at what cost? Again, I mean, thirty seven billion. That's not really quite a lot. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's by U.S. standards is uh, pocket change. So mm -hmm. there's that. But at the same time, uh, of course, uh, many may ask, may wonder uh, why. In the sense that, uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, you know, a crisis in semiconductor does not affect the entirety of the population. But it may affect in the United States, uh, a country whose population is not exactly conservative with mm -hmm. using technology, right? Because um, I'm thinking, you know, from my perspective, uh, this could go on for several years without me even noticing it, mm -hmm. right? But for those accustomed to buying new shit all the time, uh, for no reason other than vanity, uh, because usefulness is not an excuse, at least in most uh, transactions of this sort, uh, yeah, to them there, there, could, there could be a problem. But why not let the market uh, fix it uh, via its own means? Namely that, look, if this is an issue, then uh, stuff containing semiconductors uh, will get more expensive progressively. Oh, it has already gotten pretty expensive. Um, 
uh, on on the GPU front, there's again another mining boom, mm. and uh, and that made everything fly everything fly off the shelves for what for whatever reason. So we, we don't we, we don't condone crypto. Crypto is retarded, but oh. but there's a significant market behind crypto, uh, sure. which invests a lot of money. I, I just built another server for one of my private data centers. Uh, three weeks ago less than three weeks ago and i didn't notice a significant change in the price i mean uh oh it's not a significant change in the pricing but a significant change in the supply and uh, and also another issue is that um, most of the companies uh, who build semiconductors rely on uh, around tsmc and tsmc for for a few for at least three weeks already is suffering a water shortage because there's apparently a significant issue with uh, water supply right now in Taiwan mm -hmm. up until the rainy season starts mm -hmm. and uh, and they had to cut their water consumption by 30 percent yeah the rainy season I think starts this mm -hmm. month not uh, to, not to mention they not to mention they, they also had before COVID uh, <laughs> um, issues with supply because they simply do not have the manufacturing capacity they they do expand but expansion the expansion is such a domain is something that costs tens of billions to build new factories new foundries uh. yes and uh, despite the impression that they may project on the on the market taiwan semiconductor company is still mm -hmm. kind of like a startup <laughs> i mm. mean uh, at least in in this field you know in, in this field you have to discuss in uh, astronomical numbers so uh, even if you're worth billions you're still a startup uh, in this field as opposed to software right where if you worth billions uh, you're already a, a unicorn right uh, so um, uh, yeah well that's the term that the uh, startup soys uh, use uh, in their conferences it's a retarded term sure but it's, it is what it is um, I'm not very confident quite frankly I do, I'm not very confident because um, um, looking at history every time the um, US federal government tried to address uh, shortages of stuff, whether it was gas or now semiconductors, mm -hmm. or um, there were several moments in history when the federal government or the Congress or both tried to address shortages of stuff. At best, they were ineffective, or at worst, they made things worse. They, they damaged it. Let's uh, uh, let's take a trek back through history during during the first mandate of FDR and what happened uh, back then uh, with agriculture prices. Yes. Yes. Art they artificially skyrocketed in a period where people didn't have didn't have money to buy food. Yes. Uh, and it wouldn't be, uh, and the same mistake was then again repeated in, in Europe, in Western Europe, um, 20 years later in the 60s when the common agricultural policy mm. became a thing in what was at the time the community of coal and steel, uh, now the European Union, mm. uh, who managed, uh, managed to create, well, a global food crisis. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to their attempt to um, to address um, shortages on the supply chain and also to address um, the incomes of those who were engaged in producing food. So that's what I'm saying. Uh, uh, so you know, these are the terrible examples, but there are some other examples where things uh, only got to, or only ha have only gotten marginally worse, but generally were pretty ineffective. Um, I'm thinking, uh, yeah, with oil at the end of the day, right? The uh, famous uh, antitrust uh, legislation only uh, increased the price of oil oh, yeah. a little the, bit. Yeah, and the, the, was, the standard oil breakup. Yes, and uh, <laughs> only increased the, the, the price of oil a little bit, and that was pretty much it. I mean, that was the only effect of the um, revolutionary antitrust policy, which in, in the end... Uh, uh, now, of course, now you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, a hundred and something years later, where we could say that maybe it wasn't a terrible idea, but the first iteration of it was absolutely haram, um, right? So, yeah, the, the, don't hold your breath uh, for the daddy government to save this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it will be solved by slowly uh, expanding investment into production facilities mm -hmm. and, uh, um, well, moving away from the crankiness of China. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's how you fix this. And yes, it takes time. And 
Um, the so-called semiconductor crisis may last for another year or something. Yeah, no, uh, a year, a year and a half. Uh, yeah, at, next at summer. Best, uh, by next summer, uh, you'll see some amelioration of it. Mm. But as a result, a further investment and yes, divestment as well uh, from China, and that's pretty much it. Um, this piece of legislation, uh, considering how slow the federal government is, th th it may indeed be the case that by the time the first shekels from mm. the government towards the industry come the problem might have already been uh, might have been fixed itself yeah but sp speaking fixed. of china what this article doesn't mention is that it's uh, the, this bill is not just about semiconductors but it's also about uh, what you said earlier uh, some divestment from china particularly in critical uh, mm -hmm. manufacturing sectors which the us is pretty reliant upon yeah, uh, and it's, it shouldn't be a surprise. It has become quite a tradition in the U.S. Congress to... Uh, it is rarely the case anymore to pass bills. It's usually omnibus bill pack packages, which is a terrible way of uh, functioning as a legislative body because who the hell reads those things, right? I mean, That's I, probably what they're banking on. Uh, yes. Yeah, I know, I know. Most definitely what they're banking on. <laughs> yeah, I know. But the thing is that you need a, an entire army of paralegals and lobbyists mm. just to read that stuff. Mm. Not to mention understanding it, not to mention having an idea on what you should and shouldn't be lobbying, uh, what's advantageous, what's not advantageous. I mean, just yeah. sifting through that. Yeah, I understand for, efficient, for efficiency's sake uh, to pass one large bill. But from a legislative point of view, uh, well, what happened with the with the last omnibus bill that was passed still under Trump? Uh, mm. You discovered weird stuff like uh, sending sending a few tens of millions for uh, for feminist initiatives in Pakistan. Yeah, that, that, that seems <laughs> and, legit. And that's not and, that, and that's not the only one. Pretty, we're pretty sure if someone would have the time and the autism to to to, to actually go through the entire bill, you would have, you'll find at least. Uh, Two dozen or so. Yeah, the, the one with gender dubious. mainstreaming in yeah. Pakistan just glowed <laughs> in the dark so much. <laughs> We're all like, come oh, on, really? Mm. Uh, but you know, well, you you could interpret it as uh, you know, we're gonna help the feminists in Pakistan not to cough. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. Alrighty. Uh, sticking to the U.S. and the uh, way the government works. Oh, Christ Almighty, CNN. The Pentagon could open itself to costly litigation from contractors if the United States pulls out of Afghanistan this year. Despite the signaling of the Doha Agreement last February that called for a full draw drawdown of U.S. troops and personnel from Afghanistan by May the 1st, the Department of Defense issued nearly a billion dollars in contracts to 17 different companies related to work in Afghanistan past the withdrawal date. And there are currently some 18,000 contractors in the country, of which 6,350 are American citizens. With the deadline rapidly approaching and no formal decision from the White House, the future of the contracts, some of which have completion dates in 2023 and beyond, remains unclear. But the Pentagon could potentially have to pay hundreds of millions in settlements or face years of litigation if the U.S. pulls out of the country on schedule or by the end of the year, as President Joe Biden suggested is likely. If they have a billion dollars worth of contracts, they're going to have a barrel full of lawsuits on their hands unless they're willing to settle for whatever amount the contractors can ask for, says Dova Zahaim, the former chief financial officer uh, for the DOD. Uh, Cho Biden suggested on Thursday the U.S. would not meet the May 1st withdrawal deadline, but said he can't picture the U.S. having troops in Afghanistan next year. We're not staying for a long time, he said at this press conference. We will leave. The question is when. Uh, Cho Biden was asked specifically about U.S. troops in Afghanistan, but the Doha agreement signed on February the 29th of last year also calls for the removal of non-diplomatic civilian personnel, private security contractors, trainers, advisors, and supporting services personnel. Yet their immediate future is uh, as unclear as the outlook on a troop withdrawal. The general trend regarding the number of DOD contractors in Afghanistan continues to scale downward. It remains too early to speculate on whether it will continue to do so on par with that uh, of potential uh, troop drawdowns, as no decisions have been made regarding the future force levels in Afghanistan, said Pentagon spokesman uh, Major Rob Lodwick. Uh, since the beginning of America's longest war, contractors have paid uh, a higher price than service members. 
According to the Washington Post's Afghanistan Papers, 3,814 contractors had been killed in Afghanistan as of late 2019, as opposed to approximately 2,300 troops. At the height of the Afghanistan troop surge between 2011 and 2012, there were 99,800 U.S. service members in the country and 117,227 contractors, according to data from the Congressional Research Service. Uh, but uh, as the number of troops in Afghanistan declined, contractors began to vastly outnumber the troops. There are now approximately 2,500 uh, troops in Afghanistan, but 18,000 contractors. Nearly half of those contractors work in base support, logistics or maintenance, uh, while the rest fill roles in security, training, construction and more. They may be more critical to the stability of the country and the Afghan government uh, uh, than the US uh, ally and allied troops, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, John Sopko said. Why? Because uh, <clears throat> Why? Because the Afghan government relies on these foreign contractors and trainers to function, Sopko told the Center for Strategic and International Studies in mid-March. Should the withdrawal come to pass, uh, Sigar and many others believe this may be more devastating to the effectiveness of the Afghan security forces and the survival of the Afghan state as we know it than the withdrawal of our remaining military forces. The contractors maintain equipment, manage supply chains, conduct military and police training and operate the advanced equipment brought into the country. That's really the issue. The government can't just say, well, the hell with you, said Zahaim. The thing about termination for convenience is that the government is probably going to have to pay the contractor. In total, uh, there are at least 18 contracts, totaling $931 million issued since the Doha agreement was signed on February the 29th, 2020. Uh, <laughs> some contracts, such as the dealers uh, for Textron Systems and Salient Federal Services, deal exclusively with Afghanistan. Such, uh, others, such as uh, 300 and 83.3 million dollars contract from April 2020 deal with production of M16A4 military rifles for multiple countries including Afghanistan. The vast majority of the contracts, $821.2 million, were signed under the Trump administration, which began drawing down the number of troops very quickly following the signing of the agreement. Uh, within one year, the former administration uh, drew down the level of troops from approximately 13,000 to the current level of 2,500, making clear the intent to leave Afghanistan fully by the May 1st deadline. Uh, three of the contractors contacted by CNN declined to offer any specifics on, plan pa on plans past May 1st. Uh, one cited operational security requirements, while other pointed to the different possibilities, saying that there are a lot of uh, potential scenarios and it would be very difficult to know what may or may not happen. Yeah, good luck with the private military contractors telling you, <laughs> CNN, uh, what exactly are they going... I mean, uh, you got you to be fucking kidding me, right? <laughs> We're wishful thinking. Uh, yeah, you know, I wouldn't tell CNN um, uh, anything about anything. I mean, really, uh, at least of all sensitive information <laughs> like this one. Uh, but yeah, this is, uh, this is the military industrial complex for you. I mean, you see? Uh, Trump tried to please everyone by essentially privatizing the whole mm -hmm. thing in Afghanistan. Like, you all want to make money, right? Mm -hmm. You don't really give a shit about the causes. Okay, fair enough. We want to pull our troops uh, back home because I promised that in the campaign and that might may or may not get me reelected. But even so, I still think we should get out of there. So let's privatize the whole thing. You guys continue to make money <laughs> while we get what we want. And um, the current Afghan administration is uh, happy because they only want the technology and the expertise and the know-how. Mm -hmm. They don't really give a damn whether uh, on the arms of the foreigners operating the, all of that stuff. Uh, says the U.S. Army or whatever corporation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it makes no difference whatsoever for mm -hmm. them. Uh, so you basically try to please everyone. Now, Cho Biden has no idea what to do because, you know, he's not really good at negotiating <laughs> or uh, privatizing stuff. So he's very good in the opposite direction. <laughs> um, so, you know, he has nothing... Um, he has very few paths that can please the factions within the Democrat Party, mm. which are a, a little bit more numerous than the ones in the Republican Party. Um, redeployments are unpopular, but he also can't continue the Trump path because, well, what's the credibility, the gravitas that he mm. has? How can he negotiate with the contractors? Uh, you know, at least Trump mm. had appointed uh, more capable and more capitalistic oriented people uh, to do that. Oh. Now, admittedly, some of them are still in position um, under Biden as well, so maybe he could use those. 
Yeah, this, this is a clear example of the organizational inertia that's in the U.S. state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they signed an agreement to pull out last year, and then they discover, wait, wait, hang on, we can't pull out uh, on the on, on schedule because we're going to have a shit ton of issues uh, on the financial front with litigations and everything. They're not exactly afraid of having to pay the money, but, but, they're, but, they're, but they're, they're exactly afraid of getting bogged down in... In thousands, thousands of lawsuits, uh, at the expensive lawsuits at that. Uh... Right. Uh, it, it is the... Um, <laughs> so, uh, but again, they, they could be afraid of paying the money as well, because at some point, one of some of the contractors may uh, smell that uh, the government uh, is willing to do <laughs> almost anything to avoid the lawsuits. So the, the contractors may end up requiring, I don't know, 135% of the amount. <laughs> You know, a severance fee. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, and then what? She. Now, okay, maybe the government is willing to pay a severance fee of 35%, but what if they require 235%? Now what? And yeah, then, then you get to litigation. And yeah. These kinds of lawsuits, especially when hundreds of millions of dollars are at stake, they can take 10 years. Yeah, yeah. especially when the U.S. state uh, operates what's called uh, cost plus contracting. So even if the contractor... Uh, uh, itself may may be operating at a at a loss. They will still have to they still have to report a certain pricing above what they're actually earning, just so that they make a profit. That and that doesn't that especially happens in the military, but it happens in also other branches. For for example, NASA, NASA operates like that as well, with with the cost plus uh, scenarios in mind. Uh, but uh, but 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 even then, uh, you, you can't exactly say that uh, Trump's deal was a bad well, was a bad idea because he did manage to pull out the truth from Afghanistan, which that was the problem. The more the, the more body caskets came out from Afghanistan, the more his situation would have been more shaky. While at the same time, he pleased the, the military industrial complex that uh, they pretty much to picked up the work that uh, that the U.S. military. No, exactly. wasn't able, but it wasn't a popular move uh, to do so. Yeah, and the thing is that uh, the only way out of this is, well, kind of stick with the plan. This appears to what Joe Biden is uh, alluding to. Just stick with the plan, but mm. instead of May 1st, try December 31st and pay as many of the contractors as you can possibly do. And... Hopefully you won't be buried in lawsuits and maybe you'll have one or two or three or ten, which is still better than a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> um, now, will that work? No, I don't think so. Uh, because um, m most of these, I, I don't know if all of them, but all of those that I'm aware of. Okay, let me put it this mm -hmm. way. All of the companies that do um, this kind of military contracting, uh, they do have a huge budget for legalese <laughs> <laughs> right for litigation and like roughly 90 percent of that budget is uh, explicitly reserved for litigating against the government uh for bloody good reason because shit like this can happen <laughs> right uh and that kind of, and if a uh, one year goes by without any of that budget being spent it stays there and it, it forms a slush fund mm -hmm. explicitly explicitly for litigation some of so some of these contractors may have more funds in their litigation fund than the total worth of the contractor plus 500 percent of the <laughs> okay so um I, it's at least some litigation is gonna have to happen uh and um yeah the show by the administration is not gonna like it <laughs> probably not gonna yeah, like it. it's it's better to just let it die down mm. rather than uh, <laughs> shave things up particularly because even the democrats uh, have some support from the military industrial context, particularly yes. particularly those who were affiliated with uh, Hillary Clinton and the foundation yes. were significant, their, their significant war hawks. Not, not, not to mention many of the uh, military contractors themselves are donors mm. to the Democrat mm -hmm. Party. Uh, so, uh, the, the, it's, a, it's a very uh, bipartisan business, mm. this one, right? <laughs> uh, so, it, it, it cannot be... Uh, um, operated as if oh we're gonna do this and uh, by doing this we're gonna stick it to the republicans or the other way around <laughs> trump is gonna do this and stick it to the democrats no that's not how this works mm -hmm. and trump understood that it took him three years to understand it but he did understand it now biden already knows it because he's been vice president before so definitely he does know these things 
uh, because he was there when some of these deals were signed well, he, he, to he begin with. He definitely knows, but does he remember? <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's a fair. Um, that's a fair question. But yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things where uh, the public hasn't been um, informed. Uh, it hasn't been informed during Obama years because it was not politically correct to do so. It hasn't been informed during Trump years because, uh, because again, it wasn't politically correct to do so. Mm -hmm. Now it's like they don't have a choice. <laughs> and they have to inform the public about these very in these intricacies, about a very complicated issue uh, that, um, that the, well, the war in Afghanistan, as CNN calls it correctly, America's longest war um, entails. And um, yeah, there are ways out of this, uh, of this but uh, as you said, I'm not sure Mr. Biden uh, remembers uh, what those ways are. I'm sure he knows them, or he, at least he knew them at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, whether he still knows them or, uh, or not, uh, I guess it depends on how willing the uh, Madame Vice President is, uh, <laughs> is willing to, uh, well, remember him. Speaking of Donald Trump, CNN's Supreme Court wipes away ruling that said Trump violated constitution by blocking Twitter followers. The Supreme Court on Monday wiped away a lower court opinion holding that then President Donald Trump violated the First Amendment when he blocked followers from his Twitter account. The High Court dismissed the case because Trump is not in office, so there is no longer a live case or controversy. Trump established his Twitter account in 2009 and in May and June 2017. While serving as president, he blocked seven individuals who had expressed this pleasure with him. Lawyers from the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University sued on behalf of these individuals, arguing Trump's action violated the First Amendment rights. <clears throat> In court pers uh, papers, they said the president's account at Real Donald Trump functions as an official source of news and information about the government and as a form of uh, for speech by, to, and about the president. Mm -hmm. A district court said that the then president uh, president's action of blocking followers violated their, those individuals' First Amendment rights because it excluded them from a public forum based on their viewpoints. A decision an appeals court later mm -hmm. affirmed. That's false. Uh, then Solicitor General Jeff Wall asked the Supreme Court to take up the case, arguing that Trump. Trump's account is personal, even if it is sometimes run by his assistant Dan Scavino. By ignoring the critical distinction between the president's sometimes official statements on Twitter and his always personal decision to block respondents from his own account, Wall argued the lower court opinion blurs the line between state action and private conduct, notwithstanding this court's repeated and recent exhortations to heed that line carefully in applying the First Amendment. But after the election and after Twitter banned Trump from the platform for violating its policies related to the Capitol insurrection, Wall asked the court to dismiss the case and wipe away the lower court opinion. So, uh, basically, the title is a bit misleading from um, from CNN. Shocking, mm. I, know, I know. It's very shocking uh, because uh, it doesn't establish precedent, essentially. Mm. It says, well, the issue is no longer active, so screw you all. Mm. Uh, which, of course, from a legal standpoint, makes perfect sense. Mm but it doesn't establish precedent. I was hoping for a decision that would be binding and precedent establishing, namely that the personal account of a politician does not represent um, public, public a public forum. A public forum, yeah. Right, or maybe a decision saying, yeah, the lower court had a point. Right. Uh, basically, I was expecting the Supreme Court to make their make up their mind on the issue, mm -hmm. uh, one way or the other. But both would have, would have been fine because if the Supreme Court would have said that, the, if the Supreme Court had said that the lower court had a point, then we could uh, go to AOC's uh, Twitter feed mm -hmm. and you know uh, say whatever we believe about her, and if she blocks us, then sue her for damages for uh, breaking our First Amendment mm -hmm. rights. <laughs> yeah, but, but even then, uh, this lawsuit started uh, from a false precedent. Uh, the false premise. False premise, my bad. Because, uh, because even this article says that uh, th this is uh, Donald Trump's private account, which opened in 2009, way before the presidency. So, and, 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 the, and, and you can't exactly uh, argue with him because he did a, he did a bad thing and uh, undermined the First Amendment right of people uh, once, they, once he blocked them, because that's still his private account. Let's remember that there is, there, well, there still is 
public account for the president for the president of the United States, which is at Polters, mm. which that one serves as public information. So Trump, Trump literally did nothing wrong. Uh, yeah. Than in, uh, blocking people uh, from his uh, Twitter feed. Now, admittedly, as opposed to uh, previous presidents, uh, I'm not counting Biden for a simple reason that I don't think he's able to use Twitter, <laughs> too old for that. Uh, <laughs> but you know, previous presidents um, outright stopped using their personal account mm -hmm. while in office. Uh, whereas Trump continued to use uh, his personal account <laughs> at, the, at POTUS. And yes, oftentimes blurred the line of uh, w mm. which is which, uh, or made the official statement on at real Donald Trump and then retweeted it on at POTUS, or sometimes the other way around. Fair. Mm. But then again, that's still, uh, uh, you know, he, if he blocked you on his personal account, he would still retweet that on... <clears throat> Uh, mm. On at Potus. On, on the official account. Yeah, yeah, and you can reply there. And yes, if he would have blocked you there, then mm. would that, it would have been. Yeah, the, then you would have a uh, then you have a solid case to that mm. he did mm. infringe. Uh, I don't know on if the it's a solid case, right? but definitely a more uh, the one well, a more convincing a case. more convincing case. Yeah, mm. one with more standing, as uh, the legal language uh, mm. would put it. Um, but again, it's quite disappointing that the Supreme Court chose not to make a decision, essentially. They, they basically made a technical decision, a technocratic decision, mm -hmm. namely that it is no longer an active issue, so uh, y'all go home. Mm -hmm. uh, which, fair enough, but I would have preferred uh, for Scotus to make a decision. It, um, I, again, I had no preference mm -hmm. which way. I mean, they could have agreed with the lower court, fine or uh, overturn the decision of the lower court, but just make a decision on it because, um, well, because these kinds of social media kerfuffles aren't going away anytime soon. Mm. Uh, so this issue will come up again in courts uh, sooner than many imagine. Mm. Uh, and once that's going to happen, um, uh, then again, all, everyone will have to wait for three or four or five years for the issue to make its way all the way up to the Supreme Court um, all of that time could have been, uh, all of that wasted time could have been avoided if the Supreme Court uh, last week essentially uh, just made up its mind. It, it really did not matter which way, but just made up your mind. Anyway, speaking of Trump on Twitter, Fox News National Archives will share Trump tweets censored on Twitter. <laughs> The National Archives and Records Administration confirmed Wednesday that it, it is working to make publicly available tweets from former President Trump that Twitter has taken down and pledged not to allow back on its platform. Well, we'll see about that. NARA and Twitter have worked closely together for years to keep records of government content posted uh, to the social media giant, but the banning of Trump's personal account complicated matters. NARA intends to provide public access to all captured and preserved presidential records social media, including any blocked or deleted tweets that have been transferred to us, a National Archives spokesperson said in a statement on Wednesday. Still, Twitter and NARA say their archives are separate and distinct from each other's, and only the National Archive will be sharing the tweets. Twitter is solely responsible for the decision of what content is available on their platform, the statement continued. NARA works closely with Twitter and other social media platforms to maintain the archive social uh, accounts from each presidential administration, but ultimately the platform owners can decline to host these accounts. NARA preserves platform independent copies of social media records and is working to make that content available to the public. A Twitter spokesperson said that while the company would preserve records in accordance with the appropriate laws, it had no intention of reactivating tweets from the at real Donald Trump, Trump account following his controversial ban in January. I can confirm that our teams have been working with NARA to, on the preservation of tweets from at real Donald Trump as is standard with uh, any ad administration transition and as we've done previously the spokesperson said given that we permanently suspended at real Donald Trump the content from the account will not appear on Twitter as it did previously or as archived administration accounts do currently regardless of how NARA decides to display the data it has preserved administration accounts that are archived on the service are accounts that were not in violation of the Twitter rules but the mover has drawn fierce criticism from free speech advocates on both sides of the aisle ranging from Trump 2020 campaign advisor Jason Miller uh, to the far-left uh, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. Uh, look, you have a racist, sexist, xenophobe, pathological liar, an authoritarian, a bad news guy, Sanders told New York Times columnist Ezra Clyde in March. 
But if you're asking me, do I feel particularly comfortable that the then president of the United States could not express his views on Twitter? I don't feel comfortable about that, <laughs> Bernie Sanders said. Big Tech wants to cancel all 75 million at real Donald Trump supporters. Miller tweeted back in January, if you don't think they're coming for you next, you're wrong. <laughs> so yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, come on, man, don't glow in the dark that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so basically Miller is glow posting there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, glow posting aside, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, seeing Senator um, Bernie Sanders uh, mm -hmm. sounding kind of like us, uh, except for the wow, 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 racist, racist, you know, okay, okay, boomer. Uh, but still, <laughs> um, that confirms what we've been saying over the last year in this format and over the last five years uh, on, in general on this channel and uh, in these circles. Uh, sooner or later, and uh, that moment is already here. Um, you know, I was saying five years ago that sooner or later this will be a bipartisan issue. Well, the moment mm -hmm. is here now. Uh, Anti big tech is a mainstream position. Mm -hmm. It's no longer something that marginal radical circles talk about. No, it's a mainstream position. And it's not just because Senator Bernie Sanders said what he said. It's also because uh, you know uh, Nancy Pelosi uh, mold uh, uh, deep disdain for big tech. Mm -hmm. uh, not to mention Jack Schumer. Jack Schumer had been pissed on um, on big tech since at least 2015. Mm -hmm. um, every single top tier Republican leader is pissed off at big tech for bloody good reason most of the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. sure, some of them are a little bit exaggerating, but uh, you know, without exaggeration, you don't have political propaganda. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, stop acting surprised at the exaggerations, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but uh, this is becoming the mainstream position and uh, in 2022, I expect that uh, some of these uh, junior congressional candidates uh, on both sides of the aisle mm -hmm. um, will be very proud to announce uh, a strong anti-big tech bias in their platforms as a selling point to the voters. Uh, and yeah, sure, some of them will win a seat, some of them won't, but then in 2024. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the snowball just started rolling. <laughs> yeah, and, I, I, you know, it, it's kind of like, um, uh, I don't know, um, remember when in 2012, uh, when both Mitt Romney and Obama resoundly rejected the idea of nationalizing healthcare altogether? Mm -hmm. uh, well, I expect in 2024, whomever the candidates will be, to be a similar kind of thing. Big tech sucks, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be a, one of those moments when uh, both of the candidates uh, to the presidency, which we have no idea who those will be, uh, will essentially reject that. And in the primaries of both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, uh, mm, the candidates who will express the strongest bias against big tech will probably get most of the primary votes. And those mm -hmm. who uh, will still work on the so-called centrist position that maybe it's not so bad, uh, mm -hmm. those will probably be the ones eliminated after the first or second caucuses, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Or the first Super Tuesday at best, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just saying, you know, I could be wrong, but, you know, I'm <sighs> before I made this channel, I, in one of my podcasts that was our audio only, uh, I was uh, thinking out loud that, uh, I, this was 2012, 2013, uh, saying that probably the next president will be someone from the pop culture. <laughs> uh, now I'm saying that someone, uh, the next president will probably be someone that really despises big tech. I'm just saying, you know, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But the thing is that uh, when the National Archives, um, which is again a very mellow, non-political institution, they're, they're basically a bunch of nerds and clerks, right? Mm -hmm. When even they have to uh, go to, well, not necessarily to war, but go in a public dispute, a public spat with Twitter, that's when you know that... Um, that you uh, fucked up. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the things are just mm. way beyond repair and someone will have to come in and say enough is enough. Mm. Because, you know, if you can't have a, uh, come to an understanding with the National Archives, for crying out loud, you know, with the nerds, mm. with the clerks, that have yeah. many of them, uh, probably many of them don't even like Trump, right? Uh, and never did, right? Yeah, and, uh, and, and, they, or, and they exactly don't have a political opinion altogether because yes, that's, that's, because that's, that's, not their, that's not their job. Their, their job is to archive, release. 
Right, right. And file, that's it. <laughs> yeah. And if you can't come to an understanding with those people, maybe it's you the pro who you is know, the problem. You know you fell down way too deep in the rabbit hole. <laughs> right, yeah. right. I mean, this kind of radicalization on the behalf of the management of social mm -hmm. media companies will have to be addressed, and believe it or not, it will be addressed. Now, we may not like the way it will be addressed. It is entirely mm -hmm. possible that it ends up being addressed in an entirely wrongful manner. I don't know, mm -hmm. it, but it is possible. But it will have to be addressed. And if it, if it will come to the situation where it will be addressed in a wrongful manner, uh, this is going to be something that you're not going to like, in the sense that even those of us who will know and notice that it is being addressed in a wrongful manner will not come to the defense of social media, right? I mean, I, I'm serious. I mean, if tomorrow Nancy Pelosi comes in and says, you know what, maybe Twitter should be outright shut down. I'm like, yeah, where do I sign? <laughs> I know it's wrong, mm -hmm. but you know what? Twitter deserves it. Right? And, uh, and, and, and not just Twitter. Um, uh, Facebook as yeah, well. In fact, yeah. Facebook deserves it even more. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. People still don't realize what dangerous precedent Twitter, Twitter and Facebook have set because both, because yeah, uh, Twitter's ban of Donald Trump was the most popular. But let's remember that even, uh, even Facebook blocked him in the same time span of 24 hours mm -hmm. uh, back in January. And the Democrats are no stupid; they they've seen that. And while for now, big tech is big tech is on their side. Big tech may not be on their side four years from now uh, oh, and, they know and they're it. aware of that oh yeah and they know it and uh, and besides it was um uh how do you call it um it was um a situation not a trend right mm -hmm. it just happened that uh, some of the interests of big tech coincided with some of the interest of the democratic party but that mm -hmm. was it wasn't necessarily a coincidence but it was a temporary situation and at least the democrats should be and I'm sure they are aware of that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if necessarily some of the big tech is aware of that. Um, you know, I have to admit that I don't really trust the judgment of uh, people like Jack Dorsey. I don't think that guy is aware of many things happening around him. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. I, I, he doesn't come off as someone who understands anything really, uh, other than you know coding and management ma managing a. A website which is fine it's a very valuable skill obviously considering the worth of the company but that doesn't make you a very good negotiator politically that doesn't make you you know th those skills are not transferable to anything and everything else um and many of these people um uh, jack dorsey uh, jack conti of patreon facebook uh right mark zuckerberg mm -hmm. and a few others uh, they seem to have fallen to what Thomas Sowell would call the vulgar pride of intellectuals, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they seem to think that their skills of managing um, a social media company suddenly makes them qualified to talk about everything. Mm -hmm. and or, or even qualified to do decisions which to make set dangerous precedents. Right, right. <laughs> to make decisions to set dangerous precedents, to create, like, like Facebook mm -hmm. did, right? The Supreme Court of Facebook. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. can the Supreme Court of Facebook sack you, Mar Mark Zuckerberg? No, then <laughs> why should I trust your institution? <laughs> or can they censor you? No? Ah, okay, then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, no, some sort of regulation, some sort of crackdown will come down. Not mm -hmm. this year, maybe not even next year. But depending on how the Congress will look past uh, December, or what? Sorry, November 2022. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe, <laughs> if not, definitely come January 2025 after the uh, presidential elections in 24. Some sort of regulation, some sort of crackdown will come. Probably the wrong way, um, considering how the state usually functions. The state rarely makes good decisions. Mm -hmm. But you know what? You brought it upon yourselves. Oh yeah. I mean, if, if there has to be an argument, again, this is April already. This should have been over, the archiving of the previous administration. This should have been over. Mm -hmm. Usually it's over by early March, right? It's mid-April and it's still not over. It's we're probably going to uh, wait until mid-May or something until the final report is coming out. And it's solely because Twitter sucks balls in public. <laughs> 
and, uh, and the soccer involves with one of the most non-confrontational institutions that the U.S. state can have. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, if, if, if there is one piece of uh, federal bureaucrats that you can't really despise, admittedly mm. you can't really like yeah. either. Yeah, it's the archivists. Yeah, it's the archivists. I mean, you know, th th those guys did nothing wrong. <laughs> and, and then Twitter, oh, but our policies, and we are suspended because of... Mm. And he's like, can you please yeah. give us the files so we can file them into this long shelf where we've been <laughs> filing things for the last 150 years, <laughs> I mean, really? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And, you know, uh, Miller is, uh, of course, exaggerating a little bit, but he has a point, right? Mm -hmm. You know, pissing off 75 million people because I'm sure Republican operatives will make the case uh, by the National Archives to do your average to your average voter. And your average voter will think like us. They'll say, oh, hold mm -hmm. on a second, the archivists? <laughs> really? They came for those people? <laughs> ha ha, voting goes brrr. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. I'm just saying. And you're not going to like it. You're not going to like it. I mean, but then again, you know, this spiral of radicalization that the Democrats have. Uh, triggered. <laughs> uh, they have been triggering. They triggered it in 2008, but they mm -hmm. kept on supporting it. And now they're upset about it because the Republicans have caught up with their game and they're using it to their advantage. Well, tough luck. Tough luck. There's still time to stop it, but you won't. And we both know you won't. So there's that. Daily Wire. Texas bans vaccine passports. Republican Texas Governor Greg Abbott announced a ban on government-mandated vaccine passports on Tuesday morning. The Republican governor issued an executive order on Monday banning any regulation that would require Texans to show proof of vaccination before getting a product or a service. The order also blocks all businesses or entities receiving state funds from requiring vaccine documentation as well. Every day, Texans return to normalcy as more and more people get the COVID-19 vaccine. In fact, this week, Texas will surpass 13 million doses administered, Abbott said in a Tuesday video announcement. Those shots help slow the spread, reduce hospitalizations, and reduce fatalities. But, as I have said all, uh, all along, those vaccines are always voluntary and never forced. Governments should not require any Texan to show proof of vaccination and reveal private health information just to go about their daily lives. The governor continued, that is why I issued an executive order that prohibits government mandated vaccine passports in Texas. We will continue to vaccinate more Texans and protect public health and we will also do so without uh, treading on Texans personal freedoms. The order exempts uh, nursing homes and long-term care facilities allowing them to require proof of vaccination as needed to protect their residents. Uh, Abbott's order comes after Republican Florida Governor Ron DeSantis issued a similar order last week. DeSantis announced his intention at a press conference in March. It's completely unacceptable for either the government or the private sector to impose upon you the requirement to show proof of vaccine just to simply participate in normal society, DeSantis said. You want to go to a movie theater? Should you have to do? Should you, should you have to show that? No. You want to go to a game or a theme park? No. So we're not supporting uh, supportive of that. We've always said we wanted people to provide it uh, for all, but mandated for none, he continued. And that was something that while it was advised to take particularly if you're vulnerable, we're not going to force you to do it. DeSantis said that vaccine passports would be a significant threat to a Americans' privacy. You're going to do this uh, and what? Give all the information to some big corporation? You want the fox guard to, to the hen house? I mean, give me a break, the governor said. <laughs> I think this is something that has huge privacy implications and it's not necessary to do. New York became the first uh, state to implement a COVID-19 vaccine passport in February, as the Daily Wire reported, blah, blah, blah. And just like in other places, it's not being enforced. So uh, there's that. Mm. <clears throat> Right, I, I got some complaints that I didn't make a video about uh, vaccine passports, uh, and I replied that I won't <laughs> because, mm -hmm. uh, well, what is to say they make, they make no sense from an epidemiological perspective, because it's not like the measles vaccine, right, where you mm -hmm. take one, and um, it's kind of like good enough for most of your life. Mm -hmm. Maybe you may need a booster sixty years later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. But that's yeah. Here, here I'm going to borrow what Alin said in the Romanian podcast uh, regarding the vaccine passports. Uh, uh, he, here I hold what we call pisica, the cat, <laughs> right. so the, the, the bait in order to the, the vaccine passports are exactly are exactly the cat that. Uh, that they don't exactly force you in order to take the vaccine, but in order to expedite the process, in order to vaccinate people, if you threaten them that uh, you're not going to let them into the cinema or into a game or into a theme park, uh, more people will be more enticed to vaccinate themselves. And 
Uh, and it works to some extent in countries like Israel, but that's not a representative example because Israel is still uh, pretty, pretty, pretty much a war country mm. considering the neighbors they got around. But for the rest of the planet, that's not the case, particularly the particularly the Western world. Yeah, and particularly Texas. I mean, you know, <laughs> telling Texans that uh, what to do usually doesn't go well. <laughs> I mean, it, it just doesn't. Um, yeah, because the thing is that implementing such an infrastructure would, uh, would cost more than the GDP of some countries, um, mm -hmm. the annual GDP of a certain country, so it's not going to happen. Uh, you know, logistically speaking, again, I'm not questioning the fact that uh, there are individuals out there who would like to see these kinds of things in perpetuity. I'm, I'm sure they do mm. exist. Uh, I'm sure Fauci would love some of this. <laughs> but it's not practical to do so. Uh, and it's not practical because it would require an entire class of people to be strict enforcers of that. And it just doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. And, uh, and not to mention that you would need the consent of more than 80% of the people. You, you can't really do it with a, uh, as a minority rule, right? Because it's the kind of thing that uh, logistically costs so much that you need so many people involved and of course you need their consent or their acceptance by paying them a lot. <laughs> Either way, it's not feasible and, and they know it. So, you know, it's basically, um, how would you call it? Institutionalized blackmail? Mm -hmm in a way, right? Um, but then again, you know, looking at the uh, fluffy curves in uh, Florida, they kind of look the same as California without sanitary fascism. So, mm -hmm. of course, Ron DeSantis will say, well, they don't work, they, they're not necessary, so buzz off. Uh, not to mention that Ron DeSantis presumably would like to be president. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, mm. Just throwing that, throwing that out there. I don't know if he wants to be a president, but I think he would be a good presidential candidate for sure. Oh, yeah. It wouldn't be good for Florida, uh, him leaving the governor's office to uh, run for president and um, stay in the White House. Yeah. But it would be nice if the it would be nice if Trump and uh, Deu Santos would do the switcheroo. Trump becomes the governor of, uh, of Florida, Florida right. and, uh, and Deu Santos becomes uh, yeah, the presidential he's candidate. He's a resident of Florida. Yeah, he's yeah. eligible to run for governor. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think he will, but uh, he would be elig eligible for that for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And, and besides that, I'm pretty sure that uh, Trump, if uh, if he were to make a move for governorship. Uh, uh, mm, he he uh, it it's it's already evidence that he has managed to break through the through the fraud that happened in Florida to such a level that the Democrats couldn't couldn't keep up back in the election. So that's he, he does true. have a true case for governorship. That's true, but one also has to remember that Florida as a state has changed significantly over the last 20 years. It's, oh, yeah, it did. it's no longer the mellow swing state that it was 21 years ago, mm -hmm. right? Uh, nowadays, it's more like a deep red state, <laughs> even in the big cities. And, um, you know, it took 20 years to change it to that. It, it may take another 20 years to change it back to a swing state if it is going to happen because you know, since we, we started the conversation from Texas, you know, we've been hearing the loud music about Texas becoming a swing state for the last 50 years mm. and yet Texas is redder now than, than ever <laughs> than 50 years ago mm. when this uh, song started right that mm. uh, immigration and demographic change and whatever we're gonna <clears throat> is going to make yeah, Texas yeah, and, and, and it, it, all, it all started with uh, Lyndon B. Johnson mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. winning, winning the presidency, but yeah, Lind but yeah, he won in Texas, but he won in Texas because he came from Texas. Yes, that's it, true. Would, it would have been a significant shame to lose your own home state. It yeah, would have, I mean, have said pretty bad. Even light. Walter Mondale won his own state against mm -hmm. Reagan, and that was the only state he won. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but still, <laughs> right. yeah. Um, exactly. So you, you can't use the fact that uh, LBJ won back then. That's oh yeah, it's gonna become a swing state. No, it won't. Yeah, I mean, unless the Democrats find a very charismatic candidate that comes from Texas, I don't see Democrats winning Texas mm. overall anytime soon. Yeah, but uh, mm -hmm. Same thing in Florida, right? I mean, unless the Democrats come with a very um, charismatic candidate, I don't see them winning in Florida overall. 
uh, anytime soon. Uh, and no better or work doesn't count in the case, of, <laughs> in case you're yeah, wondering. But, but, but let's remember how much better or work angered the Texans uh, <laughs> in his, uh, they made his them, last attempt. They made them vote for the Zodiac killer <laughs> just so they don't vote for him. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Yeah. Um, no, even with the charismatic individual, uh, the ideology that the Democrat Party is uh, pushing forward uh, is not only divergent with what uh, Florida, other Texas, and other states from the South uh, believe in, but it's, but it's also contrary to what uh, to what these states believe in. Yeah, so, and, so even with all the charisma in the world. Uh, you're not going to win them over. You're going to win some over, but not sufficient yeah, in but, order to make a dent. And, 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 every, and every one of those you win over, you, there are two others uh, who not only uh, are not convinced, but they become part, explicit partisans against <laughs> you. Uh, especially yeah. now as Texas is moving uh, uh, incredible amounts of money. Mm. Right, incredible number of wealthy people and very wealthy businesses uh, moved to, to Texas, and um, for some reason they left their progressive employees in California. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, mm. you know, I'm, I'm just saying. I mean, it's it, it's also a question of financial strength. Up until, uh, including 2016, uh, it was an issue of asymmetrical warfare. Right, the financial strength was in. Democrat-run states, especially New York and California, but also Oregon and a few others, uh, Washington mm -hmm. State. Uh, but now uh, things are becoming not necessarily more equal, but definitely more competitive mm -hmm. from, from a financial strength perspective. And this will matter maybe not quite a lot in 2022, but definitely quite a lot in 2024. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, some are banking, some on the Democrat side are banking on the fact that nobody will be talking about COF-19 restrictions by 24. I wouldn't bank on that. I wouldn't. Uh, and th the reason I, I wouldn't is because, you know, uh, idiocies stemming from 9-11 were still a thing eight years later, mm -hmm. right? In Obama's campaign, they were still a campaign theme. And even in 2012, so right, 11 years later. Um, I'm just saying, you know, it's almost mid 2021, 2024 is not far away. I don't think uh, you can avoid uh, some political backlash, not necessarily political responsibility, but some political backlash of the way the Democrats approached the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, maybe not necessarily Greg Abbott because he's pretty old, but Ron DeSantis is definitely thinking mm -hmm. Uh, in these terms, and by positioning them themselves explicitly against, um, that will uh, uh, set the tone for mm. the discussions in politics uh, on this particular subtopic. Yeah, especially when the Democrats, with the with with the cough pandemic restrictions in their own states, uh, uh, expedited the process of. Uh, businesses and individuals voting with their feet and with their word of getting the fuck out of the states uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that they all turned open business into and, and let's and let's remember people like elon musk <laughs> moving his operations in texas elon musk who generally was either of no political opinion mm -hmm. or leaning democrat right that was usually elon musk for you mm -hmm. up until about 2018 mm -hmm. or 2019 when he start, start, suddenly started to have political opinions, and many of them were pretty red-pilled, <laughs> and, and then the pandemic hit, and then he went full red pill. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, and um, I don't think that's a process that, uh, of course, it won't last forever, but it's not a process that can be stemmed or stopped uh, by the next election, especially uh, by the next presidential election. I don't think it can be stopped. And the insistence on these kinds of, well, documents, policies, whatever you want to call them, vaccine, passports, the more you insist on them, the more you piss off people. Mm -hmm. And it's a strong miscalculation to say, oh, but you know, this will entice more people into taking it. I don't think so. I don't think so. And yeah, sure, it, they may have sort of-ish worked in Israel, but even there it didn't really. I mean, mm -hmm. let's not forget, uh, less than 60% of the population was convinced uh, 
Mm. So, you know, it, it didn't really work there either. In, in a war society. So you're, gonna say, so you're saying it's going to work in a free state like Texas? <laughs> really? <laughs> in what universe? Um, in the end, I, I do expect that if the vaccines are effective, which is again still under debate, so I forget mm -hmm. that, but if they turn out to be entirely effective, uh, I expect more take up, um, uh, what, uh, what's it called? Yes, vaccine intake. I think that's the mm -hmm. phrasing in English. I expect it to be higher in free states with uh, none of this nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, than in uh, straight states like the United English Emirates, uh, <laughs> where um, a lot of these stupidities are, uh, well, mold in public. Because again, I don't expect Britain to to seriously implement any of that. Not because they don't want to, but they will they will also get to the argument of logistics, right? Mm -hmm. um, how do you convince a hundred thousand pubs to do that? How do you convince uh, more than 100,000, more, more like a million pubs, right? Yeah, good luck with that. Not to mention more complicated things like Stadia, right? <laughs> it's just not doable. It's not doable. And uh, um, when you see on the internet all sorts of these techno optimists saying that, oh, but no, it's doable, we just have this app. And <laughs> uh, in the real world, right, in the real world, uh, in the United States, there is, um, in Texas itself, 60% of the population, or 57%, I don't remember, it was a, a, a study made in 2018, 57 or 60% of the population never used a smartphone, never, okay? So yeah, good luck with your techno-optimism. In Britain, 35 or 37% mm -hmm. of the population never used, an additional 17% rarely used. So you mm -hmm. know, the numbers are just not there, right? Not to mention that there will always be uh, individuals like me are like, no. Why? Mm. Because no. Mm. And I'm going to sue you into oblivion until you do it my way. Because why? Because my way is, is better. Mm. And by the way, my way is legal, mm. as opposed to your way. Yeah, but on, on a grander scale, uh, it's disappointing to see that, uh, that there are that, uh, in, in, in the US, but not all US states, uh, but, but but uh, ironically, the the red states uh, that uh, were used as examples, Florida and Texas, and there are other smaller ones which this article doesn't talk about. Arkansas, Treat, South Dakota. Yeah, uh, treated their population like adults rather than treating their pop treating pop masses of population as like uh, like like children, which is which is how the the, the restrictions uh, acted out. Not, yeah. not using the example of Israel because they're a war society, but look, but looking uh, closer to home, uh, mm, countries in Eastern Europe or countries on the European continent altogether, including the UK, you know, as, as an example, the the way the restrictions were handled and the way and the way the political class uh, approached the situation with uh, ridiculous uh, restrictions, with stuff like. Uh, uh, if you want, if if you want to travel uh, in in some countries, for example, Cyprus and Belgium, the examples that I know for sure, you can't even go there with uh, with a PCR test. Simply, if you if you're not a citizen or you're not affiliated with uh, with one of the citizen of these countries, you can't go at all. Still, now in middle of April, and these rest and the restrictions, at least in the case of Cyprus. They've been there for at least four months, to my knowledge. Yes, but one also has to remember that 100% of the of these restrictions, and I, well, I guess with the exception of China, but you know, uh, let's leave China aside a little bit, and mm. Australia, which is you know an inheritor of a co penal colony, so you know, <laughs> uh, you know countries, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they're made either without legal backing altogether, and um, that's the easiest ones or via the administrative law. So for instance, Belgium, right? You can't go to Belgium, really. And what exactly stops me from landing in Schiphol in Amsterdam and renting a car and driving into Belgium? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing whatsoever. Or the other way around, speaking of Belgium, right? Belgium, I think, is the, the uh, one country in the Schengen area that has the, you cannot go out of Belgium. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, that, that one as well. Uh, yeah. Again, what stops me from uh, driving 
into Luxembourg or Netherlands or the mm -hmm. Netherlands or Germany for that matter. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right, nothing. There you go. So you know, most of this, and that, that, that's very important to remember, most of this is um, <clears throat> uh, essentially governmental uh, blackmail and um, an attempt to hide governmental incompetence. Uh, a very terrible attempt, uh, <laughs> but you know, if it works, why amp it up? So you know, I understand mm -hmm. about the perspective perspective of the politicians as well, because you can't really do these kinds of things. And how do you know? Well, you test them. And again, uh, the way I, I tested them because of, this is my instinct. When you tell me I'm not allowed to, I want to see. Really? Now I want to do it. Let's <laughs> see. All right. Uh, like it was last year, right? You can't go to the Resurrection Mass uh, on Easter because potato or else we're going to do this and that. Really? Mm -hmm. Grab my camera, let's go. Let's mm -hmm. see what you're going to do. Oh, of course, nothing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing. Right? Um, so th that has to be kept in mind. In the US, it's even more complicated because what? You're going to not li let me leave the state? Really? <laughs> because unlike the European Union, the United States is a country. That's not going to happen, really. I mean, New York tried something like that. And, uh, of course, uh, it only worked until the first airplane full of rednecks landed uh, in New York and said, hey, what exactly are you going to do? What are you going to do if, if we don't? What if we say no? That's, we do not comply. Get lost. That's a, ter that's a terrible idea because, uh, because the, the bulk of the working class that uh, works in uh, New, New York State lives in New Jersey or in, or in Maryland. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so if you were to lock your own state, you would, you, you would actually kick yourself into a uh... Well, they tried that, they tried that, but mm. then again, it only worked until the first airplane full of rednecks landed and said, well, we refuse, what are you going to do? <laughs> if you got something to say, you might as well arrest me now, because I'm mm -hmm. not going to abide, we do not comply. And that's when the restrictions were over, de facto. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Because what you what exactly are we going to do? Nothing, of course. Mm -hmm. It's all a kabuki theater, right? Um, because it's all through the administrative law. And the administrative law has this kind of very important particularity. You can't force me. Mm -hmm. no? That's why it's called administrative. Yeah, sure, you can play with my licenses if I have them. Uh, mm -hmm. You can play with um, maybe issue some fines, which are, again, easy to... Uh, contest in administrative court, mm -hmm. uh, but you cannot really force me to do anything. And if I say no, it stays no, no matter what your opinion is about things. Um, yeah. and but, but the fact that the government uh, played out the, the restrictions like the, like the societies were made, were, made up, were made up by children is what I really want to see those, uh, those, pol the, those political classes to be punished and not just the political classes, but also the the administrative class, the apparatchiks, uh, the police forgot that they're in service of the citizens, not in service of the state, and, uh, and, fairness, and the health apparatus uh, in fairness, also in, forgot that aspect. In the US, aspect. the police um, oftentimes refused oh, yeah, uh, this uh, kind of nonsense. Oh yeah, but I'm not worried about the US, uh, I was talking specifically about Europe here. And even in Europe, I mean, Eastern Europe was different than the West mm. exactly by this aspect, um, you know, uh, the... Mm. health fewer would say something and then the police industry would be like who cares <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's that yeah, um, yeah but, but 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 still the... but it all worked out precisely because and many of the countries of europe and many of the urbanites in the us mm -hmm. have had or have been cultivating for themselves this mentality of a technocratic state well, if the specialists are saying well, this, the, if the, the experts, the <laughs> experts are saying, and uh, whereas uh, you know uh, uh, we are a bit more of um, you know uh, peasants, rednecks, and we're like, you know what? Fuck the experts. The experts cannot dictate into my house. Mm -hmm. The experts don't get to dictate my constitutional rights. Screw mm -hmm. you and your field yeah. and your experts. Get lost. Yeah, the, the experts are not legally accountable. They're not. They're not. They're not elected, and they can't be held accountable. Uh, for yeah, probably I would be more willing to give a damn about what the experts are saying if there would be a condition of, you know what, if you're proven wrong, you go 10 years to jail. <laughs> well, then I'm, then I'm interested of what you're saying because, you know, then you have some skin in the game, right? But since none of them have any sort of accountability, not, even, not jail, not even some bloody fines, then why well, would I care? It's merely an opinion, equally yeah. valuable, equally valid as mine on the couch. Yeah, the, the, the worst thing our health can 
you can expect is to get removed out of his office. Mm -hmm. In the same case, in the case of the US, there was Fing Fauci and his band uh, could, could expect is to also be get, forcibly get, retired. Be, be forcibly retired. But uh, on a but, very g generous pension, mm -hmm. uh, not mind you, yeah. right? Yeah, but uh, but uh, but uh, just as you've said, you can you you can't hold them because of their position uh, legally uh, in in, in, in order to in order to be punished for in case they in case they fuck it up uh, significantly. And again, most of these were possible because enough plebs mm -hmm. uh, chose to believe them. Right, uh, because again, there is no, there was and is no excuse, and it's the fault of the plebs, because nothing a politician, especially not in a quasi democracy, quasi free country, there's nothing those politicians and those experts can do if you say no, and this was true from day one, and it continues to be mm -hmm. true today, and it will continue to be true for the foreseeable future anyway. If you say no, nothing happens. It's pretty much like SJWs, you know, the, because you know these experts are nothing more than glorified SJWs. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens if you tell these asshats no. Stay at home, no. Reduce your mobility, no. Wear a mask, no. What exactly are we going to do? <laughs> Very easy. Fuck you, that's how. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fuck you sideways. Really? No, because no. And the same, uh, and to wrap up the topic with the uh, <clears throat> vaccine passports, I would have been a little bit more tolerant with the topic. I would have still said no, but at least be more tolerant with the topic if someone could prove in a decent manner, not beyond reasonable doubt, by the way, there is no such thing as 100% in medicine uh, or specifically epidemiology, but at least prove in a decent manner that they would make sense from an epidemiological perspective. Mm -hmm. And they don't. But it would actually work. Yeah, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And since they don't, then any further conversation is a waste of time. That's why I never bothered to make a video about them, and I won't, uh, precisely because of that. I don't want to waste my time, I don't want to waste your time. So, speaking of which, let's move to the next <laughs> piece. Reuters, foreign interference in Canada hitting Cold War levels thanks to COF-19, says spy agency. <laughs> <laughs> foreign spying and interference in Canada last year hit levels not seen since the Cold War, in part because of vulnerabilities caused by the COF-19 pandemic, the main Canadian spy agency said on Monday. That's the first line over there. The vulnerabilities are not caused by the COF-19 pandemic, they're caused by the government of Canada. It's a very important decision. Uh, the, distinction this little fluffy guy makes no decision the fluffy guy doesn't spy on you the fluffy guy doesn't impose stay in shelter in place orders this uh, fluffy guy doesn't do anything the fluffy guy just makes you cough that's it the Canadian Security Intelligence Service uh, signaled out, uh, singled out uh, Russia and China as particular causes for concern as said, and said key national security threats such as violent extremism, foreign interference, espionage and malicious cyber activity grew in 2020 and in many ways because much more, because much more became much more serious for Canadians. In its annual report for last year, the CSIS linked the jump in foreign spying to the increasing number of people working from home because of the cough. 19 pandemic again no because of your opinion uh, foreign threat actors including hostile intelligence services and those working on their behalf have sought to exploit the social and economic conditions created by the pandemic to gather valuable information itself <clears throat> again created by your government not by the pandemic okay the report was the latest uh, from Kaknada's intelligence community to focus on Russia and China. The head of C CSIS said in February that China posed a serious strategic threat, while the Signals Intelligence Agency last November identified state-sponsored programs in China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea as cybercrime threats for the first time. In 2020, CSIS observed espionage and foreign interference activity at levels not seen uh, since the Cold War, uh, they said. China, Russia, and other foreign states uh, continued to covertly gather political economic and military information in Canada through targeted threat activities in support of their own state development goals. Right. They actually realize it just now. <laughs> I, um, I know about Chinese interference as early as 2016 and for sure it's been happening for yeah. years before I heard about Chinese it. Chinese interference in Canada, that's 
30 years old news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really yeah. is 30 years yeah, old Vancouver news. didn't become Vancouver yesterday. It became way That's way true. Time ago. That's true. Same thing with Toronto, right? Which, is a, which has been a city run by the Chinese triads uh, at the very least since mm -hmm. 20, 2005. Probably even earlier than that. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, th this idea that it, uh, oh, but you know, it's because of the pandemic. No, no. At best, the policies adopted by either the Canadian uh, central government or by the provincial governments of Ontario and respectively uh, British Columbia, um, they may have exacerbated some facets of pre-existent. Chinese interference and whatnot. Maybe you could argue the case in that direction, but that would be pretty much it. The bulk of the problem had been there for decades, especially as it pertains to China. Now, sure, maybe North Korea, maybe that's a newer threat and whatever, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as it pertains to the CCP, no, this has been a problem for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the problem exacerbated uh by the inherent xenophilia of particularly the current government because they do like uh, the Kakdo administration because they do like the, the Chinese money that's flowing in uh, and that's still propping up the real estate bubble that hasn't stopped um, has, hasn't stopped with the 2008 crash uh, and it can continue on to ridiculous levels seen even today yeah uh, I mean the idea of uh, a uh, tiny flat in uh, uh, Vancouver costing two or three million dollars <laughs> in a building that uh, roughly resembles the old tier communist blocks in Romania. Um, that's just ridiculous. And there's no way you can convince me that uh, that happens because, oh, well, mm -hmm. that's how the market wanted. No. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um... That's not how this works. And it has quite a lot to do with a lot of Chinese shekels being funneled through mm. those economies, those state economies, um, and basically money laundering for the CCP. Yeah. And you know, you're only noticing it now mm. because if, mm. if, if, if that's the honest assessment that the C CSIS now says, oh, but we're only noticing it now because of the pandemic, then, then quit. Yeah, just give, just give up at your job. You're not you're not doing it great. But uh, it's curious. Uh, well, they definitely haven't realized it now. Now they just came out public about it, and uh, and you can see in the discourse that they're blaming it on the pandemic, uh, because if they were to blame their own government, then they would have been ousted out of the office uh, then again, in like, the next second. Then <laughs> again, it would make sense uh, for my suggestion, right? Mm -hmm. Quit. Then mm -hmm. just quit. Um, I'm hoping you're correct. I don't think you're correct, but I hope you're correct. Uh, and this is just how oh, we're coming out in public now, so we can prime the public of starting seeing China as the enemy and whatnot. Mm. I hope that is the case, but I don't think it is. Because I usually bank on stupidity rather mm. than uh, uh, any sort Rather than malcontent. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I really think that there, there's just like, oh, oh shit, it's bigger than we thought. <laughs> oh, uh oh. McCarthyism 2.0. <laughs> if if there would ever be that McCarthyism in Canada, really? Come on, we've both we've both been been there. That's not a place that where McCarthyism would be uh, enjoying any sort of support. It's just not a place that would support. Yeah, sure, it would be needed, mm -hmm. but I don't think it would get any support anytime soon. Uh, let's not forget that even during the Cold War. Uh, Canada was uh, a lot more, a lot friendlier overall as a as a country, yes, mm -hmm. with KGB officers than even the most pro commie factions of the U.S. Right. So. Yeah, and b b because Canada was the way to do backdoor deals with the U.S. without involving directly the U.S. Even uh, yes, that's true. E even the Romanian Communist Party did deals with Canada. We we, yes. we we got the technology for nuclear plants from Canada. It's called Kandu. Yes, that's true. Uh, yeah, it, it mm -hmm. was the layover to work around mm -hmm. U.S. sanctions, but also to uh, yes, to send CIA intelligence operatives. Mm -hmm. uh, you send them as Canadian citizens, and yeah, that's true. But the thing is that uh, whilst portions of the 
deep state slash intelligence apparatus of Canada understood that. Many in the political classes did not, and they still don't. Mm -hmm. So, um, which is why now China is targeting them quite heavily, precisely because of that, because the, the, the Chinese intelligence services have figured it out that, hold on, people, hold on a second, that place is run by stupid. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and because it's run by stupid, it makes perfect sense to try to target uh, to um, to get the influence there in in especially economical influence but also intelligence related influence because why not you know, it's an mm -hmm. easy target and it's very close to well the United States yeah. which is the of course the more important target but you know the CCP can't just barge the barge into the United States like they do in Canada and as mm -hmm. a result you know step by step it's a very pa it's a very patient uh geopolitical entity mm -hmm. right china is a, has always been a very patient uh entity whether it was uh, imperial whether it was uh, uh the first republic it doesn't matter mm -hmm. it doesn't matter who ruled over what is today china it has always been ruled by elites that were very patient and the current ccp doesn't uh is not is not fundamentally different from that i mean at, at the end of the day xi jinping is from the CCP's faction called the Crown Prince Party. So you know, they, they do um, inherit that way mm, of looking yeah, at the yeah, world. Yeah, it's part of the Confucianist philosophy yes. that China has been functioning for centuries already. More like millennia, yeah. but okay, fair enough. Uh, so yeah, you're only noticing it now. Mm. Terrible. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and the way I see things, this is a geopolitical danger for, for the US and uh, most likely the alphabet soup from the US is already aware of that. Now, but now, now it's just all about uh, oh, m mulling the Canadian intelligence in order to start doing their job uh, and to undermine uh, these actors because these actors are dangerous when left unchecked or at least be aware of what they're doing. Which is why Trump should have pulled a stunt and uh, uh, invade and annex, <laughs> annex. annex Alberta to protect the American minority there. Uh, and, and, and annex Alberta, then integrate uh, in, integrate Quebec because they already have um, they already have the uh, what was it Party Fifty One? I don't know Fifty One in French. So uh, yes, <laughs> uh, that, that would be one option, uh, and you could say that you know those are the. Um, ethnic relatives of uh, the people from New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, man. Mm. Uh, it would have made the issue much mm. more um, uh, much more simple now, mm. <laughs> you know, in those territories. I'm only half joking. I mean, seriously, but Canada seems to be um, incapable of electing more, slightly more competent leadership. Um, kind of like Europe, really. Mm. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I don't know. But yeah, you know, uh, oh, unseen since Cold War levels. You've been in the Cold War with China for 40 years. I mean, mm -hmm. It's just that maybe you're now you're noticing it, but, <laughs> you know. Um, all right, speaking of Europe, let's get back to, and, and the French, oh Christ. <laughs> Political, the French left tears itself apart over non-white meetings. This is fun. French mm -hmm. left-wing parties have spiraled into a bitter fight over whether white people should be asked to shut up or be banned outright during meetings about minority issues. I'm loving this. The controversy erupted after revelations that a far left-wing uh, student union called UNEF organizes meetings that are off-limits to white members. An Hidalgo Paris mayor and socialist presidential hopeful stepped in Wednesday after a candidate from the same party, Audrey Pulvar, failed to condemn such meetings. The field of politics is not a therapy session, it's the domain of the universal, where we seek unity and defend our secularist values, Hidalgo said on TV. Polvar, a black uh, former news anchor running under the socialist banner in the upcoming regional elections, said on Sunday that white people should not be banned from discussion groups on minority issues, but uh, that they can, however, be asked to keep quiet and be silent spectators. Asked whether she would uh, have said the same thing, uh, oh, Hidalgo said obviously not. The clash over non-white discussion groups has uh, reignited a debate in France about the growing influence of US-style identity politics and how it challenges the country's existing political traditions. Polvar's 
comments uh, lies incensed the far right and the right with Valérie per, uh, Pécresse, a rival at right-leaning Les Républicains, accusing uh, uh, Pulvar of promoting an acceptable shade of racism. But they also sparked anger among the old guard of the Socialist Party, which is seeking to rebuild itself after a stunning defeat at the 2017 elections. They've been flattened in 17, <laughs> to be more precise. For many on the left, the universal values of Égalité, Fraternité, Liberté should transcend religious or ethnic alliances and more integration and assimilation, not less, is needed in the fight for social justice. This faction does not understand the new guard coming up through organizations such as UNEF. Polvar's words uh, are more than clumsy, they are regrettable, it doesn't correspond to our common ideas. Nobody should be asked to keep quiet, said uh, Olivier Faure, or Faure, I guess, the leader of the Socialist Party on French uh, television channel LCI. Ultimately, non-white discussion groups lead to segregation, and that is something I cannot agree with, said Richard Jung, a socialist senator. We should be able to talk together, disagree, even oppose each other in the same room. The backlash against Pulvar was such that uh, she felt compelled to justify her statements while stopping short of apologizing. Some thought I was telling people to be silent, and that is wrong, she, uh, she wrote in Le Monde. Uh, some thought I wanted to exclude them, that is not what I said nor what I meant. I've always been in favor of speaking of discussions, that's fake news. And you know it. Chloé Morin, a researcher uh, for the Jean Jaurès Foundation and former advisor to a socialist government, said this was the latest sign of a real chasm between generations. <clears throat> And the chasm is becoming greater because what was an ultra-minority movement a couple of years ago is becoming more and more present within the staff of the far left and the Green Party, she added. The far left uh, sees uh, the uh, claimed uh, defense of traditional political values as a veiled attack on minorities seeking emancipation. Nobody complains uh, when you see board meetings at big companies in France that are all male and all white, said Eric Con. Coquerel, an MP for France Unbound, that would be La France Insoumise, which is the most far-left party in, uh, in France. You can't deny victims of racism the right to say it and denounce it in the name of universalism. Universalism is a nice idea, but it's not a machine uh, that effa effaces discrimination. The controversy is the latest example of the left's internal divisions at a crucial time. The Greens, the Socialists and France Unbowed uh, stand little chance of making it to the second round in next year's presidential election <laughs> if they don't present a united front, recent polls show. However, there have been few signs of this happening over recent months. The Greens and the Socialists have failed to rally behind one candidate for regional elections currently planned for June in key regions including the Paris area. On Monday, Green leader Yannick Jadot uh, called on left-wing uh, leaders to unite and discuss a common left-wing project to fight President Emmanuel Macron, who doesn't protect us from the far right nor from climate change. The main left-wing parties have agreed to meet while signaling that it might be difficult to find common ground. The problem of the left is that it keeps shooting itself <laughs> in the foot, said researcher Mohan. Instead of creating controversy over issues that unites it, such as the environment or social justice, and where it is supported by a majority of voters in the country, it keeps tripping over issues that divide it. Yeah. Uh, in fairness, uh, this um, has been an issue that um, even, you know, like New York Times... Uh, noticed uh, this particular dispute within the French left. Mm -hmm. um, the New York Times, of course, didn't like it when the French government and uh, many scholars, including left-wing scholars, but especially <laughs> centrist and right-wing scholars in France, they said, you know what, Th this time around, the U.S. is at fault. <laughs> and you know what? They have a point. I know that the French mm -hmm. always like to blame the Americans for all sorts of crap, and they're almost always wrong. Mm -hmm. But this time around, they're right. <laughs> This time mm -hmm. around, they're right. This kind of disdainful crap came to Europe mm -hmm. from the United States. All right? oh, yeah. And um, it's not going to have a good fate in, the, in, in France. Uh, definitely not. Uh, for one simple reason. The French doesn't do, don't function like that. Mm. The French don't function like identity politics. <laughs> mm -hmm. Particularly US style identity politics because you you can't you can't create that friction that uh, that happened in the U that happened in in the US because the French as a nation did integrate the minorities to some extent there were fa there were indeed failures for example with the for, with the third generation uh, Algerians uh, Algerians but overall but overall they were successful and they did manage to cultivate the French, the French identity even for those who are not white. Yes. 
And to more, more importantly, while the U.S. is founded on uh, federalism, first and foremost, and yes, at least at first, with distinctions, uh, mm. and not to mention that uh, in the early days of the Republic, uh, the, the American Republic, not everyone who was white qualified as white in the eyes of the law. Mm. The French tradition is exactly the opposite. No federalism, mm, yeah, no identity. It was unitarian. Yes, it is entirely unitarian and, and universal. You know, you're either French or you're not French. That's the only distinction allowed by the French tradition. And it has been like that for more than 200 years, almost mm -hmm. as much as the mm -hmm. uh, United States. But the tradition is in t exactly the opposite. Now, is there such thing as racism in France? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. But it's not the kind that can be even discussed, let alone let addressed, alone. <laughs> in American terms. It's just not. It, uh, most of these things, and it's not, not a surprise that uh, not even inside La France Insoumise or France Unbowed, which is again a very, very far left mm -hmm. part, not even there it finds a majority audience that agrees with it. Uh, it's not a coincidence because this kind of language, this, this way of phrasing things, this way of looking at the world, to your average French, including your average far left French, sounds alien. It's a completely foreign concept. <laughs> it's alien. Mm -hmm. And it sounds alien because it is alien mm -hmm. to them. So, you know, I'm not concerned about that. In fact, um, you would see, um, I think it was the education minister or the research minister in France who ordered an investigation on all oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. French universities that get state funds on the on the islamo leftist bias that's mm. the, that's the phrasing uh, she used it and, uh, mm. and, and i think she, she's a black woman mm. as well yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, you know um it's the french institutional system and the french society they work so radically different from the u.s that applying the u.s narrative can only lead to failure now of course i'm not mm. going to be busy explaining these things too much to the French left because you never interrupt your enemy when they're committing a mistake. So <clears throat> there's that. But, but it's still funny to see them struggling, uh, right? And uh, there is a point to be made here, and um, hopefully not, not enough leftists are watching this, but there is a point to be made that uh, this researcher, uh, what's his name? Uh, Moran, whatever. Um, who says uh, that instead of creating controversies on the issues that unite it, that will be the left, um, it keeps tripping over issues that divide it. That's true. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. That's, that's true. And even this article mentioned uh, the, the divergence between uh, the, the new guards' identity politics and the old guards' uh, which are more economic socialists yeah. and they're concerned yeah, they're, with... they're more economic socialists rather than being uh, the social kind of socialists because they still believe in the in the concept that the French Republic has been built into, which is mm -hmm. liberté, égalité, fraternité. Right. You're not. It, it's you're not. You're not going to buy as a country the the divisive identity politics when you have the the fraternité as a foundational value, mm. which everybody believes in, regardless if they're if they're the Leninist far left, or or if you're Marie Le Pen. Right, right. Uh, it's the kind of same the discussion that was uh, held by I think it was on the Canal Plus um, from a French philosopher. I keep on forgetting his name. Who said that? Uh, uh, was he was, was talking to the lockdowners, uh, saying, "Hold on a second. On uh, our city halls, it doesn't say uh, health, equality, and fraternity. It says liberty, equality, and fraternity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we don't give a shit about your health concerns. We care about our liberties because that's more important because that's how our republic functions. Same thing here, right? It doesn't say there, you know." Uh, uh, non-white people and uh, <laughs> equality and brotherhood, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it says liberty, equality and brotherhood, right? Uh, fraternity. Mm -hmm. uh, so as a result, um, um, this kind of clash, and it only happens on the left, right? Mm -hmm. Les Républicains don't have this problem, definitely. Um, La Rassemblement National doesn't have this mm -hmm. problem. M most of everyone else doesn't, and even the mainstream socialist party mm -hmm. rarely has these mm -hmm. problems. 
Uh, it's only uh, there to, to the left of the Socialist Party, right? So La France Insoumise, the Green Party, that's where you find these kinds of, uh, well, they call them debates, I'll call them kerfuffles, and, <laughs> uh, waste of time and uh, things of that nature. But because France in general as a country is a left-wing country, because it is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they get a disproportionate amount of attention. And uh, that could uh, turn out to be a good thing because it would make more people to be, well, not particularly enchanted with left-wing politics. Because if you get into the, into the mind of the average French voter that left-wing means obsessing over skin color, good luck getting votes. <laughs> <laughs> because that, that, that's the part where uh, many of these left-wing activists who probably either studied in the United States or studied with US activists or maybe just spent too much time on the internet on the <laughs> English language forums, the, what they don't understand is that the French people in general, now sure, of course, there are many exceptions, it's a big country, but in general, the French people are already pretty anti-racist. But the old-fashioned way, that would be, mm. they despise you as well, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, coming out and saying, oh, but you, white people should just shut up about... That's not gonna mm. fly nicely, in, in, not in France. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it may fly very well in uh, some portions of Germany. It may fly very well, um, maybe in the Netherlands, maybe mm. in Sweden. And how exactly are you gonna discriminate in Germany? What you're gonna discriminate between uh, be, between the the blue-eyed, blonde-haired Germans and uh, and the tanned Turks? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's another aspect that uh, at least in the United States you have a legal definition of what white means, and. Mm. Even if you find some disagreements, at the end of the day, you can turn back to the uh, U.S. Census definition, what is white people? And you can, can at least start from something that everyone has to agree on, because it's the law. Mm -hmm. You don't have something like that. In, definitely, you don't have something like that in France, no. for sure, because in France, it's forbidden to ask for, the, for these kinds of ethno-demographic mm -hmm. data in the census. It is haram. You go to jail mm -hmm. if you do, right? So you're yeah. not allowed to ask for this kind of data. Uh, you're not allowed to ask about religion either. Uh, so that's why nobody knows how many Muslims are in France, because it's not allowed to ask. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to ask a, a French citizen what religion well, he or she had. Well, truth, truth be told, uh, you can find uh, a backdoor in order to find out, for example... Is, yeah, you is, make FOIA requests to mosques and mm, things of that nature. Mm, and no, no, no not, not even that one. You can use state statistics if you're smart enough. For, oh, yeah, for, sure, for example, sure. if you want to find out how many black people there are in France, you search for how many people suffer from sickle cell anemia, which is yes, which, that's which, which is an issue that affects solely blacks and nobody else. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, again, that, that would only uh, tell you how many basically uh, Central Africans are in, uh, mm. in France, but it doesn't tell you anything think about uh, mixed, about, yeah. mixed blacks from Algeria, mm -hmm. for example, right, or from Morocco. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who no, definitely yeah have not, a, not North Africans. Indeed. Yeah, it, 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 they, they may still appear black, but they have a different genetical makeup. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so that's why I'm saying you're not allowed to ask these kinds of questions in France. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's of course up for debate. But again, you don't have the definition. It's mm. even worse in Germany, you know, right? <laughs> what qualifies as white in Germany? <laughs> uh oh <laughs> <laughs> It has to be part of Das Deutsches Volk. <laughs> I'm just saying, right? Um, say, same thing in Sweden, right? What, what, what qualifies as white in Sweden? Mm -hmm. Are the uh, children of uh, coming from the former colony called Finland, uh, <laughs> are they white? Or, I don't know. Or, or are the Sami people living in North Sweden white? <laughs> yeah, are they white? Right? They're definitely Swedish citizens, born and raised in Sweden. Mm -hmm. Are they white? I don't know. Some of them are actually, but you know, I'm just mm -hmm. saying. So th th that's why this way of looking at the world, imported from the U.S. universities, is so foreign and alien and um, disgusting and uh, uh, completely divorced from reality. Completely yes. divorced from reality. When you try to apply it to any European country, really. It becomes even more complicated on in Eastern Europe, uh, in any country that is not Poland, I guess, or Western Ukraine. So, you know, mm. go Eastern Ukraine or anything south from Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Serbia, Bulgaria. Mm. Uh, what qualifies as white? <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
so many civilizations trampled in this area that um, yeah. it's uh, it's a complete admixture of nationalities: yeah. Russians, Turks, Balkans, um, Arabs, uh, Arab, Jews, Arabs, Jews, uh, even Western Europeans. Oh, quite a lot of them <laughs> well, too, right? Them. I mean, you know, Carolus Rex of Sweden, Carl the Twelfth, Carl the Twelfth. He died in what is today Republic of Moldova. Mm. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, there is a monument in uh, um, in his honor in a, a place called Varnica, which is a village that is nowadays in three countries. Mm -hmm. um, all right, well, two countries in the one territory, actually. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, it, it's a little bit more complicated, right? So the further east you go, it, it gets even worse. But even in France, you know, France, which is, uh, is probably the first, maybe not the first, but the oldest country still existing in Europe that has made the point of being pretty diverse mm -hmm. uh, right from its inception, right, as a modern republic. Uh, what qualifies, mm -hmm. even there you, you, you control the leftists like that, uh, what qualifies as white, mm -hmm. right? You know, is uh, Emmanuel Sarko uh, sorry, uh, Sarkozy, is uh, mm -hmm. Nicolas Sarkozy, is he white? No, he's half Hungarian <laughs> and his grandparents were kind of Turkish. Is he white? Mm. I don't know. Is he? I would oh, say well, yes, but you know, does the left agree? Oh, but it, but it was even more hilarious. Uh, I used to watch a literature conference for a few years back. I don't remember. It was, I think, Boston University that have, that did that did it. That was that was talking about uh, racism in French literature, <laughs> and then they and and then of all of all examples, they used Alexandre Dumas. <laughs> And uh, to my to my shock, they didn't know that Alexandre Dumas was black. <laughs> <sighs> no. Alexandre Dumas was definitely the uh, <laughs> the biggest racist. That uh, come on, kids, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, but then again, this is why this is why uh, I'm saying that uh, uh, no matter how terrible it may sound, when some of us on the right go straight up into the, you know what, fuck these university people, fuck your experts, get lost. The true anti-intellectuals are those people. That's why I despise them. Because they don't study. Yeah, sure, they may uh, have a, the label of a PhD or mm -hmm. doctor or whatever, a university professor, lecturer, whatever, but they're dumber than a rock. They're, they are. And, you know... Uh, as opposed to many others, I'm not a big fan of universalism, as opposed to French people, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't think the opinions of very dumb people and proud of their of how dumb they are <laughs> are equally valuable with the opinions of less dumb people. Right? But yeah, it's it, it's still funny. And if this will uh, spill over into uh, into more mainstream conversations, because for now, let's face it, it's more discussed in English than it is in French, right? I mean, other than that article that is quoted in this political piece in Le Monde where uh, the militant racist from the Socialist Party had to come out and essentially say, well, sorry, <laughs> sorry for being stupid in public. <laughs> uh, but other than that, it's not exactly yet a full mainstream conversation. The full mainstream conversation about identity politics now in France is about the Islamo-leftist bias. Uh, that's where the, the conversation, it's still against those peeps from the universities mm -hmm. who, with uh, a lot of US SJW overturns uh, into their discourse, but they, they still haven't reached to the discussion about these particular topics. Of course, the English language press starts backwards because this is a topic which they're more familiar with rather than the islamo leftist bias, which although it exists and it's endemic in US universities, it still hasn't reached the level of uh, mainstream discourse probably because both political parties in the US have kept a lid on it and um, <clears throat> tried to avoid giving too much credence to it. Although if you're looking at Ilhan Omar, maybe not so much, but mm -hmm. again, it's a little bit more complicated. What I'm saying is that I'm hoping that this becomes mainstream discourse uh, come 22, uh, because uh, wouldn't it be glorious for Emmanuel Macron and uh, uh, whatever the left candidate will be tear each other apart over anti-racism mm -hmm. uh, as Madame Le Président rises. <laughs> <laughs> now make no oh. mistake, it's going to be terrible if Madame Le Président becomes president. It's going to be terrible. But it's mm -hmm. the kind of terrible that the Republic deserves it. Mm -hmm. Because at the very least on 
fundamental civilizational questions, she's less terrible than Emmanuel Macron, right? And whatever the socialists, and whatever will, the come, socialists will, will come, will come conjure come. up, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and considering that the Republicans, uh, Les Républicains, that would be, uh, I don't think they can come uh, come again with François Fillon because he's been mm -hmm. discredited via political justice uh, trial, which uh, ended up being a nothing burger. But mm -hmm. that's how you usually do things in banana republics. That's how it's done in Germany. That's how it's done in Romania. That's how it's done almost <laughs> everywhere in Europe, right? In banana republics, you just create a lawsuit, um, a, a criminal prosecution against someone, even if you know it's wrong, uh, because mm. it creates the image within the electorate that that mm. person might be a criminal or definitely is a mm. criminal because no innocent people is, um, no, no innocent person is just slapped with a criminal prosecution. Oh, yes, mm. they are. <laughs> Routinely. <Yeah. laughs> Routinely. In any event, if this becomes a, a mainstream conversation, um, at the very least it will... Um, it will spice things up because again, if if the if the Republicans cannot come with, with François Fillon, I don't expect them to come with a decent come up with a decent candidate able to win. Uh, but if they do, well, that would be great. But both of the candidates, both both from the mainstream right, that would be the Republican and the so-called far right, which is actually further to the left of the Republicans, but. The, Skip that. Um, they'll be able to pit the other two. That'll be Macron and whatever the left will come up with, um, and let them tear each other mm. apart and maybe grow together. Um, that would be the best case scenario. So that what I'm saying is that non-leftists should uh, uh, cast some more fuel on the fire on this issue and not uh, not try to suppress it. Don't let it die. No, just poke them a little <laughs> bit because it's so much fun. <laughs> but then again, you know. Uh, I'm not very mainstream with the way of looking at the politics. I like to have fun in politics because you know, ridicule is man's most potent weapon, as a, a seasoned leftist taught everyone. And uh, a tactic that doesn't bring fun to your people is a tactic not worth used, <laughs> not worth being used. So there's that. Sticking to race relations, the British Brainwash Corporation race report: the United Kingdom is not deliberately rigged against ethnic minorities. The UK is no longer has a system rigged against people from ethnic minorities, a review set up by number 10 says. The Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities said family structure and social class had a bigger impact than race on how people's lives turned out. I think there is a guy named Thomas Sowell that explained these things <laughs> several decades ago, but okay. It said children belonging to ethnic minorities did as well or better than white pupils, but overt racism remained particularly online. Uh, the Runnymede Trust think tank said it felt let down down by the report. Well, that means a good report. The commission was set up after Black Lives Matter anti-racism protests across the country last summer triggered by the killing of George Floyd in the US. Oh, surprising, su surprise, surprise, an issue in the US doesn't apply to the United Kingdom. <laughs> Who would have thought? Mm. The main findings were that children from ethnic minority communities did as well uh, or better than white pupils in compulsory education with Black Caribbean pupils the only group to perform less well. The success in education has transformed British society over the last 50 years into one offering far greater opportunities for all. The pay gap between all ethnic minorities and uh, the white majority population had shrunk to 2.3% overall and was barely significant for employees under 30. Diversity has increased in professions such as law and medicine. This has been a thing for 100 years. So mm -hmm. eh, anyway, but some communities continue to be haunted by historic racism, which is creating deep mistrust and could be a barrier to success. Uh, out. The Commission's report concluded that the United Kingdom is not yet a post-racial country, it will never be by the way, but its, uh, its success in removing race-based disparity in education and to a lesser extent the economy should be regarded as a model for other white majority countries. A foreword to the report uh, by Chairman uh, Tony Sewell, an education consultant and ex-charity boss, said we no longer see a Britain where the system is deliberately rigged against ethnic minorities. While the impediments uh, and disparities do exist, it continued, they were varied uh, and uh, ironically, very few of them are directly to do with racism. The report added that evidence had found that factors such as geography, family influence, socioeconomic background, culture and religion had more of a significant impact on life chances than the existence of racism. That said, we take the reality of racism seriously and we do not deny that it is a real force in the United Kingdom. The report also said there is an increasingly strong form of anti-racism thinking that seeks to explain all minority disadvantage through the 
prism of white discrimination, which it uh, said uh, diverted attention from the other reasons for minority success and failure. In a statement issued after the report was published, Prime Minister Boris Johnson said it was right that ministers now consider its recommendations in detail and assess the implications for future government policy. He added the entirety of government uh, remains fully committed to building a fairer Britain and taking the action needed to address disparities wherever they exist. Speaking to BBC Radio 4's Today program, Dr. Sewell said while uh, there was anecdotal evidence of racism, there was no proof that there was institutional racism in Britain. No one denies and no one is saying racism doesn't exist. We did find an anecdotal evidence of this. However, evidence of actual institutional racism? No, that wasn't there. We didn't find that. Dr. Dr. Sewell added that the term institutional racism is sometimes wrongly applied as a sort of catch-all phrase for microaggressions or acts of racial abuse. Professor Kehinde Andrews, a professor of Black Studies at Birmingham City, you know something bullshit is coming, said the report was not a genuine effort to understand racism in Britain and mm. bullshit delivered. <laughs> Prof <laughs> professor Andrews said it's complete nonsense. It goes in the face of all actual existing evidence. This is not a genuine effort to understand racism in Britain. This is a PR move to pretend the problem doesn't exist. Close quote. And of course, the article goes on and on and on mm -hmm. with a lot of whining. The second half mm -hmm. of the article is full of whining. No. How much would you bet that this guy, Professor Andrews, is the one that understands racism from the US perspective that does not apply in Britain just as much as it doesn't apply in France? Because even if, uh, even if Britain has more, has more cultural common grounds with the US because they're, an un because they're pretty much the country that started the US uh, centuries ago, it still has that unitarianism that uh, not 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 present to that extent as it is in France, but still to a greater extent, and it never discriminated uh, at an as, at an institutional level because it never had to. Yeah. E e even in the days of the empire, back in the Commonwealth, uh, any person that ended up in the British Isles was not con e even if they came from in from the British Raj from current India or from one of the African colonies, they were not treated different, differently because they were of a different color or from a different race. That never happened, wasn't the case, no. isn't the case now, won't be in the future. Yeah, they were, you know, uh, subjects of Her Majesty. Yeah, everybody's so, subject of Her Majesty. <laughs> right, uh, so it, it's uh, now... Um, was that kind of terrible? Yes, because, you know, being a subject rather than a citizen is distinctly inferior, a priori, so there's that, <laughs> but, you know, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the, you're all equally plebs to Her Majesty, so, you know, <laughs> plebs of different colors, but, you know, plebs nonetheless. <laughs> um, on a more serious note, I think this Professor Kehinde, whatever, Kehinde Andrews, uh, I think he's just defending his job, right? He's mm -hmm. a professor of black studies. Mm -hmm. uh, what exactly is the profession that uh, a graduate from black studies uh, is able to perform on the open market? Um, let, let, let me tell you, he, you would get employed uh, at, at the BBC in order to employ others who are of a BAME background. <laughs> right, right. Well, that doesn't sound like a profession to me, mm. right? Uh, not the, to mention the, that these the days... Ethnic inclusion officer. <laughs> right, right, right. Because not to mention that these days the uh, BBC is going through a downsizing effort ever since mm. uh, uh, Boris Johnson uh, won the election. He didn't stop trying to keep on firing people from the BBC and shrinking their budget and it's been working and it's been working pretty well <laughs> mm. I have to admit um, so no, uh, he managed COVID terribly but on many other issues the uh, Boris Johnson cabinet has been pretty based um, mm. so there's that but uh, <clears throat> what I'm saying is that these people uh, like Kehinde Andrews and of course he's not the only one the BBC quotes a lot of these uh, uh, whiners over this article mm. it's a very long article full of whining um, they pay, they're basically defending their jobs, their useless jobs, their, their activities that, um, whose only merit is destroying capital, wasting resources, and producing absolutely nothing of value. So, of course, these people are going to um, criticize this report because this report basically says that, you know, all of those people, yeah, their jobs are useless. They're no longer needed. If mm. they ever were needed, they're definitely not needed now. Get lost. Mm. And that's the problem with the so-called uh, uh, third sector, right? The charity sector. 
because it is very rarely the case that a sector of activism uh, acknowledges that their job is done. Mm -hmm. It's very rare. It's not impossible. And I, I've been through. Uh, yeah, this uh, this friction creates a business for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's uh, you know, I, I've been. I think I've said the story before. Maybe not in English. Uh, twenty years ago, well, more than twenty-two years ago. I got into the business because it was a business. I mean, I'm not gonna uh, feel sorry for it, but I got into the business of um, flattening the curve of HIV incidents in Romania. When I started, the incidence was comparable with Zimbabwe. Four or five years later, the incidence was the smallest in Europe. Now, when that happened, most of us that were there, we left the sector because, like. Our job here is done. Good. Now it's only needed a very small amount of personnel, much smaller than it was needed five years earlier, to mainly keep surveillance and make sure that it stays where it is. And it stayed mm -hmm. that way all the way till present day. Uh, so it's no longer needed for a big NGO sector that uh, uh, traffics in hundreds of millions of dollars annually. right? Um, but that was the exception. Most of the people with whom uh, I worked with uh, at the time, they moved into other NGO sectors and continued to do it as a business on all sorts of causes, most of them either non outright non-existent mm -hmm. or significantly less uh, prevalent than they would say in their business. Same thing with black studies, right? If there was I don't think there ever was, but let's take this report uh, for granted. If there ever was a need for them, it most obviously isn't a need for them now. But for them to admit that, that would mean their careers are over and yep. they would have to do something else, something more productive. And, you know, why would they want that? Why would some bureaucrats admit that their job is done? Or professional activists. Or professional <laughs> activists, right. But that's the thing, I mean, many of them are not even professional activists. You know, I'm mm -hmm. a professional activist because I can change the cause whenever I'm, when I win, mm -hmm. I move over, right? I move to the next one. Yes, but flexibility defines you, it doesn't define them. Just as uh, yeah, in, just, just as in one of the previous so far reports, we've talked, we, we've talked about the, the NGO business of the Palestinian cause. <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, they will be out of job uh, by the by by 2024 at the latest, mm -hmm. because you know uh, there'll be activists for whom exactly. Uh, at some point, there will be a a very lucrative deal on the including with Hamas itself. There will be for sure, mm -hmm. and that'll be the end of the Palestinian activism, because you'll be activists for whom, more precisely. So either they convert themselves into actual charities in helping the actual poor people that are in the so-called Palestinian ter territories, maybe, or they quit. They, they uh, shut down their businesses, and many of them will have to shut down their businesses because they're not really, really that good at being actual charity workers. You know? they're, they're good at you know, talking and writing reports and distributing propaganda, and that would be pretty much it. Distributing propaganda, not even writing it. You know? Smarter people write it for them. They, <laughs> they, they merely disseminate it. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing is that at some point, and I think in, in Britain there was already a cabinet initiative from the education minister who, uh, um, for starters, um, introduced that bill, which I think already passed the Commons, to allow students to sue universities who censored them. So soon enough you're mm. going to see a lot, of, a lot more criticism to the woke ideology than you've seen so far in, uh, in the United Kingdom. Uh, but soon enough, there's going to be ha there's going to have to be a full audit, like in France, mm -hmm. on all of these people. Professor of Black Studies, why does your field exist? Mm -hmm. What exactly? What is the value you're bringing to scholarship? Yeah. Not to mention to society, but at the very least to the scholarship. Is it legitimate scholarship? No, I would say no. But okay, fine, let's have an impartial inquiry, because if I were to make the inquiry, I would just <laughs> decide no and shut you all down. But, <laughs> but okay, let's have a more impartial inquiry, because I don't think most of, the, most of what these people do, like Professor Andrews, is not legitimate. And the assumption... And not, and, and not just him, because the, the, the friction doesn't come just from 
just just from the the blacks or other for other minorities the there's also significant inflation which isn't talk which is talked about uh, from the islamic part which uh, has funneled quite a lot more money than the than the so the so called blacks ever, ever did for example uh, don't remember exactly i think birmingham university has has uh, Mm, have, has their own building funded by Palestinians, partly yeah, by Hamas. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But at the very least, the um, Islamic studies kind of thing. Um, for starters, some of some scholarship into Islam has been a thing in Britain for 150 years, mm -hmm. probably even more than that. Uh, so there's that. At least there's some tradition there, and. Uh, at least it makes sense, right? The empire has clashed with Islam multiple times. It kind of makes sense to have some study about that, mm -hmm. some scholarship in that direction. But black studies, and again, I insist, it's on the academic field that I'm rallying against, not the black people themselves. Most black people in, in Britain have kind of the same opinion that black people in um, Georgia, the, U the US state have, namely that it's all bullshit, mm -hmm. you know, right? So, um, but the black studies, the these kinds of... Uh, so-called scholarship endeavors. These are all new. Almost all of them are younger than 40 years, many of them younger than 10. How exactly are they contributing to the harmony of the society overall, to scholarship itself, to uh, you know, their graduates, where do they work? How, the, how is graduating into uh, black studies, right, help you in any way, shape or form? Mm -hmm. And the answer is not really. Not much, particularly because, uh, um, unlike in the case of of the U.S., uh, uh, British people, even though universities are cheaper than they are in the in the U.S., the, the population is more conscious uh, when, it, when 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 it's about okay, I take this loan from the state in order to go to university. What happens after? Mm -hmm. If, uh, if 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 I end up uh, charging through four years of university in order to continue working in a McDonald's, well, that's pretty fucking terrible. <laughs> and yeah. they're conscious about that. They understand their value. Yeah, and as a result, fewer of them try to attend the university, which, mm -hmm. uh, unlike mainstream society today, I think it's a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, getting more people through college should not be an objective. Quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I would... Uh, insist on the, on getting fewer people through college uh, would be a very much uh, necessary endeavor. Yeah, and in you know in a lot of fields, the the issue of progressive credentialism isn't there in the in the UK as it is in continental Europe, particularly you, you, the you, Netherlands, you, you which I think is the worst offender in oh this yeah. department. Oh yeah, the Benelux region mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. al along with France and to a lesser extent Germany are the main culprits uh, mm -hmm. of this thing. But in but in the UK, for example, you could work as a chartered accountant, uh, t taking uh, taking the ACCA exam, doing two years of college, and that's it. You don't have to go for four years of university unless you want to, but that, but that has its own benefit, it's not mandatory. Mm. Yeah, so, um, you know, this report basically confirms what, uh, through statistical data and multiple observations, uh, was confirmed by Thomas Sowell decades ago in the book called Intellectuals and Race, where he makes a lot of comparisons between the US and the United Kingdom and comes up with a lot of data from the 80s and 90s about the United Kingdom that basically say roughly the same thing as um, this report uh, published in 2021, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it gives another good example of uh, system, systemic inertia, right? Mm -hmm. It took them 30 years to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, so yeah, I don't know. What I'm saying is that uh, at some point, and uh, it seems that we're getting much closer to that point, fucking finally, it only took a decade. <laughs> at some point, uh, it has to become absolute mainstream knowledge that all of these people, right, the social justice warriors, the black studies professors, the feminist studies professors, they're all a bunch of fucking frauds. And uh, it should be inherently haram from a societal standpoint to take them seriously. And, and you shouldn't. And uh, assuming that they're full of crap uh, should be the standard uh, procedure as uh, as soon as they open their mouths. 
Political. Sweden's far right takes a step closer to power. After a decade in the parliamentary wilderness, the far right Sweden Democrats finally have a way in uh, form from the cold. Sweden Democrat leader uh, Jimmy Okeson recently convinced three other opposition party chiefs that they will need his support to take power from Prime Minister Stefan Löfven, a social democrat, at an election next year. Now Okeson is seeking uh, to negotiate the best price he can for that support in the form of policy concessions from uh, his would-be new allies in order to secure real influence for his his party for the first time since it entered parliament in 2010. We're identifying what we can agree on and what we can't agree on, and then looking at how important the things we can't agree on are, Okeson told Politico in an interview in parliament late last week. There is a lot at stake for Orkeson, who has spent over two decades working to get the Sweden Democrats to this point. When he joined the party in 1995, it was a messy mix of often unsavory elements, including several neo-Nazi figures. Since becoming leader in 2005, Orkeson has expelled a stream of members for racist statements and at the same time built growing support among voters with a raft of sharply anti-immigrant policy proposals. But many critics say the party has simply put a more palatable public face on the same discriminatory policies. The coming weeks and months look like a crunch time for his project. If Okeson pushes his new potential partners, the center-right moderate party, the Christian Democrats and the Liberal Party, too hard to conform to his policy demands, the emerging cooperation with them could collapse, leaving SD ostracized once again. But if he doesn't push hard enough, particularly on immigration, which he has vowed to cut to nearly zero, his own voters could lose faith in his ability to deliver what they want and abandon the party. There are risks for uh, SD's would-be allies too. Having now signaled they're willing to work with Sveria Demokraterna, a party they long disparaged, it will be hard to disengage if the ta talks go badly. This is definitely a formative moment within Swedish politics, Tommy Müller, a political scientist at Stockholm University, uh, said. The landscape is changing rapidly. For Sweden as a country, the mere prospect of a far-right populist party like SD achieving influence over government policy is already a radical departure. The country has long pitched itself internationally as a humanitarian superpower, where uh, until recently a large number of refugees and asylum seekers were welcomed. <clears throat> as SD was gaining momentum to enter parliament in 2010, former moderate party leader Fredrik Reinfeldt, Sweden's prime minister from uh, 06 until 14, called them a xenophobic force and refused to discuss policy with them at all. That worked well for his political career. <laughs> uh, but Europe's immigration crisis of 2015 and the resulting spike in the number of asylum seekers entering Sweden caused support for SD to surge and change the equation for the moderates as well as their longtime partners, the Christian Democrats and Liberals. Ulf Kristersson, uh, who became moderate leader in uh, 2017, initially rejected a tie-up with SD, but since narrowly losing an election to Lyof Venn in 2018, he has slowly shifted direction becoming increasingly clear over recent months that he is now ready to seek SD backing to avoid another defeat in 2022. Friendly reminder, we've been to that ele election in Sweden uh, just uh, six months before and we said that if this is going to happen they're gonna have to ask for help uh, for SD. Here we are three years later, the couch was right. <laughs> in a debate in the parliament on Thursday, Löfven was quick to, attract to attack Christensen for his new openness to working with Sveria Demokraterna, accusing him of linking arms with a party which does not stand up for the idea that old people are of equal value. Well, old people are not of equal value, I'm sorry. Um, Christensen said Löfven's criticism was just an attempt to distract voters from his own government's failure to meet Sweden's challenges during his six years in power. Our aim is to get to grips with those challenges and we will work together with other parties on those questions where we have the same view, Christensen said. Current opinion polling shows Löfven and his allies have a slight lead over a bloc made up of moderates as they, the Christian Democrats and the Liberals, but it remains early days. The election will be held next September. The story of SD's rise and established party's struggle to react is one that resonates well beyond Sweden's borders. Across Europe, similar far-right populist parties have gained strength over the past decade, from Finland to France and from Germany to Greece. Where Sweden has stood out has been that its mainstream parties unanimously ostracized SD until now, something which didn't happen to far-right populist parties elsewhere. The shift happening now in Sweden brings the country more in line with nearby Denmark, where the far-right Danish People's Party has worked closely with mainstream center-right parties since the early 2000s, both in government and in opposition. 
if as they were to take uh, ministerial roles after 22, that would bring Sweden more in line with Finland or Estonia, where far-right parties have recently been part of governing coalitions. Åkesson has previously aired the idea that he would like to be the Sweden's justice minister one day, which would give him direct power over border policy. But for now, he said he's just glad that an increasing number of parties are showing they're ready to acknowledge SD and its not insignificant role in the Swedish parliament. It took longer than we'd had hoped, but we are a party of of great patience, he said. All right, this could be fun. <laughs> yeah, this article pisses me off that uh, it doesn't talk of any other policy that Sveriges Demokraterna stands for except immigration. Like, that's the only thing under the sun. Yeah, unlike um, uh, what's, what, what was called in a Partei for Freiheit, Het Wilders Party in the Netherlands, which mm -hmm. was indeed immigration man bad and nothing mm -hmm. else which is why most of his votes now went to Thierry Baudet's party, which is a more intellectualist kind of party. Sverige Demokraterna is not like that and hasn't been like that, at least not in the last 12, 13, 14 years. Uh, yeah, sure, they became popular or known, especially outside of Sweden, for their stance on immigration. Mm -hmm. But that's because Sweden was until about 2016, 17-ish, maybe even 18, a little bit, was gripped by what the dissidents would call the corridor of opinion. It was mm -hmm. kind of like the DDR, right? <laughs> the DDR, but with sort of democracy, but mostly DDR, right? Even the buildings look like the DDR. <laughs> um, right. So uh, it was gripped by this corridor of opinion. And uh, the only way you could even speak about the... Uh, Sweden Democrats was in the context of immigration to mention that they oppose it or that they have a different policy view because oftentimes it wasn't even that they were opposing that they, they just had a different policy proposal or policy position about the topic which uh, of course you can disagree but in most of their positions were legitimate and one way to know mm. that they were very legitimate is that the social democratic government of Stefan Leuven ended up adopting some of them, uh, quietly so, right? Mm. Never mentioning in public that they got the idea from Yemi Orkeson, but, you know, it is what it is. Uh, such as, you know, the crackdown on a certain type of uh, activities like begging in the streets or uh, a crackdown on... Um, uh, on illegal immigration via the Östersund Bridge uh, mm -hmm. through Denmark. Uh, and all sorts of very practical type of pointed policies where, mm, yes, yeah, Sweden Democrats broke the ice. They, they came first with those policies in public. They said, what if we did this? It, it, you don't have to agree with us on our general disdain for immigrants, but you have to agree with us that Un uncontrolled, unlimited mass immigration to Sweden is going to cripple our country. And they had a point. Now, what I don't like about Sweden is that they are economic leftists, right? Uh, most of their opposition to immigration comes from a left-wing point of view. So, you know, uh, on, on issues of e economics, I'm uh, more familiar with Moderater now, or the Moderate Party, which has a slightly less insane way of looking uh, at the world. But still, it wasn't the only thing. I mean, they also had the very populist ways of thinking, of, for instance, in the pension system. They proposed various kinds of reforms. Some of them made perfect sense, in my opinion. Others were brutally insane. But still, none of those were ever even discussed. Right? Because, well, as they, we only talk about them if it's about immigration. But it's not a political party that only talks about immigration. Yeah, sure, immigration is the driving force for their... Um, for their support. And for a good reason. And for a good reason, especially during, uh, b between 2015 and 2018, right, at the uh, height of the mm. migrant crisis, not so much after 2018. Uh, and also, this article doesn't mention, and uh, there are many, most in English don't, uh, the phrasing in Sweden is immigration and integration policy, because they also have quite a lot of policy positions about that as well. Uh, and by the way, some of them ended up being implemented, and I've seen their results in 2020, right, in June, when I, when I was to Sweden, well, I was in Sweden. Uh, for instance, it was SD that pushed for the uh, idea that, okay, fine, there are a few tens of thousands, whatever, immigrants, right, from outside of Europe. We cannot kick them back. Uh, we cannot relocate them to other EU countries. We're kind of stuck with them, right? Okay, fair enough. 
then if this is the case, well, they might as well learn our language and they might as well start you know, working here and you know, stop being a burden for the state or at the very least be a smaller burden. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so they were the ones who forced it through the parliament uh, and eventually almost all parties had to agree with them and it became implemented to expand a system that was already in place in Sweden, that system where, the, um, where they teach Swedish to foreigners. Right? And that's how you got those memes in 2018, 2019. Oh, yeah, um, yeah uh, with, with, with Duolingo and Swedish being the main language studied the in Sweden. The main foreign language studied <laughs> in Sweden, right. And by 2020, at least by summer 2020, when I, last time when I was there, it paid off. Mm. I mean, as opposed to 2017 or 2014, my previous visits mm. to Sweden, yeah, well, I no longer needed Arabic or Russian in uh, certain areas. Yeah, Blinky be a Malmo. <laughs> uh, not just there, but I'm thinking Rosengord in uh, yeah, Malmo as well. As well yeah. uh, there are quite a few others as well. Um, um, anyway, what I'm saying is that I, I no longer needed those. And I also finally found in Sweden which, which was something which was already very common in Germany, uh, namely areas with a lot of immigrants, yes, who don't actually speak English or Russian or whatever. No, they speak their native tongue and German in the case of Germany and Swedish in the case of Sweden. Uh, so, you know, that, that would be the people who have started the integration process immediately upon arriving mm -hmm. and never ever having to rely on a third party language, be it English or French or whatever, uh, but uh, going straight into learning the uh, mm -hmm. official language of their new home country. Mm -hmm. uh, and it worked. Most of those people are now working and are at least partially productive members of the society. Some of them still do get some welfare, but much less than they used to. Uh, and some of them became fully independent members of the society. Uh, so you know, the, these are aspects that you never see in the English language press. And even in the Swedish language press, oftentimes these things are ignored. But at least in the Swedish language press, you also have uh, the commenters who come in with links from the <laughs> um, from uh, the Riksdag, right, from the parliament, and say, oh, "Hold on a second, but that's not true. Here's evidence." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so there's that. Okay, look. Okay. Let's go to uh, slightly, well, actually, significantly more south. Uh, th this was fun in the context. Uh, of uh, bureaucrats thinking that they know better. Mm. Reuters, uh, Swiss students in hot water after virus hoax led to quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet, uh, st students in the Swiss city of Basel false falsified uh, positive COVID-19 results in a bid to skip school, resulting in the entire class being put in quarantine and now disciplinary measures against the perpetrators after the hoax uh, was uh, discovered. Uh, well, uh, there is a verb missing there. Reuters, get an editor. Uh, three students in Basel's uh, Kishgarten High School falsified SMS messages from Switzerland's COF-19 tra contact tracing app, the Swiss newspaper Blake reported. Uh, that forced about 25 classmates to be confined to their homes for 10 days. Several teachers were also affected by the incident just before the spring break in March. Mm -hmm. So basically, the kids expanded their holiday a little bit. <laughs> this is not just a childish prank. Of course it is. This is a serious incident. No, it's not. Simon uh, Thierry a spokesman for the Basel's education department told the newspaper. The school plans to pursue criminal charges for falsifying health relevant documents. Yeah, good luck with that. Though it does not plan to expel them, so they know it's not serious. <laughs> Thierry said that students are in a difficult situation due to the pandemic, but that doesn't excuse the threesomes <laughs> stunt. Uh, right. This is what happens when you. Uh, well, essentially, when you introduce disdainful policies like this, you know, having mm -hmm. a contact tracing app that's stupid in and of itself. And it's been proven time and time again to be stupid everywhere it was implemented. It doesn't matter whether we talk uh, Iceland or Israel or the United Kingdom or Switzerland, mm -hmm. um, right, or Australia or, or, or China. We spoke about these things uh, multiple times over the past year. So uh, you know, they don't work, but they also create, uh, well, additional hoax. <laughs> like this one, right? It's usually the other way around, right? Where people create uh, fake negative results uh, to get around their restrictions. But, uh, you know, uh, every, pol every policy, no matter what, in what its original intention is, right? In this case, the, in the original intention, presumably, was to right, um, uh, mm. slow the spread, whatever. 
Or flatten the curve. <laughs> or flatten the curve, or whatever. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. or, or basically gather uh, as much medical data as possible from innocent people, let's face it, because that mm -hmm. was the original intention. But okay, fair enough. Uh, every, every policy, regardless of its intention, creates a set of incentives. Mm -hmm. And people will act upon those incentives to eventually get whatever they want, regardless of the opinion of those who enacted the policy in the first place. Yeah, whether it is, uh, in this case, uh, positive of COVID tests in order to get an extended break along with the spring break, or get negative COVID results for which happened in a much larger scale, uh, to the extent in, that in, you, in, order, in order to travel through some countries in Europe that require them. Yeah, uh, to the extent that there are now multinational businesses that create <laughs> negative COVID-19 tests <laughs> upon on, request. Yeah, on par with multinational companies. <laughs> right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so there's that. Because every policy ha creates a set of incentives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perverse incentives. Um, not necessarily perverse, just incentives, period. Some of them are perverse, some of them are not. Uh, just like, uh, let's give a more mainstream example, the minimum wage law. <laughs> uh, the minimum wage law, let's not forget, created the perverse incentive of creating legit institutional racism. <laughs> 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 because, yeah, sure, the intention may have been to help poor people. It ended up making uh, minorities poorer than before. Mm -hmm and creating a great legal excuse for legit racists to expand their institutional racism. All right. Good job. Same thing here, right? Let's create a contact tracing app that um, uh, will help us slow the spread and whatnot and keep track on uh, outbreaks and whatnot. What could possibly go wrong? Because nobody would think mm -hmm. of using those results to get their own agenda in order, in this case, getting an extended break. Um, and, you know, uh, when this uh, particular education official says, oh, but it's not just a childish prank, it's a serious incident. Well, unless, uh, well, it, from his perspective, he's wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not a serious incident. But it is a serious incident in the sense that it should be a teaching moment, not just for the kids, but for the adults around them as well, that this policy is stupid. It's not, let's forget, let's set aside the liberty concerns, the civil rights concerns, the um, epidemiological efficiency of all of these measures. Let's set those aside. No, no, no. It's just a very good teaching moment about what, what's an incentive, right? And how reality tends to work. And reality doesn't work like in a lab, like in a simulation. Because if it were, then this wouldn't be reality, it would be a simulation, but it's not because reality works differently and it has its own rules you can't, that you cannot change. Of course, you can attempt to. Mm. Usually it doesn't work. Surprise, surprise, it didn't work this time either. Um, and uh, it, I'm tempted to say it will never work because it's the law of big numbers. No matter how stupid a civilization becomes or a large number of people become stupid, because it's a large number, at some point it's inevitable that at least a few of them will figure out a way to work around it. And those who figure out first, they're the ones that get the biggest advantages <laughs> out of that particular piece of knowledge. And if they do it enough times, they acquire something called wisdom and experience. Mm -hmm. And eventually they'll teach others and eventually <laughs> your whole mm -hmm. endeavor goes, as my Russian friends say, pizdoi na kritia. Right, it it falls down into smithereens, as it would be called, uh, in a more um, fancy way in English. Okay, now let's move. Uh, oh, let's get closer to home, sort of. Belarusian telegraph agency Lukashenko unhappy with about relations with Poland. During the government conference held on uh, uh, April the 6th to discuss foreign policy matters, Belarus President Alexander Lukashenko spoke at length about relations with Poland, Belta has learned. These matters were discussed in the second half of the government conference after ways uh, to optimize the network of Belarusian diplomatic institutions abroad were discussed. Alexander Lukashenko said uh, that the second item is mutual relations with our neighbors, primarily with Poland. Truth be told, our political contacts with this country have never been ideal, but due to our character and mentality for a long 
time we've put up with the individual remarks and accusations and have tried to find a compromise and uh, show flexibility and understanding. We thought that we could not choose neighbors and all of them are indeed important for us. But it turns out that Warsaw uh, sees uh, this uh, constructive attitude as weakness. In June 2020, the Polish side declared it was ready to meet us halfway in a number of areas. Since then, the attitude was replaced with accusations of our, rig of our rigging the presidential election with the support uh, for our Fuji fugitives and their companies, with the sheltering of uh, many runaway uh, the traitors and extremists and extremist internet resources. <laughs> <laughs> and then things went as far as sanctions, Alexandra Lukashenko pointed out. Can you imagine that they uh, sang uh, Hosannas to us in June? And now we know uh, that at the same time, they were double-crossing us using intelligence agencies and other bodies in politics as well, the head of state noted. Brazen attempts to glorify bandits and military criminals and the organization of uh, events uh, for young Belarusians in Br Brest for this purpose were the last drop that exhausted our patience, he says. Uh, and in Grodno, a destructive group of ethnic Poles led by individual leaders of the so-called Polish immigration took part in an authorized event. Alexander Lukashenko pointed out that all of the shenanigans that take place in the year of the 80th anniversary since the Great Patriotic War began, that would be World War II, in a country that lost one third of its population, the Conservative Party, which rapidly loses public support, works particularly hard to glorify Armia Krajowa bandits. In other words, it is a domestic problem in Poland already, he remarked, and this is Lukashenko bullshitting his way out of a serious <laughs> issue. Um, all right. The problem is that this... Uh, <clears throat> incident, if you want to call it like that, was only covered in two places. This one, which is the state Belarusian agency, mm -hmm. and Remix News, which is a pro-Polish um, outlet. I'm going to leave you the link uh, for that too. Mm -hmm. And it makes very difficult to understand what the fuck they're talking about. <laughs> So, yeah. uh, the issue is uh, pretty much like this. In uh, what we call today Eastern Poland, there is uh, a strong Belarusian minority. And in what we call today uh, Western Belarus, there is a strong Polish minority. Mm -hmm. Okay. The problem is that the two countries are in two different geopolitical realities. Right? Poland is a EU member country, a strong NATO ally, uh, significantly wealthier than Belarus for mm -hmm. sure. And geopolitically big on being anti-Russian. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, not having too much love for uh, Moscow. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas Belarus has uh, is lagging behind in terms of economic development by far quite a lot. Uh, it's uh, in a Schengen type of union with the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm. There is no border between Yeah, in them. the CIS. Uh, no, it's, it's even more than that. It's a separate agreement that there, there, there isn't even any customs between, mm -hmm. ter terrestrial custom between Belarus and Russia. So it's, it's a Schengen type of union. It's, it's even more than the CIS, the Community of Independent States. Um, you know, because there is a border between um, uh, Kazakhstan and Russia, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, they're both part of the CIS, but um, the borders are still there. Not with Belarus. With Belarus okay. is, and, and, you know, flights between uh, Minsk and Moscow are considered domestic flights in both countries, <laughs> right? So it, it's a, an entirely different geopolitical uh, reality for, for the two countries. And of course, uh, Belarus is a dictatorship. Now sure, a more smiley face dictatorship <laughs> than in the past, but at the end of the day, still a dictatorship. Now, of course, unlike Myanmar, they don't use the tanks to shoot up out their own population like it's happening in Myanmar these days. But he uh, did threaten at some point. But he did threaten <laughs> he'll do that. Uh, be, as we suspected on the sofa, he won't do it. He didn't. Mm. Um, and that's because, you know, uh, sure, mm. they, it's a dictatorship, but it's still in Europe. I mean. mm, yeah, it's, uh, doing such a thing will be terrible optics, <laughs> yeah. which not even Putin could stop turned out with such a thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Putin didn't fire at his own population mm -hmm. either, and um, uh, some of the protests against him were much mm -hmm. bigger than the ones in Belarus. Yeah, uh, yeah sure, intimidation, some friction here or there, kerfuffles mm -hmm. with the police, yeah, sure, we all do that, but, mm -hmm. um, but you can't really get out and using lethal force against your own population, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been more than 40 years since that has been haram anywhere in Europe. Um, yeah, so you, you can't do Czechoslovakia now again. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. that's right. I think that was the last time when it was kosher to do some, something. And like even that. that one wasn't was exactly kosher because uh, 
that that that's the reason why Romania won geopolitically at that point because it's it stuck out as the only country within the Warsaw Pact which did which didn't join the, the yeah, which yeah. Did, we didn't join the um, the tank column yeah, <laughs> going towards Prague. That's true, but at mm -hmm. least that one was tolerated internationally. It was barely, barely. But since then, none of these kinds of none of that crap was ever tolerated again. Not in Europe again. Mm -hmm. Everywhere else, sure, it depends on many uh, aspects of whose empire and uh, what moment and whatnot. Uh, but at the same time, of course, Poland uh, has um, uh, been using its uh, its newly found financial strength first and foremost, and some of its military strength, but morally um, the financial strength, mm -hmm. to buy yes propaganda and create good propaganda for itself and in the benefit of its neighbors. Uh, with the exception of Belarus, because <laughs> Belarus is, uh, well, yeah, it is the neighbor of Poland, but it, from the Polish <laughs> perspective, it's, it's, it's the neighbor of Russia. Russia. It's Russia, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah it's, it's in the name. It's Belarus. Uh, right, Belarus. Right. Russia. Yeah, yeah, the white Russia. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's basically it is. White, uh, white Russia. White, mm -hmm. not in the racial sense. It's a more historical context. Mm -hmm. White army versus the red army. Yeah, mm -hmm. whatever. The point is that... Um, since and, and it's not an issue since June 2020, as Lukashenko said. No, no, mm -hmm. th this started um, more than six years ago, uh, basically with the rise of Pravois, Pravid Livosh to the power in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been multiple, uh, yeah, youth engagements, if you want them, uh, in which the various Polish forces, some of them associated with the government, with the conservative parties, some of them not. But they all worked in the in the idea of strengthening the Polish identity among the um, Polish minority on the Belarusian side of the border, and strengthening the anti-Putin and anti-Lukashenko sentiment among the Belarusian minority in Poland. Which, in the end, when the whole brouhaha started last mm -hmm. year with the uh, rigging of the president, come on, of course they were rigged. The, Lukashenko, come on. <laughs> of course they were rigged. Now, of course, were they rigged to the extent that uh, uh, if they had been fair, Lukashenko would have lost the election? Maybe, maybe not. It's, a, it's an open question. Mm -hmm. But of course they were rigged. Uh, say, saying that they were very open and fair, that's just a lie. <laughs> in any event, when the whole brouhaha started in, in Belarus last year, <clears throat> many of those... Belarusian ethnics, if you want to call them like that, living in Poland, they've used their own access to resources, because again, they're living in a much wealthier country, that would be Poland, to help the uh, protesters in Belarus in various ways, be it with money, with technology, with propaganda, yes, mm -hmm. or with outright helping them uh, if they ran away from the country, offering them shelter inside Poland, because let's not forget, some, uh, especially the more prominent leaders of the protests were hunted by the authorities, uh, by the Belarusian authorities. Sure, not with the intent to kill them, but with the intent to arrest them, beat the crap out of them, extract information from them and things of that nature. Um, but still, and this is basically what Lukashenko is complaining about, namely that uh, he's been consistently and quite efficiently undermined by a decentralized network that he cannot understand and there's no way he can understand it because, you know, he's too old. He doesn't understand this kind of tactic. Yeah, it, it had not been invented when he went to the KGB school. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, really, that's really what it is. And most of the top intelligence officials in Belarus are the same thing. They're, they're quite outdated in their grasp of how these things work. You know, Gene Sharp hadn't written his book <laughs> when these people went to school, right? So they don't understand it. They really don't understand it. And um, in their mind, they have to think institutionally. Uh, we have some, that problem some, sometimes here in Romania as well, but at least our society is much more mm -hmm. diverse than Belarus, politically speaking. Uh, but in Belarus, there's no one to tell Mr. Lukashenko that, uh, uh, Mr. President, you're just wrong. Here's, here's some books. Read this and you'll get, mm -hmm. you, you'll get the point. There's no one to tell that to, uh, to Lukashenko because, you know, he'd be jailed or fired or whatever. So they have to think institutionally. Someone is making these people do these things. And they see open support from 
people who happen to be of Belarusian identity, but Polish citizens and being members of Pravois Pavel Livosch, some of them ended up, ended up being quite high in the hierarchy in the ruling party in Poland. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, okay, so therefore the Polish government is asking these people, or is having these people do this to me. Now, some of that may be true, but most of it is not. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result, uh, you know, and from, uh, from the Polish government's perspective, they see this kind of statement, like, what the hell is this guy talking <laughs> about? And of course, they start asking internally, and eventually they do find that some of those activists are indeed members of their own political party, but they're like, Okay, but we did it. You know, more, I can't imagine Mateusz Morawiecki, Prime Minister of Poland, uh, being very busy with um, coordinating protests in Belarus. You know, mm -hmm. Poland has bigger issues. Uh, yeah, definitely. These days, um, I, I could imagine some of some Polish intelligence officers coordinating protests in Russia. Yeah, sure, mm -hmm. I can imagine that. But you know, Belarus, really? I mean, they they seem to be doing a very good job on their own. You know, they, uh, Belarusian protesters, right? And, and it's also the issue of demographics. Eventually, the Lukashenkas of the world will die because they're old. It's the fucking biology. They're, yeah, they're, they're old and we've already seen they're outdated and uh, <laughs> and, uh, and in order to connect uh, with the thing we said in the earlier SOFA reports, uh, it's it's a it's about time uh, to write his three letters. His three letters, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> because because he's 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 simply he's simply all he's simply outdated and uh, a lot of things have passed over his head. Yes, sufficiently. Um, and there's, the, a, there's a time for everything. At his time mm -hmm. has passed along with his. Apparatus. When I read this particular statement, when I was reading it from Alexandru Lukashenko, it it sent a lot of Ceausescu vibes, <laughs> because you know. Uh, he works. Uh, he, he speaks here of oh, the great patriotic war. Nobody uses that phrase. Putin doesn't use that phrase anymore. Especially well, still, still, Russian state propaganda still uses. Yes, but that Putin term. personally, in official statement, no, mm -hmm. not really. Yeah. Especially not in statements meant for other countries, mm -hmm. right? Because this one was meant for other countries. That's why the state uh, agency translated it into English, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's a very quaint, outdated, um, arcane way of... Uh, mm -hmm. uh, right? And then, uh, oh my God, the Polish government, the Conservative Party in Poland um, works hard to glorify Armia Krajowa. I'm sorry, the museum for Armia Krajowa was built during Donald Tusk's prime ministership in uh, Kraków. Uh, Platforma Obywatelska was called at the time, uh, uh, the, the political party, the Liberals. Right. Mm -hmm. The internationalists. Yeah. It's not a, uh, it, again, it's a very quaint kind of concern. And that's because uh, in both countries, both in Belarus and in Poland, you have a segment of the population, both young and old, who are incredibly concerned with these kinds of uh, issues that um, rarely affect the present, or maybe I should say never, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the same thing, you have a bunch of radicals in Poland who are still very upset about the fact that there is a street in Lvov, which is in Ukraine today, right? Um, that uh, is called the uh, Ulica Stepana Bandieri, right? And it's, uh, Stepan Bandera was, uh, 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 well, a war criminal, essentially, a Ukrainian war criminal, who, among other things, yes, killed Polish people. But it wasn't because, um, it, it, in modern day Ukraine, is not glorified because of that. It's glorified because, well, thanks to his existence, um, fewer Ukrainian people died in a very turbulent moment of their history. Mm. Uh, but then again, and you have a lot of radicals on both sides of the border uh, that talk about that. And that's why it is important, that at least with Ukraine, things have been calmed down because you have... Uh, a smarter, wiser elite on both the Polish side and the Ukrainian mm -hmm. side say, okay, let's leave the radicals kick their asses, kick each other's asses in the streets. Let's talk about more serious things among each other. Now, you don't have that yet in Belarus, because in Belarus, you still have the regime in the current regime in Minsk that is still very concerned. Oh my God, they glorify Armia Krajowa, which of course is seen as uh, less than kosher mm. in uh, uh, on the Belarusian side because, well, Armia Krajowa was fundamentally anti-Bolshevik, <laughs> right? Uh, and of course, Lukashenko doesn't quite like that. I get it, but 
That, yeah. That's what I'm saying. That's why it's, it says back. Uh, it sends um, Ceausescu vibes. You know. Yeah. A few yeah. days before we shot Ceausescu, he was very busy with oh, but the Hungarian intelligence forces. No, will, no, the the Argentinian yeah, the, the foreign agents. Yes, the foreign <laughs> agents will. Yeah, and you know, <laughs> and those of us were just like, okay, Boomer, seriously, uh, what the yeah. hell is talking about? <laughs> Because it was such an outdated way of looking at the world. That it just it could not resonate, not even with some of his supporters, and I'm sure mm -hmm. the same thing is here because yeah. you know this, even the supporters of Lukashenko they're still having economic troubles. Most of them caused by the regime. Uh, they're still having to put up with restrictions that are not related to the pandemic. By the way, there are no pandemic restrictions in in Belarus, mm -hmm. but restrictions are related to his paranoia, because that's the word that mm -hmm. has to be used now, and. Yeah, sure, they may support the regime, but then they look at this statement and they're like, ah, we're having a lot of troubles internally and mm -hmm. your business is about Armia Krajowa, an institution that hasn't been around for like 70 <laughs> plus years. And are you insane? And the answer is yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah. Kids, that's why it's important to learn history. Once you learn special history, you start seeing the patterns. <laughs> yep. For for example, for example, this Ceausescu, this Belarusian Ceausescu. Yeah. Uh, and and how is he on his way out? So his his regime will most likely survive uh, probably a year or two, or at worst until the next election. The thing mm. is that uh, he may survive longer, but his regime will not survive mm. him. That's mm. what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. if if well, not if when he dies, the regime dies with him, and that's the worst case scenario. The best case scenario, he is getting got ousted from power before. Mm -hmm. uh, the moment of uh, his funeral, because yeah, by force, if necessary. <laughs> yeah, uh, by force, eventually. Um, yeah. We'll see what happens. Yeah, but uh, yeah, and it could be some force for coming from Russia as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mm -hmm. mean, it, it, it has happened in the past. I believe it was in uh, 17 or 18 in Moldova mm -hmm. when there was uh, more or less a parliamentary coup d'état, mm -hmm. uh, tacitly or openly mm -hmm. supported by. Uh, by Russia, by the United States, by all of its neighbors, by like everyone, you you have to go. <laughs> and yeah. off he went. <laughs> so I'm just saying, I'm just saying, you know, these kinds of moments uh, happen from time to time. Because at some point, someone is uh, too backward and too unfit that eventually the uh, relevant geopolitical players be like, you gotta go. You got, yeah, sure, I don't like that guy, but I don't like you more. <laughs> so <laughs> you kind of have to go. All righty. Remix News. EU leaders promised Turkey to strengthen cooperation in exchange for concessions in the Mediterranean. After the talks with Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, President of the European Council Charles Michel and President of the European Commission Ursula von der Leyen, stated that the European Union is willing to strengthen trade cooperation with Turkey if Ankara continues its supportive approach to partners in the Eastern Mediterranean. At the same time, however, the EU representatives expressed concern about Turkey's withdrawal from the Istanbul Shield Convention <laughs> and restrictions on freedom of expression and political competition. The EU's representatives in Ankara have offered opportunities to expand the customs union, which is an issue of deep concern for the country of 80 million. According to EU leaders, the condition for any such agreements will be efforts on Turkey's part to reduce tensions between Greece and Cyprus. Our process will be progressive, proportionate, and we will be able to reverse it. We hope that Turkey will seize this opportunity, said Michel, adding that the expansion of cooperation will depend mainly on Ankara's next steps. Relations between the European Union and the Islamic country, which is still aspiring for EU membership, have deteriorated last year due to a Turkish exploration survey near the shores of Cyprus and the Greek islands, a piece of territory that Ankara was making unsubstantiated claims over. Greece and Cyprus called it an encroachment on their sovereignty. However, Erdogan, who repeatedly directed harsh words against the Union last year, came up with much more accommodating rhetoric this year, and his country ended uh, most of its activities in the area. EU-Turkey relations are also complicated, for example, by Ankara's military engagement in Syria, Libya and Nagorno-Karabakh. The EU's desire to improve cooperation with Turkey in tackling the issue of migration was also discussed. Based on the mutual agreement, Turkey began to prevent migrants from traveling to Europe and Brussels in return offered aid totaling 6 billion euros. However, only 3.6 billion euros of this money went to help Syrian refugees eventually. <clears throat> so what? You know, the Turks got their peshkesh. 
<laughs> I don't see a problem here. Uh, the migration or the, or the Chubuk. Uh, the migration agreement also included revitalizing Turkey's EU accession process and easing visa policy for Turks. Michel emphasized that the issue of human rights played a major role in the honest debate with Erdogan. Today, Charles Michel and I have made it clear that respect for human rights and the rule of law is essential for the European Union, von der Leyen told reporters after the meeting. According to her, Erdogan heard critical remarks because Turkey withdrew from the Istanbul shit convention on violence against women. According to Michel, EU leaders are also dissatisfied with the restrictions on political parties and freedom of expression. In March, Turkish authorities proposed banning one of the opposition parties, pro-Kurdish GDP, the leader of which was convicted of insulting the president. <clears throat> the current uh, talks were the first direct uh, in-person talks since March 2020. Uh, okay, so this is the uh, the talk. These are the word the talks where that generated that famous photo with the Ursula von der Leyen on mm. the sofa, which was a much more comfy sofa than this one. <laughs> but basically, uh, von der Leyen was invited over the sofa. Um, I chose this article rather than all of the other mainstream article because this one focuses on what was discussed yeah. at the summit. Yeah, not not because the president of the European Commission. Oh got, my God! Got, she had got to sit on the sofa. I was not offered the, a chair. Oh my God! She had to stay on the sofa. Those, those kinds of sofas, by the way, I've had the privilege to sit on. Some they're, of they're, they're very comfy. They're comfy. I oh, asked for. Yeah. They're really very comfy. Oh yeah! So, you know. Please don't need me on the sofa like that. Yeah, uh, I'd we, love got, to... we, we got we got issues with our cockies uh, with this uh, I'd flat sofa. I'd love, well, only you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'd love to have a sofa like that. But on a more mm. serious note, uh, this was an important summit. Um, too bad mm. that the press decided, and it was a decision by the press, really, to treat it in tabloid terms. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, basically, they're, oh my God, my, my diplomatic protocol, my sofa, my whatever. And even from a diplomatic protocol point of view, they were eating shit about it. Oh, of course, of course, <laughs> they were full of it. Uh, Erdogan mm -hmm. did absolutely nothing wrong from a diplomatic perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I hate to defend Erdogan, but it's true. But uh, other than the issue of the Istanbul shit convention, where at least, uh, which at least was mentioned in uh, uh, in other news outlets, everything else was not. With the Istanbul Convention, I guess I'll have to recite my article from 2010, I think. Uh, if I find it, I'll put it, I wrote it on the voice for me. It's called The Great Danger of the Istanbul Convention. That's how it's called. And I wrote it in 2009 or 2010. I don't remember mm. the exact year, but it was several years, more than a decade ago, for sure. Uh, it's a terrible document. And banging turkey about it oh my god turkey is so terrible that it, well hungary didn't ratify it czech republic didn't ratify it slovakia didn't ratify it in fact outright rejected it all three of mm -hmm. them outright rejected it still under ratification is there's poland and romania and italy and a few others i mean <laughs> half of the eu didn't ratify it so you know if, if it's such a big issue then well probably the document itself has a problem and if it's not a big issue, then why bother Turkey about it, which is an important economic partner of the European Union, over something that you know Erdogan could mm. could reasonably retort, lady, half of your union doesn't agree with this. Mm. Why should we? Mm. And for bloody good reason, uh, you know the uh, reasons mainly the, mainly that uh, m many EU countries reject it is because it introduces the concept of gender in law, which is a terrible way of looking at the world and uh, most jurists and um, uh, lawyers and judges in you know less insane countries uh, they look at it and say hold on a second what is gender from a legal perspective <laughs> oh you don't have a clear definition that we can all agree on then maybe mm -hmm. let's avoid using this word Gen gender enough. is a spectrum man don't you understand <laughs> fine let's define that spectrum that, 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 that was the, the chief of the constitutional court in slovakia who said mm -hmm. okay fine i'm willing to that guy is a progressive by the mm -hmm. way the, the chief of the constitutional court in slovakia is a progressive militant yeah progressive. He, he's 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 a meta progressive but he's not an insane <laughs> one that's true that's true i mean he's a progressive but at the end of the day he's is, a, is a, uh, a justice right and there's like we need a definitive uh, uh, definition mm -hmm. fine gender is a spectrum okay let's define the spectrum mm -hmm. where does it start where does it end what are the steps mm -hmm. because we need a way to judge these things and if you can't have that mm -hmm. then we shouldn't be having 
the Istanbul Convention, period. Mm -hmm. Or it should be amended to, to use a concept, this a concept of biological sex rather than gender, and then maybe we can discuss mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, it's, it's as if uh, those criminals that have written the Istanbul Convention uh, don't understand uh, from 2,000 years of uh, legislative tradition that uh, you cannot write uh, vague conventions, particularly multinational conventions, uh, using vague uh, definitions uh, which are rife for abuse. Yeah, and, if and, and abuses happen for m with um, with much lesser precedence than this one. See, for example, Spain. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if, if we are on the topic of uh, if violence against women, is, if abuse is possible, the question is not if it will happen, but when it will happen and to what extent it will be. And yes, uh, even very clear, concise piece of legislation can be abused. But especially the treaties uh, and conventions and pieces of legislation that are intentionally vague, those will be uh, definitely exploited for abuse. It's not a question, it's, it's, uh, it's weird not to expect it, essentially, mm -hmm. right? So there's that. Then there is the issue of customs union, which should have been treated more seriously in the press because there are quite a few countries in Europe, starting with Germany, and continuing with most of southeastern Europe and uh, okay not Italy but southeastern Europe right Bulgaria Greece Romania Germany for sure portions of Poland uh, definitely Hungary that are definitely affected by how this works uh, and also a lot of uh, uh, EU partner countries like I'm thinking Albania for instance mm. whose uh, Turkey is one of their main trading partners and the way that the reason they're willing that they're able to do that much trade with Turkey is via the customs union mm. so it's a very important topic that was treated in, in fact uh, when we wrote this uh, uh, when we broke the news in Romania we learned from Albanian websites because at least in Albania the, the, the press did treat this seriously because it well mm -hmm. it's like 20% of their GDP <laughs> the discussion about the yeah the yeah, cost the, of yeah the, and it's an important aspect because it's not just direct trade with Turkey and uh, and whatever they're manufacturing or growing or anything but it, but it's also the bridge that Turkey offers for other countries including countries under sanctions like Iran like Iran mm -hmm. yes if in you want to buy it, something Iranian mm -hmm. it, the easiest way to do it legally is to buy it uh, as in assembled in Turkey mm -hmm. it works yeah mm -hmm. yeah get a to get a Turkish stamp in order to not go or not even go altogether through the for the customs process because you're under sanctions or mm -hmm. or not or not expect uh, to have uh, huge taxes levied upon you for customs and uh, VAT and everything else mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah the, uh, the this is an important issue and uh, and the migration issue is still important because there are mm -hmm. still about 5.5 million immigrants in Turkey mm -hmm. that are held in Turkey in the sense that not necessarily that they're jailed or something, because well, almost all of them are now spread around the Turkish society, but in the sense that Turkey has taken the commitment and is still uphold, upholding it of not letting them travel westwards. Uh, they can go back to their own countries if they want to, and some of them did, but they're not uh, allowed to leave Turkey to go to Bulgaria or to Greece and then uh, from there mm. on further west, of course, because none of them wants to stay in Bulgaria or in Greece for that mm -hmm. matter, right? Uh, or, Cyp or Cyprus. Oh, definitely not Cyprus. <laughs> uh, so there's that. Uh, besides, you can't travel to Cyprus because you're going to coof. Um, <laughs> so there's that. Um, so what I'm saying is that uh, this is again a very important aspect, particularly for, well, Germany, once again, <laughs> uh, and, um, and uh, the Scandinavian countries uh, to a certain extent, the Netherlands, maybe even France. Um, so uh, and to us to a lesser extent now because we're in a post Brexit setup to the United Kingdom as well. But the thing is that none of these very important topics were even mentioned in the mainstream press. That's why we're reading from Remix News uh, mm -hmm. because well, the BBC didn't talk about that. Reuters barely mentioned it. 
Uh, now, of course, Remix News is a, uh, an agenda-driven website, and uh, you know they, they call Turkey an Islamic country. Well, that's a bit too much. <laughs> 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 that's a bit too much. Yeah, sure, the majority of the Turkish population is nominally Muslim, but it's not quite kosher to call Turkey an Islamic country. I mean, if Turkey mm. is an Islamic country, then, then what is the Islamic Republic of Iran? <laughs> it's a theocracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. It's, fair. A, it's an Islamic theocracy. <laughs> yeah, I guess, fair enough, in a way. But, uh, yeah, I'm... I'm uh, I'm a bit too conservative on that. I, but words have meaning, you know. And uh, yeah, sure, I get it. You write propaganda. I do too. But words have meaning. Be precise in your language, especially mm -hmm. when you're writing news. But yeah, so um, uh, the the fact that the the in-person talks were uh, finally resumed is uh, in itself good news, because uh, when one thing about diplomacy that most people don't understand, you cannot have remote democracy. Diplomacy, mm -hmm. it just doesn't work. Uh, case in point, there was that intelligence session by some subcommittee of the European Parliament, which was so secure that was held on Zoom and some random journalists from the Netherlands uh, guessed the Madden password, guessed the password yeah. yeah, and got into the meeting and said, hello, <laughs> <laughs> and all sorts of confidential... Keep, keep on talking, we're just taking notes. <laughs> yeah, and all sorts of confidential and sensitive data was being trafficked in that meeting, right? You cannot have these things uh, remotely. Not only mm. you cannot, but you should not. You should not even try. Um, mm. And um, thankfully, and this is where uh, Ursula von der Leyen should have been more, um, well, nice, should have been nicer to Erdogan. Um, <laughs> thankfully, Erdogan was willing to accept this freeze of talks for 13 months, 14 months, and uh, uphold the agreements uh, last time, I think it was in February 2020, and mm. uh, uphold those until further notice, and it took a mo more than a year until further notice arrived. Um, that in itself uh, is a testament that Erdogan is actually not willing to go uh, full retard in, uh, in relations with Europe. Now, admittedly, he's a neo-Ottomanist, and uh, uh, in the Ottoman tradition, you always keep up with your treaties. Whatever you mm -hmm. sign, you do keep up with them, because the Ottomans have uh, always been... Um, have always upheld their own end of the bargain. And if you fail to uphold your own, they would invade you. <laughs> so, no, I'm just saying. Uh, and Erdogan, at least openly, he um, identifies himself, he uh, claims to be uh, co a continuator of that particular tradition. And so far, oh well, it seems that uh, he's not. Now, as for the restrictions on freedom of speech in Turkey and whatnot, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, unless you can uh, do something with the Turkish economy, now admittedly it's very hard to do anything with the Turkish economy because Erdogan is doing a great job at destroying it. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But unless you can do some of that, um, you cannot really uh, convince um, Erdogan to change his mind about that. I mean, look at it from his perspective. He faced a failed coup d'etat against him. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Mm. Yeah, you can't exert any more pressure than that. <laughs> yeah, so you know, I, I kind of understand, even though I disagree, but I understand where he's coming from, right? As for the uh, uh, pro pro proposition of banning one of the uh, opposition parties, yes, but it's the GDP, which is a Kurdish party. Mm -hmm. That is to say, it's a Marxist-Leninist party. Now, I've always said that in the Kurdish question is one of the few aspects, if not the only aspect, where I start from the premise that Erdogan has a point. <laughs> I'm willing to be persuaded otherwise, but my initial bias is Erdogan has a point. Because, I'm sorry, but when it comes to a terrorist Marxist-Leninist movement, like are the Kurdish parties in Turkey, yeah, no, I, I can't start from a position of sympathy from the, for the oppressed minorities. Let me know mm. when the Kurds form a capitalist party, and then we can discuss. Right? <laughs> but yeah. until then, yeah, sure, I know Erdogan man bad. Yes, but Marxist-Leninist man a lot more bad. <laughs> right, fair enough. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a break. Um, and then we'll be back with, uh, well, the rest of the world, right? The West and the rest, uh, mm -hmm. as uh, one author put it. Let's listen to Tommy Stumpf, uh, 300 Tote or 300 Dead. Uh, if you like what you hear, but there will be uh, links in the low bar on how to order Tommy Stumpf's album. Uh, and then, um, of course, we'll be back. I'm, I'm, I'm going to put some footage from a Romanian city or whatever.
We're back. You've listened to Tommy Stumpf. Uh, let's move further to the south, to Africa. Follow up of the follow up of the follow up, because we've been keeping on this topic for months now, mm. and it's approaching its end finally. Uh, Al Jazeera, Ethiopia says Eritrean troops are withdrawing from Tigray. Eritrean forces have started withdrawing from Ethiopia's Tigray region in the north after fighting on the government side in a war against the region's fugitive leaders from the Tigray People's Liberation Front. The US, Germany, France and other G7 countries called on Friday for a swift, unconditional and verifiable withdrawal of the Eritrean soldiers, followed by a political process that is acceptable to all Ethiopians. That statement also urged the establishment of a clear, uh, inclusive political process that is acceptable, including those in Tigray, and which leads to credible elections and the wider national reconciliation process. Yeah, good luck with that. That's going to take years. <laughs> Ethiopia's foreign ministry announced the withdrawal, but in a rejoinder <coughs> issued um, uh, late on Saturday, it said the G7 foreign minister statement had not acknowledged key steps being taken to address the needs of the region. The Eritrean troops uh, who had crossed the border when provoked by the TPLF have now started to evacuate and the Ethiopian National Defense Force has taken over guarding the national border, it said in a statement. Last month, Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed admitted for the first time that troops from Ethiopia, uh, sorry, from Eritrea, entered Tigray during the conflict. The admission came after months of denials from Ethiopia and Eritrea, even as credible accusations from rights groups and residents mounted that Eritrean soldiers have carried out massacres in Tigray. It's not clear how many Eritrean soldiers have left. Some in Tigray assert that the Eritreans are not leaving at all. The region's leaders uh, have charged that Eritrean troops are sometimes dressed in Ethiopian military uniforms. I'm not surprised by that mm. at all. Ethiopia's government forces um, uh, face intense pressure to end the war in Tigray, which started in November last year, when Prime Minister Abiy deployed troops following an attack on federal military facilities in the region. 
The region's fugitive leaders do not recognize Abiy's authority after a national election was postponed last year amid the cough cough pandemic. Uh, there are increasing effort, uh, reports of atrocities, including massacres and rapes in the war, and concern is growing about a lack of food and medical care in Tigray, home to 6 million of Ethiopia's more than 110 million people. The United States has characterized some abuses in Tigray as ethnic cleansing uh, charges dismissed by Ethiopian authorities as unfounded. Officials in Addis Ababa, the Ethiopian capital, have not cited a death toll in the war. And probably you're going to have an official de death toll next year. Mm -hmm. uh, last week, the United Nations and an Ethiopian uh, rights agency announced they agreed to carry out a joint investigation into abuses in Tigray, where fighting persists as government troops uh, hunt down uh, fighters loyal to the TPLF, the party that dominated national politics for decades before the rise of Abiy. So... Um, things have complicated further since we last spoke about this topic. Um, yeah. I don't remember if Eritrea we... has entered the chapter. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we speculated about the role of Eritrea last time, I, mm. uh, or at least if we speculated out loud, because we spoke about it, but I don't know, I don't remember whether we had that conversation with the cameras on or with the cameras off. Um, and at that time it was still r roughly speculation, that was a month and a half ago basically. Um, no official information was available, but we were looking at the map and we're like, eh, I suspect there will be something there. Because why? Mm. Because from from Eritrea's perspective, they needed some, uh, what do you call them, street cred? Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. In the sense that uh, they would need to, the political leaders in uh, Eritrea, they would need to make it clear to their own um, as well that they have indeed ended the conflict uh, with Ethiopia. And what's the best opportunity then to send in some troops mm -hmm. to help the federal government of Ethiopia re-establish control over a region over which mm -hmm. you fought for in the past, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so thinking, um, I don't know, uh, let's say tomorrow there will be a rebellion in uh, Western Ukraine to establish an independent state and Poland intervenes on the side of Kiev to re-establish mm. control over Lvov. That would be kind of the situation that you would see between Eritrea and uh, uh, Ethiopia, in the federal government yeah, of Ethiopia. Yeah, because uh, Eritrea couldn't stay idle, because if it will stay idle, then it will be accused of, uh, of play tacitly on the side of Tigray. Yes. Then they will, they will definitely not join on the side of Tigray, even... Because nobody does that. Because nobody, because nobody <laughs> would do that. <laughs> now, to mention that, I don't know if it is true or not, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it were true. Uh, it is asserted here, right, that the TPLF forces attacked the Eritrean military standard at the border. I don't know if it's true or not, but I would totally mm. be unsurprised to learn that it is mm. true. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, we're talking about Tedos Adhanom's people, you know, those people attack anyone just because they can. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. uh, kind of like attacking the whole world over a fucking cough. So, you know, I mean, you know mm. they don't need a reason. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry for interrupting. So, in the, in the case of Eritrea, the most logical thing that they, they could have done was to join on the part of uh, the Ethiopian Federation because uh, anything else would have been bad optics. Mm. In, in Again, sitting idle, would that have been the most terrible option? But uh, uh, then they wouldn't be having a seat at the peace talks, which mm. from Eritrean perspective, it is a very good opportunity for them to start becoming somewhat relevant again in the regional geopolitical uh, setup, the, the post-war setup, which there will be one, mm -hmm. uh, probably starting this year, there will be the peace yeah, talks. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were very few things to lose from Eritrean's perspective uh, by getting involved. Now, admittedly, and I'm sure um, uh, Mahmoud Abi uh, anticipated this because he's not stupid, uh, there are a few, what do you call them, trade-offs mm -hmm. uh, to this move, such as the fact that, well, how do you say this in order not to get suspended on social media? The, the Eritrean military are a bunch of fucking savages. <laughs> There's no way to work around that. Uh, so, you know, whether it was necessarily in the terms of, you know, mass rapes and what, well, I don't know, maybe. I wouldn't be surprised if that were true. 
but the portion of uh, random killings and i'm sure that happened because mm -hmm. this happens every time we're talking about eritrean military getting into a largely civilian er area it just so happens so often every bloody single time that i would be totally surprised for you know next year around this time you know april 2022 to come up with to see a report saying well actually this time didn't happen <laughs> i don't think so <laughs> i just don't mm -hmm. think so yeah. um i can't yes uh, sure i'm biased against the uh eritrean military mm -hmm. but that would be you know as a result of experience um it's a, not a particularly professional army yes it's well equipped and has been well equipped lately but the personnel kind of sucks and yeah, and it's a, it's it's a common trend in not exact. You can't exactly call the Kenya and the Chad region sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, it's, a, it's it, but but it's but it's but it's a common trend within Black African militaries to to not be that good on the discipline front. Yeah, I mean, Ethiopia is the exception. If Ethiopia is an exception, but Eritrea isn't. <laughs> isn't, yeah. If you, Eritrea is more in the, in the regional norm, if mm. you want to put it that way. Uh, now, whether it is ethnic cleansing, as uh, uh, some um, US official calls it, I don't know, mm. maybe. That, that's something that uh, should be investigated, and it's something that we will be having an answer years from now. And how could exactly be ethnic cleansing when, if the Eritreans will cleanse basically their own people? Uh, yeah, but mm. uh, T Tigray is as, uh, you know, Tigrayans are a different ethnicity than the majority of the rest of Ethiopia. That's true. Yeah. But um, at the same time, you know, the TPLF is a political force at the end, political and military force mm -hmm. uh, and yeah in war shit happens and uh, as much as I really don't like the Prime Minister of Ethiopia uh, my, one has to kind of side with him on this one you know he didn't start a war mm -hmm. yes he bloody intends to finish it at all costs and I don't blame him mm -hmm. uh, because uh, well look look at it from from uh, from Abi's perspective Finally, you got rid of the Marxist-Leninist way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Finally, the economy is starting to go uh, in, in ways that is acceptable for the vast majority of the population. Uh, things are going well. The pandemic hits. And then one the Tigrayan is at fault for some of the mismanagement, the one Tigrayan being uh, the head of the WHO. Uh, and then you have um, uh, this guerrilla starting a, a, a small igloo there, and uh, then that igloo grows bigger and becomes a very big igloo, <laughs> and it becomes a civil war, while you also have the pandemic, and you also have some other uh, endemic mm. diseases that come on top of the pandemic, which are uh, and those are also significantly worse than this particular fluffy cough. Uh, I'm thinking here of yellow fever, for instance, right, which is endemic in Ethiopia and uh, creates uh, very serious and troublesome uh, outbreaks. So you have that situation. And then on top of that, you have a bigger and bigger and bigger igloo by TPLF, who used to be your partners, but now suddenly because potato, they want something else. What are you going to do? And then, and then, of course, they also start massacring some civilians, and especially um, uh, Amharic-speaking civilians, so, you know, uh, which are minorities in Tigray, but majority almost everywhere else mm. in Ethiopia. What are you going to do? Well, it's, it's obviously that you start rolling all the tags upon them. Yeah, I mean, you know... <laughs> there, there, there's... It, mm. We can say that maybe he could have wait a, waited a little bit longer, maybe negotiate a little bit longer, but at the end of the day, it was leading up to the situation where the tanks would have to roll in. I'm not sure that negotiations would have been a thing because, to, the, because, because getting back to the point, the, you are negotiating with, with Marxist Leninists who used to who used to be in power, and uh, and I don't exactly blame him if. Uh, he abides by the George Bush School of Foreign Policy. We don't negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> yeah, um, except in this case, they're not foreigners. But uh, mm. but the thing is that it's very hard to condemn the current prime minister for for this particular course of action. Definitely, there will be a time and a place to condemn some of the management of the war. Mm. Uh, 
because as we discussed a month and a half ago in the 12th episode, there were definitely some fuck-ups on the federal government side as well in terms of uh, how to avoid unnecessary damages to the civil civilian population while rooting out the um, leadership of the TPLF. And yeah, because, because that's what happens in war. war um, in, in war, as much as you try and how, regardless how disciplined you are, fuck-ups are bound to happen. It, yes. it, hap it happened even, even in the case of the US when it went into Iraq. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah no, uh, fuck-ups are inevitable. The question is how much fuck-ups are tolerable and that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a very um, complicated question. Yeah, how much of the fuck-up is tolerable at yes. an international level. Yeah, and it really does depend on when, where, what kind of it. Um, uh, who falls victim for it? Who's responsible? Who's responsible for it? It's a little mm. bit more complicated. Mm. Now, admittedly, Abby is in a himself in a different, in a complicated position, in being a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, <laughs> um, and mm. uh, kind of like uh, Sun Chi from uh, Myanmar, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like the same thing, you know, uh, leaders who had to. Uh, fight a civil war, uh, or in the case of uh, Osang Suu Kyi, um, uh, face a military coup d'état, uh, while while still being somewhat um, uh, uh, the darlings of the West. Well, Suu Kyi had uh, fallen out of grace since uh, she started mm. the, what do you call it, the, the Rohingya cleanup. <laughs> uh, so there's that. <clears throat> so it's, it's a very complicated business, and... Um, uh, it's one of those pieces of uh, one of those uh, ongoing events that are probably more important than the pandemic. But then again, the piece, the news is mm. busy with uh, <laughs> oh, someone else has coughed. Oh my goodness! Mm. Can you imagine the tragedy? Right? So someone else has coughed. There's another strain. Oh and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and by the way, the, and, the uh, flu uh, now has a different strain. Oh, who the fuck? <laughs> 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 right. Um, so yeah, um, the thing is that um, <clears throat> this, um, oh, the United Nations and the Rights Agency, they announced they're going to carry out a joint investigation. Oh, oh, ain't that <laughs> cute? Um, whoever trusts these people, the, the UN in particular, is bound to be pretty disappointed in life. Um, because uh, UN interventions in Africa, be them, oh, oh. <laughs> be them diplomatic, in this case diplomatic, right? Or be them military as peacekeeping forces, see the Rwanda mm. situation. They've always ended up badly, mm. right? Mm. And uh, I don't expect this one to be any better. I really don't. Uh, and the reason this uh, appears to be the case, and here I may sound like a leftist for a little, for a little while, one of the reasons is because, for some reason, the UN seems to be incapable of recruiting personnel that actually understands the territory on which it operates. Maybe this time they'll be better at it, strong mm. doubt. But generally, they send people who have no idea what they're, uh, what they're doing there. It's, it's also because there is not exactly an interest in providing long-term solutions because if they were to provide a long-term solution they will find themselves out of a job that's <laughs> no, true in, that's uh, true in in, in in pushing out papers and resolutions uh, yeah, and the, uh, their and, salary kind of depends on them not understanding as yeah. milton friedman would have put and, it. And, at, and at one and at one point being uh, being one being one of the contributors to the to the situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Going back to the Rwanda example you provided earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, without the UN, I mean, you know, the one of the heroes uh, um, and hailed for um, saving a, a lot of people was a Canadian soldier who uh, had his orders revoked and ordered to leave the country. Mm. He chose not to, I keep on forgetting his name, but he chose not to and used his UN badge to intimidate both factions that were killing each other and mm -hmm. uh, uh, saved uh, roughly a million people uh, from being killed of, of both ethnicities uh, by hiding them in stadiums and things like that and then keep, kept, on, kept on marching. Imagine mm -hmm. marching a million people through the woods. Now that's complicated, right? mm -hmm. logistically speaking. Uh, 
now, of course, he wasn't the lone, but he was the headmaster of the operation and basically marched them out of the country and out of yeah, the... And, uh, and how much shit he got for that? <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, he was court-martialed. Oh, the, the guy got crucified. <laughs> yeah, he was court-martialed, uh, mm. right? And, um, and yeah, he was crucified. And it took many, many years after the when the phrase Rwandan genocide became a thing, uh, when he was finally rehabilitated and, well, slowly but surely, everyone had kind of had to apologize to the chap because, mm -hmm. well, it turns out he was right. But it took many years, and in the meantime, the UN would have, if he were to follow the wor the orders he had gotten from the UN, all of almost all of those one million people would have been dead, mm -hmm. right? So you know, the UN would have been a direct contributor <laughs> to a bigger death toll uh, than the one that was already recorded. I mean, Rwanda still hasn't recovered demographically to this day as a result of um, of that civil war. Uh, now, in this case, it's not going to be that bad because uh, it's a smaller region and it's in, it's in a bigger country. It's uh, very unlikely mm -hmm. to make a substantive impact on the long-term demographics of the country. But it's going to make a substantive income uh, impact sorry, on the, um, on the civilizational outlook of the country. Because those frictions will stay there. And um, in the end, I mean, you know, the TPLF wanted really, really badly to advanced the cause of a um, quasi-separatist Tigrayan movement and may end up having harmed the Tigrayan population in irreversible ways. Um, because you know, I, I'm trying to imagine, <coughs> let's say 2026, right? Five years from now. Uh, I don't think your average Tigrayan would be just as well regarded in the rest of Ethiopia as he was in April 2019. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. I really do hope I'm wrong. Not to mention that uh, TPLF has to some extent uh, worked in parallel against the interests of the po of the population in order to start this. Oh yeah, uh, for sure, for sure. In, in order to start this shit, this, this shit storm. So, yeah. so, so, they, so they, they're not they're not only losing the the, the war in Issa, but they're also losing the long term support mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because 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 hang on, we weren't exactly that bad, but you. But you, but you decided to to start engagements uh, with the fed with the federal state, and that makes us look bad. And uh, that makes us look bad means that we're gonna be we're gonna be regarded as lesser people for quite a few years from now. On. Uh, usually, yeah, a gen yeah. usually a generation, yeah, mm -hmm. until the wounds start healing. Now, time heals every heals everything, but it, you know, it, sometimes time may mean decade, decades, mm -hmm. and that's kind of terrible. Uh, and that's too bad because you know things were going pretty well for Ethiopia, and uh, now it's mm -hmm. a it's a, quite a major setback. Now, of course, it's not a, a tragedy necessarily in a civilizational sense. Ethiopia has been through a lot worse, and it's still mm -hmm. there. So you know, the, the, it, it shouldn't be over dramatized either. But it has to be acknowledged that it's a quite a major fuck up, and uh, um, I, I'm hoping that some of the TPLF leaders end up being. Uh, uh, you know, refugees in I don't know, Argentina or something, you know, but mm. as far away as possible from Ethiopia to avoid extradition. So, or, I, or so the, I can or, get or to interview could, some of them. Or, 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 they, or they could go to Italy. <laughs> Viva <la Duce. laughs> um, yeah, right. I, I don't think Italy would shelter them, though, uh, because, uh, well, the EU, the EU itself has a different interest there. Um, and I'm not sure Italy would shelter them. But I'm sure there will be places that mm. would. Uh, I'm hoping that a few of them get to that route so I get to interview some of them. Uh, I'm just saying. <laughs> this is my selfish interest talking here. All right. Uh, moving uh, forward to very far east. Um, foreign policy. Japan mulls closing another door to refugees. Japan granted asylum to less than 1% of refugees and asylum seekers who applied in 2019, despite having the third largest economy in the world. That's, that matters how exactly. <laughs> G Germany, which has a similar GDP, took around 53% uh, of refugees in the same year. Japan needs the labor and population growth that immigrants could offer. With an aging population and a rapidly decreasing workforce, classrooms in some rural parts of the country are empty and many farms are deserted. Migration to Japan is rising, particularly from Southeast Asia 
Asian countries battered by the climate crisis, but it still shuts its doors to those in need. Geographic isolation and hefty donations to the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Refugees have long allowed Japan to evade international criticism for its restrictive immigration laws. It now faces mounting pressures from human rights organizations to offer refuge to more asylum seekers and refugees, but instead, the Japanese parliament is considering new legislation to make its strict policies even stricter, based in red pill Nippon. <laughs> uh, last year, the Ministry for Justice uh, formed a subcommittee to address an increase in people seeking asylum and migrants in detention in Japan. The move followed increased attention on its immigration detention facilities, including after a Nigerian migrant died while on hunger strike at the center in Nagasaki in 2019. Oh, you're going on hunger strike? Great! <laughs> um, the subcommittee proposed um, an amendment to current immigration law that would abolish the rights of asylum seekers to reapply for a refugee status and criminalize those who refuse their deportation orders. That's on, common on, sense. On February, yeah, that's very basic common sense. <laughs> on February 19, Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga's cabinet approved the revisions uh, to the Immigration Control and Refugee Recognition Act, and uh, the conservative majority is expected to pass it. The National Diet still has to vote on the amendment, uh, leaving time for changes to be made before the summer recess. The opposition hopes to use this opportunity to push for modifications, but doing so requires the support of a Japanese public unaccustomed to grassroots advocacy for political change. Uh, currently, the amendment would remove an existing provision that suspends a deportation order while an asylum seeker appeals for decision or reapplies for recognition. Rejected applicants who refuse a deportation order would be transferred into a criminal system. With the law's revisions, asylum seekers could apply only twice before receiving a deportation order with penalties imposed upon refusal. Finally, the new amendment does not add a limit to the indefinite period of detention for asylum seekers who have been issued deportation orders despite condemnation from the United Nations and from human rights groups. Remember what we told, spoke about the United Nations slightly earlier. <laughs> uh, lawyers and groups assisting asylum seekers in the repeal or reapplication process would be considered accomplices in crime, uh -oh. according to an unofficial <laughs> group of Japanese immigration lawyers that spoke out against the state the changes in a statement to foreign policy. This would in effect criminalize refugees for their otherwise lawful execution of their rights to apply for refugee asylum. It would criminalize their effort to avoid being returned to the side uh, of deadly persecution, the statement said. Despite signing on to the 1951 Refugee Convention, Japan had little immigration infrastructure of its own until the current law passed in 2018. Then Prime Minister Shinzo Abe introduced the act to accept more foreign workers to fill the gaps of the aging workforce, but it failed to shift the government's approach towards refugees and asylum seekers. Although Japan earned some credit for liberalizing, liberalizing its policies, it actually tightened rules for refugees and asylum seekers, including cutting the rights uh, of asylum seekers to work while their applications are under consideration. This one is really a portion that I really don't understand, and it exists in most of Europe as well, namely that in the process of uh, whether uh, refugees accept or not, mm. forbid them from working. This is just absolute lunacy. I really don't understand. It exists in almost all countries of Europe, including our mm. own. Uh, I really don't understand. No, no, no. Quite the opposite. Let them work. Let them earn their living and then deport them when they lose their application and whatnot. Anyway, uh, Chie Komai, an immigration lawyer in Japan, said the proposed uh, tightening of the law for those issued deportation orders is especially devastating because Japan's refugee recognition system is already so restrictive. The point is that in Japan, the refugee recognition rate is just under 0.5%. She said the children of immigrants born and raised in Japan who haven't been granted residency, spouses of Japanese nationals uh, and people who have lived in Japan for decades could also be subject to the new law. That's standard for Japan, actually. Mm. Uh, some provisions in the amendment leave much to the discretion of immigration authorities. Sounds like Romania. Mm. <laughs> One mechanism allows certain detainees to be released if they can pay up to 3 million yen or about $28,000. Eligibility is determined by the authorities. That's not a lot of money by uh, Japan standards, sorry. Mm -hmm. Another part of the legislation aims to protect the so-called quasi-refugees or people who don't meet the government standards for asylum but cannot return to their home countries for safety concerns. 
Many members of the opposition uh, have come out against the amendment and Japan's refugee policy more generally. To make it very simple, it's the wrong direction, says uh, Michihiro Ishibashi of the Constitutional Democracy Party. They are supposed to improve the immigration policy or refugee recognition schemes in Japan, but on the contrary, they're trying to make it tougher. I'm personally very much ashamed that our refugee uh, recognition is only 0.4%, uh, 20 to 30 people each year. We really need to take more responsibility for this. Yeah, you can make 15. <laughs> the death of the Nigerian asylum seeker in Nagasaki in 19 increased attention on Japan's immigration detention system. Uh, the Immigration Control and Refugee Recognition Act does not define detainment, which means there are no parameters about how long individuals can be detained or how they are treated. Well, this one they have a point. This should yeah. be there should be a limit on that. In a de detailed brief published last September, the UN Human Rights uh, Council's Working Group on Arbitrary Detention condemned Japan for violating international human rights law by detaining foreigners for an indefinite period of time after denying their asylum claims and issuing deportation orders. That's fair. That's fair. The UN report detailed uh, the experiences of Denise Yengin, a Kurdish man, uh, uh, and uh, Heydar Safari Diman, an Iranian man. Both men participated in long-term hunger strikes during their five and four and a half year detentions, respectively. That's too much. According to the brief, uh, Diman's detention had a serious psychological impact on him and his hunger strike caused a life-threatening condition. Yengin has uh, filed a lawsuit against the Japanese government, alleging that immigration officers used excessive force against him in 2019. A video released in January 2020 shows several immigration personnel beating up Yengin. The Immigration Bureau acknowledged misconduct but denied any illegal activity. That sounds like so much Japan. Ishibashi mm -hmm. and other members of the opposition submitted the Refugee Protection Bill in February that urged the government to create a framework for refugee recognition that meets international standards uh, and uh, advocates for a more transparent system of granting asylum. While the opposition bill ha now has no chance of passing, the group still hopes to garner public support for modifying or even withdrawing the government's amendment. If we bring up more public awareness, then that can affect more proper changes to the government bill, Ishibashi said, strong doubt. Uh, public support for political issues in Japan can be hard to achieve, especially on immigration. Japan's isolated and homogeneous history keeps most issues of diversity and inclusivity out of public debate, as it should be. Without significant immigration, Japan has avoided some of the open clashes seen in Western society, but racism still goes unaddressed, of course. Discrimination against Korean residents in particular has a long history in Japan. Although activism is growing and many Japanese seem open to an increase in asylum seekers, the public is still unlikely to engage in grass roots movements to change government policy. With limited government support for refugees, smaller organizations are currently filling the gaps. The Japan Association for Refugees, a nonprofit based in Tokyo, supports thousands of immigrants each year, offering shelter, uh, case management, social counseling, medical and psychological care, language support, funding, and lawyers. Their Alternatives to Detention program works in tandem with the government to assist a select number of asylum seekers. I see nothing wrong with that. But the organization is limited in how many people it is able to help, which is good. According to Harry uh, Ishikawa, the chair of the board, the government's selection of asylum seekers eligible for the program appears random, it probably is, and even those who do receive services don't always get refugee status. Nothing wrong with that. Between 2011 and 2019, the program assisted just 36 people with six granted status, uh, he said. When the bill inevitably passes, the changes to Japan's immigration law might fade into the background, but it could trigger even stronger international and local backlash, strong doubt. Japan doesn't often attract the attention of human rights groups, suggesting the issue won't just be pushed aside. We have to do more, of course we have to win, because if we lose this fight it means that the Japanese society just keeps on closing the doors, and yes it will keep on closing the doors. The cabinet approval of the new amendment shows that Japan remains on the path of isolationism and homogeneity, but as migration keeps uh, rising, the Japan's empty classrooms and deserted farms are likely to provoke more questions about why exactly those doors uh, remain closed. All right, this well, is a spicy the, topic. Uh, um, go ahead. This is a very complicated one, but the the issue itself is not just on the immigration front when it's uh, when it's about legislation, but it's e but it's even on the domestic policy front uh, mm -hmm. that you that you get the yeah abusive treatment by the police, and it, and this does this, this doesn't even cover just people who see refugee status in Japan, it also happened to foreigners to be, and, and this is just how the law is, and okay, mm. it's, not a, it's not exactly the, the, the right law, but, so, but for now it is what it is. Uh, it's been happening uh, in the case of foreigners to do something incorrectly, and uh, 
attract the attention of the, of the, of the Japanese police and be detained for 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 some for some at least a month in some cases mm. without being without being exactly explained there's, there's no such thing as due process in Japan yes and uh, that that's the most significant problem which which would actually at least at least generate a pathway if they really want to solve this uh, immigration law approach uh, first of all Yes, I mean, uh, there are a lot of uh, dysfunctionalities, or at least mm. from our perspective, dysfunctionalities. From their perspective, everything's fine. I, I, I haven't received a, co a concrete answer as to why basic things such as due process doesn't work, or at least, or at least pro be provided a concrete explanation as to, what, as, to, as to what you've done wrong and why your internet, and at least have some limits on internment. Because, yeah, for, 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 for real, being, being detained for four and a half years or five years in... Mm, because you're a, because you're an asylum seeker, that isn't exactly right. No, that's definitely not kosher, and that's mm. uh, one issue where definitely the UN has a point. Uh, because I mean, seriously, if you don't want to uh, receive them, great, deport them or let mm. them go. But you know, detaining them for five years, how's that helping the Japanese society? You're spending a lot of shekels with that individual mm -hmm. for no reason. If you don't intend to let them stay in the country, then don't let them stay in the country. That's okay. Right? It's mm -hmm. your right as a sovereign nation not to let them stay in the country. But yes, uh, close to indefinite or, def or random um, detainment, that's definitely not kosher. Now, I suppose, uh, as it pertains to the due process, uh, what I've noticed, and I've, I haven't spent enough time in Japan to fully grasp this, but so it's a, only a partial understanding that I have, but it's, uh, it's good enough uh, at least to, you know where to read further. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. For the most part, and this hasn't changed in the last 100 years in the least bit, it's still true today. It's increasingly, it's now only starting to slowly change, but any significant change will be visible 50 years from now, not anytime sooner. For the most part, because close to 100% of the inhabitants of Japan, whether they're foreigners or natives, doesn't matter, they're all fully accustomed with the customs of the Japanese society, the possibility of, a, of an integrated individual getting on the wrong side of the Japanese police on anything less than murder, now murder is a different issue, right? mm -hmm. but anything less than you know, administ administrative crimes, mm -hmm. has consistently been roughly zero. And even when that happened, everyone knew exactly what the course of action is. So as a result, the, the uh, habit, and yes, the legal obligation of the police and of um, bureaucrats to have to explain what the charges are, what is the procedure, how, what to do to get out of that particular mess, uh, well, where do you pay the fine if there is the case or whatever. Mm -hmm. That reflex just hasn't developed in the first place. It just doesn't yeah. exist. And it's... Um, from our perspective as yeah well Europeans that's a dysfunctionality but they don't see it that way mm -hmm. why because more than 99% of the inhabitants they're like oh but it's easy the procedure is that and we're like yeah but how do you know mm -hmm. that well you yeah. know well we don't sorry mm -hmm. <laughs> see, that's the issue right uh, and the, the, the reason I even know this kind of thing is because uh, well uh, of course I broke a few administrative rules while I'm in Japan uh, and I'm like okay what happens if I get caught and uh, you know police shows up what happens well it's a fine of uh, whatever thousands of yen or tens of thousands of yen and I'm like okay how is how does that work well, you then have to go to that office and that office and that office and you pay the, this fee there and the, the whole amount there and then from there you get a paper that says... Uh, you, you yeah, this, this is some sort of administrative mysticism mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where, 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 okay, uh, not, not a problem, the, the indigenous population understands the procedures and the fines and the laws, but at least make them available for any, for, for any other person uh, to at least be informed. Mm -hmm. of it. Yeah, and it's very difficult to find information about uh, concrete 
procedures on anything really oh, from, no yeah <laughs> from uh, paying a fine for you know uh, riding the bus without a ticket or paying a fine for i don't know throwing garbage where you shouldn't have thrown it or you know th things like you know, small petty administrative crimes that any normal human commits at least once in a lifetime right mm -hmm. because it's impossible not to if you go in a foreign country you cannot know all the rules as you land it doesn't matter what country it is, whether we're talking mm -hmm. Central African Republic or Japan or Germany. It doesn't matter at all, right? Uh, but at least in Germany, if I commit an administrative crime, it's very easy to find out what the procedure is to make things right, either to pay the fine mm -hmm. or some reparations or whatever, whatever the um, penalty may be or may not be uh, in case you get caught and in case you get sanctioned for it. That's not the case in Japan. It just isn't. And uh, it's very easy, especially for quote-unquote asylum seekers who tend to come not from Europe, but f yeah, from from from, poor... from vastly different countries in, ter yeah. in terms of uh, in, ter in terms of mentality, culture, mm -hmm. particularly <laughs> particularly compared to Japanese culture, which yes. is which, which, which could be which would be in most cases the complete opposite. Yes, I mean at, at least to. when you're coming from Europe to Japan. Basically, mm. some of the worst excesses of Europe are even more in excess, further in excess in Japan. But at least you mm. know where they're coming from, sort of, especially in, mm. in terms of public order, public cleanliness, things like that. You know, they do exist in Europe as well, but they're just on a whole different level in Japan, mm. right? Yeah. Far more extreme than in Europe. But at least you understand the logic of it. Mm. And it's slightly easier to adapt to it. But imagine coming from rural Nigeria. It's just not. Oh it it just doesn't come up. It, it's mm -hmm. it's not the fault of the asylum seeker. It's not the fault of your average Japanese person. But it is the fault of the Japanese state that it doesn't make its own yeah, rules it, it, clear. Yeah, it does. It doesn't clarify mm, just just as we take it for granted. Uh, what uh, what what you should do what you shouldn't do. What are the penalties if you don't if you don't do as we say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm not trying to defend asylum seekers here, um, but I am trying to say that there is a point to be made about the clarity of the Japanese laws. And, if, and again, e even this article acknowledges, although silently, right, I mean, the activists there, uh, you know, the most prolific ones are, you know, this particular NGO, where it is, the, the JAR. Yeah. yeah, but they, that's what, what, what do they do, right? Uh, shelter, case management, so, you know, basically learn what the rules are social mm -hmm. counseling which is basically learn what the social rules are because mm -hmm. nobody tells you what they are medical and psychological care because they all go full insane when they learn when they start learning what the rules are language support okay that makes sense funding and lawyers okay those make sense as well but you, mm -hmm. know, you don't need that many uh, things you know especially social counseling and a lot of psychological care uh if you come to well germany right mm -hmm. or france or the United States or Mexico for that matter. In every one of these countries it's easy to find out at the very least what the rules are and maybe even figure out a way on how to work around them mm. if, they, if that is the case. Not in Japan. But, yeah. these, uh, but these NGOs, these activists that are homegrown, right, uh, they also start from the wrong premise. Instead of fixing what is indeed wrong mm -hmm. with the Japanese way of doing things, uh, they go uh, with the Western narrative, oh we just should be having more immigrants well that's not the issue at least not now maybe it is that maybe that will be the issue several years from now i don't know i don't think so but maybe it will be but first of all how about fixing the basics you know things where indeed the japanese institutional structure what's the term falls short yeah yeah uh, going to a great length here to to to, to justify the rationale in favor of the Japanese state. Uh, they kind of start from the premise that uh, that if you if if you come to Japan or or based on the vast majority of the population, which tends to be Japanese, in about ninety nine percent of the cases, uh, you wouldn't have to explain these things. Mm -hmm. So so from you can't exactly blame them for. Uh, and from for not being exactly transparent mm. because mm. they all because if if say you are if say you are a foreigner um, it will be reasonable to uh, to at least be to at least inform yourself from another japanese person mm. of the of these aspects 
mm-hmm. but uh, but but still just for transparency sake in order to make things fair for everybody at least uh, at least make the rules clear for everybody and the procedures mm. just, just so you don't end up in these uh, in, in, in these kerfuffles, particularly with the UN, which is a pathetic organization to, <laughs> to have kerfuffles with. <laughs> yes. And, um, and, and again, I'm not even saying that, you know, there should be things like, you know, uh, free uh, judicial counseling or what. No, no, no. Just write down the goddamn rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Um, they can only be, they, they can even be in Japanese only. You don't even have to translate them, but have a place where we can consult them. Mm-hmm. We can use the translate uh, the software or maybe learn some Japanese if we're going to live there. Uh, but at the very least, uh, make them try. And it's very difficult. Oftentimes, sure, some cities in particular have taken up this effort for themselves. And you can find it on the uh, town hall. Sometimes on the prefecture's website, but it depends on the prefecture. It depends mm-hmm. on the issue. It's a, it's a mishmash. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's a nebulous system, so yes. to speak. <laughs> yes. And um, and th- those are things w- that can be improved, and they don't require. That's very important uh, from a Japanese perspective. They don't require a radical reform, mm-hmm. because what these people are proposing. Oh no, the government should drop that yeah. amendment, and we should o- have an no, entire the... immigration overhaul, so we can have more immigrants. No, that's a radical reform. It's never going to be po- well, not never, mm-hmm. but it's not going to be popular with the Japanese public mm-hmm. anytime soon. And all quite the contrary is going to yeah, is going you're going to piss them off harder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to piss them off harder. Then you're going to lose the very, the very small support base that you already that you already got. Yes. Particularly because, as far as I remember, they use, even now in the Japanese press, it's mentioned there was, there was at one point, I think in 2019 or 2018, there was a case of uh, 36 Turks, if I reckon, that were granted asylum. And half of them ended up in jail mm-hmm. in less than a year, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that one is since uh, since the Japanese press is still is still writing on mm-hmm. that that scenario. You're not sh- shilling for uh, immigration overhaul. It's uh, it's going exactly pissing against the wind. Uh-huh. <laughs> you just mm-hmm. you just end up wetting yourself. <laughs> yes. Uh, in addition to that, one also has to remember that well. Uh, foreign policy here puts it in a very uh, kind terms like oh you know uh, grassroots support for changing governmental policies not a thing is not common in Japan well that's a nice way of putting it a less nice but closer to the truth way of putting it Japan is one of those countries where the political class the elite is more liberal uh, than its population, than its population right? mm-hmm. the population is outright fascist it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, same thing in Saudi Arabia, by the way. And the elite is slightly less so. The elite is more mm-hmm. wise. Right? Yeah, and, and, and not to mention that uh, the, 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 there's also the societal aspect that has to be taken into consideration that very, very few from the general population of Japan um, seek to end up uh, Seeking some form of political office or something more significant than being uh, a community leader or or, Maybe or, 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 to- or tops, so somewhere in the somewhere in the prefecture, yeah, some sort of governorship. Mm. Go, go 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 going past that. It's it's pretty much some sort. It's pretty much a form of neo neo feudalism, uh, yeah, it, it which is. has been going on in Japan for a long time. Yeah, I mean the circle uh, to get into the neo feudal elite is open. I mean anyone can get in, but it's very rare for people even to try. Yeah, be- be- because the vast majority of people are not interested in such yeah. a thing, and nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I don't know if it's wrong or not. What I'm saying is that it is what it is. And as long mm-hmm. as things are that way, um, you know, you have to work within the framework that you're given. Now, mm-hmm. I'm sure uh, a lot of uh, young activists in Japan, they are, um, uh, they're dreaming about their revolution. But Japan is not the place to, to stage revolutions. You know, it's not a mm-hmm. revolutionary country. No, no. Never has been. Never uh, will be. I don't know if never will, you know, never mm. say never, you know. I don't know if I know, will. I know never say never, but, um, but yeah. we, l- l- let's remember what happened with, oh man, I forget that guy's name, the, guy, the, 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 the communist guy that got fucking impaled on the stage. And yeah, the, and yeah, yeah. And there's a famous picture. Yes. That's what happens when you try to do a revolution in Japan, particularly the, particularly the Marxist sort of revolution, the far left type. Yeah, and they still, <laughs> they, they still have such thing called the death penalty in Japan, and they're still mm-hmm. using it. Uh, 
Um, and uh, it's not a joke. I mean, you know, th that's how much they like revolutionaries. They yeah. just don't. Um, now, I happen to agree with that kind of mentality. You may happen to disagree, but that's okay. What is important is that one should not attempt to, um, not make too many attempts at revolution in Japan. Uh, if you mm. want to change something, work within the system. The system does allow change. Mm. I mean, Japan has changed yeah, it's, quite it's, a lot. It's, it's, not, it's not a closed system or, no, it's not. or, um, or it has a totalitarian like Saudi Arabia no, is. No, of course not. But it, but it has its own methods and its own checks and balances and its own mm. way of changing things. And it's quite weird that I have to explain that to Japanese revolutionaries over there. Guys, mm. seriously, it's not that complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, foreign policy doesn't even acknowledge half of that. And uh, basically, the article is written in a hysterical way. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, the Japanese don't want immigrants, man. Well, yeah, sure, they don't want immigrants, but it, is it a universal position? No. Uh, you know, they, basically, what the uh, previous administration, the Shinzo Abe administration, what they did was expand the way of getting in so you can work there and make money mm -hmm. and help the uh, labor force, uh, la labor market in Japan but at the same time restrict even further the paths for freeloaders yeah because because I don't know because it's a bad thing <laughs> because the japanese aren't stupid they they've seen and they mentioned the, okay not in the not that much in the in in the english new uh, in the english media in from japan but in the japanese media uh, they, they, they mentioned what things that happened that the media hasn't spoken about back in the migration crisis mm -hmm. of 2015-2017 in Germany, for example. Yes. The, let's remember Köln, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> New Year's Eve. <laughs> yes. Uh, these things, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, especially during between 15 and 17, uh, the Japanese media spoke at length about the issues mm -hmm. of mass immigration happening here in Europe. Uh, and they spoke roughly similarly to the way we spoke on the sofa mm -hmm. at the time yeah. roll back on this channel see how i was speaking in uh, 15 16 17 about kind of like that the japanese media spoke as well mm -hmm. uh yeah sure it, it, it didn't call the governments a bunch a bunch of neo-bolshevists and you know it, it didn't go that far but mm -hmm. uh, but generally laid out the mm -hmm. facts in a very similar manner that we did yeah. and um and I, I like europe in japan that wasn't considered far right it was considered as basic common sense well, because yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because uh, because the, this is also another societal aspect uh, of Japan that that's one of the very few things that I that I wish to be brought back in the in the Western society. There is the concept of what harmony, but there is also har harmony in discourse. Uh, mm, it's uh, e and, and and even the even the Japanese vloggers uh, that uh, have visited U.S. or spent time. In, uh, in in the West, be it North America or Europe, have have, have mentioned this that uh, you can you can approach in when to, when speaking in the Japanese society of things like uh, abortion, immigration, nationality, a lot a, a lot of subjects that uh, that have increasingly become uh, absolutely haram to talk about uh, in, Here. in the in, in the Western right. society. Right. Right, uh, and this is this is true, by the way, about the Chinese as well, uh, and South no, Koreans. But, China, but, but the Chinese, Chinese are brutally Ch honest. Ch Ch Chinese are brutally honest, but for completely other reasons. That's so. true, but the, the it, it is true. I mean, uh, uh, in China, I remember there was a a blog, a vlog, whatever, uh, of uh, a collective vlog, essentially, run by several Americans, and some of them had spent a lot of time in China and were fluent in Chinese and whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, and one of them was very was a very funny guy. He was a Jewish Chinese guy, and uh, anyway, uh, and they were mentioning this aspect that when uh, a few former colleagues of them, uh, you know, former classmates from the university, they took them over to a quick trip to China, mm -hmm. and one of their uh, colleagues was female, and slightly on the fat side, and uh, you know, random Chinese people were like you should be losing some weight. You're just way too fat. <laughs> which by U.S. standards is absolutely haram, <laughs> whereas in China, it, uh, it, that, that, that particular Chinese person didn't even intend to offend. Mm. It was just noticing the facts. Yeah, but the, but <laughs> but, uh, the, but that sort of uh, that sort of communication is not something uh, just in China, but all of yes, that's all, what, all, all, all of East Asia. Yes, that's the, what I'm trying to say. The, Same thing in Japan. Does, does lack this filter? Okay, J J Japan. Japan is more polite. Uh, yeah. 
which, which is sort of an exception, but uh, but uh, but other than that, uh, yeah, in Japan they won't say get the hell out of here, you fat so, but they will say have you tried losing some weight? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of it's not healthy. <laughs> they're for gonna you. bring in the, 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 they're, they're gonna say the same thing, but yeah, but but in a more covert way, they're gonna give you something like uh, nutritional plans, this weight loss, yeah. this weight loss medicine or stuff, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. 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 There you go. Uh, and uh, w when you're discussing politics with your, uh, oh, yeah. with random Japanese mm -hmm. people, no matter what the topic is, they'll reply if they have an opinion about it. They'll either say, mm -hmm. I don't know, and some of them don't know because, again, a lot of Japanese people mm -hmm. don't follow politics at all. Mm -hmm. But those who do, uh, they will not be having any sort of politically correct filter or um, what do you call it corridor or, of opinion like it was in Sweden or uh, or self censorship or self censorship no mm -hmm. no they, they, they'll just say it outright whether they're commies and yes there are commies in Japan uh, or uh, yes deep uh, deep committed racists or liberals or conservatives or whatever mm -hmm. uh, they'll have no qualms about letting you know about it especially if you ask the first if you are the first to ask well you asked here's my opinion. You don't mm -hmm. like it, tough shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and that's something that um, mm, terrifies Western activists in particular when they go there. Uh, especially mm -hmm. when they see, you know, I, I don't think I have it anymore. I, I had downloaded a clip from Japan many years ago, many years ago, two years, three years and a half ago. Uh, there was a, a protest, like 5,000 people showed up in the downtown Kyoto. Uh, a protest against white people. Oh yeah, I remember that one. The way to Pigogo. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. A protest against white people. And it was a militant racist protest, mm, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, in the Japanese press it was like, oh, oh yeah, and those people protested against white people. And uh, 20 kilometers da uh, down the street uh, there was another protest against black people. And uh, there was a protest against Muslims. And, you know, I mean, it was considered like, yeah. Yeah, of course, mm. that thing's happened too. <laughs> it was without any sort of qualms or any sort of outrage of any kind. It, they were treated roughly equal. Basically, yeah, some racists mm. got in the street to protest. That's it. Yeah, uh, exactly. No judgment, no uh, no slant, no, you know? Mm. Um, no, 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 no vehement uh, condemnation condem or praise. Con con condemnation uh, or, to praise. or praise. Yeah. Or praise, right? I mean, the, the press didn't praise any of those. I mean, uh, mm. it, at, at the same day, there was a protest against white people, a protest against black people, and a protest against Muslims. <laughs> none of these three were praised in the media, but none of them got condemned either. Mm -hmm. They were just presented as, you know, news. Oh, yeah, uh, mm. some racists got into the streets. The police took care for them not to meet each other, and that would be pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> One huge xenophobic rally. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, um, uh, it, it doesn't matter what you believe about this, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing or a harmonious or I don't care. The point is that that is the situation you're operating in. Right? Mm. This is the society you're operating in. Convincing those people to accept more immigration is possible. But not like this. Not like that. No. <laughs> it's kind of hysterical approach. Ah, uh, you're gonna get what you want. R roughly never, mm. right? Or roughly 50 years from now, maybe. Um, and this kind of thing of oh, but you know, there's deserted farms and whatnot, uh, guys. That, that, Japan that, that's is not a, a problem exactly in terms of. Uh, Japan is a highly urban society, mm. right? Deserted farms, they don't register on the radar of most of the population. Mm. They don't. So unless all farms get deserted, that would register on their radar. But that's definitely not the case, of course. Uh, oh, some rural schools have empty classrooms. Okay, so? So we, we got... Uh, no, we got we, a lot of empty classrooms we, in Oregon. We got, we got a lot of empty classrooms and not... Uh, and, and okay, sometimes it's, the, it's indeed the case that uh, the, those, those schools are in villages that no longer have any young people, let alone children. Mm -hmm. Or there are, or there are other, you know, there are other scenarios where, um, where, where there are kids, but kids have uh, other higher priorities than education. Like for example, not starving. Yeah. Or have been have been moved into schools in a different locality. That, that oh, also happens. That, or that one as well. Yeah. Uh, so you know, it, it's uh, uh, these kind. These are very weak arguments. Again, there are very weak arguments by Romania standards, let mm. alone by Japan standards. <laughs> They're just very yeah. weak. So yeah. Uh, and, you know, it would help if the international discourse about immigration to Japan would be adjusted 
to the Japanese context. You want to convince the Japanese elite to accept more immigrants? Fine. First of all, don't be stupid in public. That would be the first mm. rule. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Second like... rule, take a trip to Japan, spend two months there, start understanding what you're talking about, and then we can have a conversation about it. And it's terrible because this article comes from Foreign Policy, uh, an outlet that is slightly smarter than your average uh, outlet that talks about these things. And mm. even there, it's mostly Tumblr bullshit. Terrible. Mm. And that's one aspect that is depressing me over the long run. I mean, if we, if we can figure this one out on a sofa, then why can't well-funded outlets figure it out as well? It's terrible. Mm. We need, we need to need start shooting to get uh, at least consultancy for them. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't consult those people even for a lot of money, you know, because you know, I'm, I'm, I really don't want more immigration to Japan. I'm not a big fan of the Japanese society. Maybe let's make that clear. I don't like. The oh Japanese no, but society. no, no, but it's it's about it's about. I, I sold them the idea that we're gonna get more immigration to Japan. I'll say I'll say I'll say whatever they want to hear, but I'll do whatever I want to do. <laughs> But no, uh, and again, as this article makes it clear, you know they don't have the money to uh, to pay the consultant. I mean, it's uh, yeah. you know uh, you're also poor in addition to being stupid <laughs> in public. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, sticking to Japan uh, somewhat. Uh, Japan Times: China sends aircraft carrier strike group near Okinawa in message to the United States and Japan. Uh, they sent an aircraft carrier and five escort ships, including a destroyer, likened to the U.S. Navy's uh, Aegis-class vessels, through the Miyako Strait near Okinawa over the weekend in a signal of its growing ability to counter American and Japanese military power further from its shores. <coughs> Japan's mm. Defense Ministry announced late Sunday that the Lion. Liaoning carrier, sorry, the five and five other warships were spotted Saturday sailing through international waters in the narrow passageway that separates Okinawa's main island and Miyako Island. The vessels did not enter Japanese waters or its contiguous zone. The sailing of the Liaoning, China's first aircraft carrier, uh, with what appeared to be a strike group, was the first time it has been spotted since uh, making a round trip passage through the area in April last year. So it's a scheduled exercise in shore force, right? Among the six vessels uh, was the Chinese Navy's uh, powerful Type uh, 055 Ren Hai classes uh, guided missile destroyer, uh, which was first deployed in January last year. The destroyer is equipped with vertical launch missiles and observers uh, say it is capable of la launching long-range cruise missiles as well as anti-ship weapons. Uh, allow me to be a little <laughs> bit in doubt about that. <clears throat> A statement released by the Defense Ministry uh, said the six ships had been uh, detected about 470 kilometers southwest of Nagasaki Prefecture's Donjo Islets at around 8 a.m. local time, Saturday before making their way through the Miyako Strait. The Joint Staff said in a separate statement that a Chinese Y-9 military transport plane had also made a round-trip flight over the strait on Sunday, prompting Japan to scramble fighter jets in response. China has sent the Liaoning uh, uh, through the strategic choke point just five times since the carrier was commissioned in 2012. Experts uh, said the move highlighted the Chinese military's ability to punch through the so-called First Island Chain, uh, a chain of Pacific islands stretching from the Kurils uh, to the Ryukyus uh, to Taiwan, the Philippines and Indonesia. That stretch, coupled with the so-called Second Island Chain that consists of Japan's home islands and stretches to Guam and the islands of Micronesia, is uh, seen by some in Beijing as a natural barrier that constrains the country and its military. China has effectively regularized its military training in the area between the two chains and experts say that Beijing is using moves like uh, the weekend sailing to demonstrate that China's seaward advances won't be contained within the chains. Yeah, that's a little bit more complicated <laughs> than that. But more importantly, perhaps it's the, is the move's uh, significance in terms of China's evolving strategy to counter US and potentially Japan in any clash in the area. An area that includes both Taiwan and disputed South China Sea, home to sea uh, lanes critical to Japan's economic well-being. China, which claims Taiwan as, as its own territory, has boosted uh, military activity near the self-ruled island in recent months, including the dispatch of 20 warplanes near the country last, uh, uh, late last month. On Sunday, Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga emphasized the significance of Japan and the United States working closely to defuse soaring tensions over Taiwan, and the issue is expected to be at the top agenda when he meets U.S 
US President Joe Biden next week. The ability to fight uh, an incoming uh, American military intervention in the Philippine Sea in particular is seen as critical to securing Beijing's objectives within the first island chain, be it South China Sea or Taiwan, says Colin Koch, a research fellow at, and maritime security expert at uh, South Rajatnam School of International Studies in Singapore. Koch said that while Beijing may now be more confident in its military capabilities in its near seas is different story eastward for the first island chain where there is a significant reduction in its access to land-based support from the mainland. Oh, so logistics is a bitch. Uh, <laughs> so it's now trying to attain the ability to carry out car uh, carrier strike group operations in this area so as to adequately deal with American naval power, which is itself centered around carrier capabilities. Therefore, this uh, Liaoning transit uh, through the Miyako Strait is what is clearly seen as a carrier strike group formation is more than just a transit, he said. Right. Um, no. <laughs> so, um, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, You're more autistic than I am <laughs> on, on these issues. Thank you, I feel honored. <laughs> well, first, mandatory reminder, what this uh, Liaoning uh, carrier is. It's, a, it, it's, a, it's a first a Soviet aircraft carrier built sometime in the early 1980s, mm -hmm. which, uh, which for the Russian Navy was so expensive to maintain that they currently have uh, just one functioning, as far as I remember, Almir Kuznetsov, mm -hmm. which you may remember took a trip think two years or three years back uh, in the North Sea mm. and the exhaust from that <laughs> aircraft carrier could be seen from fucking space. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so basically the, the Russians had a good, the Russians hit a good deal, sold, uh, sold their other carrier from the same class uh, you know, to, to, the, to the Chinese and other Chinese are, f are in their first steps of experiencing uh, what are bluish water operations like. Mm. So this uh, this one with the carrier strike strike group, we, yeah, it is some advancement from the older doctrine, but still way way too insufficient because mm, in order to run carrier strike group operations, you need something very important, which is exactly the the, cap the capacity to exert air superiority, which Japan can do that through the U.S. or even by themselves, which the U.S. can do it by themselves without a doubt. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and if shit hits the fan, even Taiwan could do that uh, through the support of allies from the area. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, what they're, do what they're doing basically is just flexing their muscles and appearing to do, uh, appearing to act to advance in their doctrine and functionality and, and strategy. But not exactly that, not exactly as much as they, uh, as they want to try to convince uh, countries around them, even, I'm, I'm pretty sure there are at least a few military experts in Beijing that could, that, that really, that really think that if, uh, if the push comes to shove and if, if they try to pierce the mountain chain, uh, not exactly, the island, the island chain, which is, let's remember, the one from the, the one from the North Pacific is in part controlled by Russia and another part controlled by Japan. By Japan yeah. <laughs> then you then then further further forward you got uh, you, you got the U.S. territorial islands. Yes. Uh, if I may speculate, has anyone um, checked? I don't know if it's the case, but I would be very much surprised to learn that it is not the case. Has anyone checked whether there is a maybe a small? Uh, a <laughs> vessel around the aircraft care for a carrier or a helicopter or a slower plane airplane no not not a military one tasked with um, uh, a video camera <laughs> because I'm pretty sure that uh, at least some of these uh, walk arounds yeah, are for propaganda yeah, purposes exactly. meant internally Mm -hmm. Not externally. They're not meant to convince Japan. They're not meant to convince the United States or uh, or Indonesia or the Philippines or whatever. No, no, no. They're meant to convince the uh, 
portions of the Chinese population. Oh, but we, we, whether or not, if you look, if you look further up, it did mention that there was a cargo plane, uh, yeah, which, we, which was spotted in, in an area. But yeah, at, from from what it says, they, they will see it as a car, as a cargo plane, but they will they'll definitely not see that it was it was probably a film crew and some cameras attached to. The, I wouldn't be uh, attached surprised. To that plane. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if that mm. were the case. In fact, again, I would be very much surprised to learn that it wasn't the case, mm. um, because it wouldn't be the first time. Time, right. I mean, the Chinese yeah. military has been pulling these kinds of uh, Tough stunts, yeah. stunts <laughs> since Mao Zedong died. Right. So since late seventies, mm. early eighties, they started doing this, uh, and some of the some of their older military propaganda films now are available, um, if not on YouTube, definitely on Live Leak or other places that host videos. If you look hard enough, you can find them on the internet for free. Uh, of course, the newer ones are not yet available, but you know, if you have a friend in China, they can send it to you via WeChat. Um, and uh, you know, I, I never bothered to publish, but you know, I have some of them stored uh, from uh, from early 2010s, essentially. And I'll, I'll be very much surprised to learn that uh, that kind of activity suddenly stopped. I mean, why would it, right? Mm. Especially now, as China tries to increase the level of xenophobia and anxiety over foreigners and basically mm. um, reshape a little bit the Chinese psyche uh, and uh, uh, rally the troops in a way in, the, in his support because he has to reassert power because, mm -hmm. you know, things haven't been yeah, going on. Things have been slipping on the domestic front. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I'd be, I'd be very much surprised to learn that the, the Xi Jinping administration suddenly stopped the military propaganda efforts mm. um, that's not how that's not how a communist regime works yeah the only aspect that is slightly more worrying is uh, what this article doesn't mention but other articles in the in the past weeks mentioned was that uh, the incursion in, in taiwan yeah well yeah exactly well uh, it was uh, yeah not not only that uh, that fictitious battle plan uh, <laughs> of them invading uh, amphibiously the island of taiwan but in, but initially they sent just uh, just several squadrons of air superiority fighters, mm -hmm. but recently they started sending they started sending multi role mm -hmm. for multi role planes, which also which also had the capacity, by name definition, to also bomb ground targets. Mm -hmm. Of course, it, it was most likely not to get to that point because Taiwan does have uh, strong air defenses. Yeah, uh, at, at least to delay the um, the inevitable if it came to that. Yeah, still. the anti-air defenses uh, in Taiwan could probably hold on to uh, such an assault, maybe even for days. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, they only need like, what, six hours or eight hours until uh, the military base from Guam, you know, just starts going brrr mm -hmm. a little bit. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's just the scramble over the hood. Yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, um, uh, th that's why. And, the, of course, the military experts in Beijing are fully aware of that. Um, so it has to be looked uh, in more or less into a sort of a kabuki theater. Because unlike uh, other areas in the world where there has recently been scenes of warfare, or there is an attempt to get some warfare going on, see the situation in, at the border between Ukraine and Russia, mm -hmm. uh, where at the very least you have Cho Biden who really wants some war there. Uh, not exactly war, but something to please everyone, essentially. <laughs> um, please, you know. please the Democrat war hawks, war hawks, please the military industrial complex. <laughs> yeah, a struggle for peace, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Uh, no, uh, shit, now I have to explain the joke. Back in the 1970s or late 60s, and it, it, all the way till the till late 80s, there was a running joke, uh, not just in the Soviet Union but also in all of the Warsaw Pact uh, countries. Uh, it was a joke, um, more very likely launched by a KGB officer in, initially, uh, because just like in the West, there was an anxiety over uh, the possibility of nuclear warfare and things of that nature, right? And um, of course, uh, to whenever someone would express any sort of anxiety like that, oh, we don't want another war because we just ended the previous one in '45 and whatnot, mm. and the sarcastic response would have been, "Oh, don't worry, there's never going to be a war like that. It's only going to be a global strike uh, fight for peace. It's <laughs> going to be a very, <laughs> a very strong fight for peace, but it's not going to be warfare anytime soon or ever again, right?" Uh, but uh, going back to uh, uh, here, so you know, unlike 
uh, Eastern Ukraine slash Western Russia uh, mm-hmm. or Tigray, right, where there was a need for war and now there isn't anyone, and that's why it's getting mm-hmm. flattened. Nobody really wants warfare in Taiwan, and least of all in the Japanese islands, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Japan doesn't want it, China doesn't want it, Taiwan doesn't want it, the US doesn't want it, Australia doesn't want it, and that would be pretty much it, right? The, the Philippines mm-hmm. don't want it. Uh, because they all have quite a lot of domestic problems, particularly China, yeah. and they're busy with that. So, but in the meantime, of course, none of them can pretend that they don't give a shit because uh, that would be terrible optics in the, uh, in the kabuki theater that the area is. So, of course, they all pull stunts like these. Right? Uh, and uh, it's the same thing uh, because uh, that's, what, that's what I was remarking, right? So they, they went with that uh, aircraft carrier just exactly one year after they did the same thing uh, uh, in 2020, they did the mm. same thing in 2019, so it's a scheduled military exercise. Um, someone asked me yeah, on Twitter... But they haven't pushed it as far as they did as they did now, mm. which, uh, which also begs to wonder what if they're agitating for a response, but uh, at the same time, yeah, but the propaganda aspect is, all, is definitely a, a, val- a valid point. But, uh, but if they want to agitate it, for a response, how about getting very close to the territorial waters or even uh, be, accidentally be, be, get be, in? Because they, will, because they will be at fault. Mm. They, they, would, they would have been at fault, which is what they, which is what they tried to do mm. in Taiwan, which, which was constantly push the boundary of the, <laughs> of, of the so-called no-fly zone for China, for China mm-hmm. on top of Taiwan. Yeah, because, uh, you know, if you really want a response, like, you know, like Russia has been doing in the Black Sea lately, right? They, uh, in, in this case, uh, very close to where we're taping, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's clear that Russia was agitating for a response, you know, accidentally get one or two kilometers into your territorial waters. Uh, you have to call them in, send them, boy, do you want to get splattered into the smithereens? No, and they then leave, right? Yeah, but, um, but the, 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 the difference is... Uh, at least there is more discipline, and uh, and, 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 and there, there there isn't this much uh, this much poking uh, in the in the Black Sea area than uh, than the, than the, the China, South China than, 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 the, than the South China Sea, where you have multiple okay, you know, exactly exactly two factions, but multiple countries uh, uh, fighting on the same piece of bread. Yeah, that's in that, true. In that in, in that area, but there is also one thing that we can't take, that we have taken into comparison, but we can't analyze it because so only somebody from the ground can do. Is how much agitation towards to, towards a war is China doing, or if they or if they expecting that in order to in order to quietly sweep under the rug the domestic issues because they. Uh, as it's we, a common uh, tactic. As we me- as we mentioned earlier, yeah, it's uh, it's a common tactic. But this, uh, the, let's remember that last year, the, last year, the, there's there's been a huge propaganda campaign, uh, which mentioned that the COVID virus was an Amer- was a conspir- was uh, yeah, an, 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 an invention of the American military in order yeah. to undermine China. Yeah, and brought to China via the military exercise mm. Olympics or something like that that uh, yeah. took place. Um, mm. Actually, the pandemic had already started. It's just that China wasn't telling anyone about it because it was like in January or February. Yeah, uh, based on what I could gather, that did struck a few chords in in some of the Chinese nationalists. Oh yeah, and um, uh, and, and, there are, and there are quite a few of them. There are quite a few millions mm-hmm. in that com- in, in that country. But if they keep pushing for this, uh, it's difficult to say what exactly their end goal is. Is is to either provide a dis- is to either provide a short term distraction, or to or to actually rile up the nation to war, uh, in a in a uh, longer time span. About two weeks after we taped our previous episode, I spent a few days on WeChat, and there isn't much agitation in the direction of warfare. In fact, military issues are surprisingly absent from. Uh, from the main agitation central uh, in in China, right? Because, you know, their Twitter is entirely controlled by the government. So, you know, Mm -hmm. if you want to see what's up with the shills, uh, with the CCP shills inside China, what the CCP shills want the Chinese people to speak about, uh, you go on WeChat and um, uh, they're even very nice shills. They offer you a free translate button. You don't even have to speak Chinese. It automatically translates into English. Um, although they, they work much better in Russian. I'm serious. <laughs> I mean, if you select to be automatically translated into Russian, 
Um, there are much fewer um, grammar mistakes and it's much easier to follow the threads uh, than it is in English. Uh, kind of makes sense in a way uh, because most of the older shields have been schooled in Moscow. So <laughs> there's that. But what I'm saying is that um, it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, and another reason why I don't think this is the case, um, in the sense that they're riling up the nation for war, is that even in their official news you get things like these. Uh, Franz Van Quatre, uh, China hands two Uyghur ex-government officials death penalty for separatism. Two Uyghur ex-government officials in China's Xinjiang have been handed death sentences for carrying out separatist activities, a court said, as Beijing comes under increasing fire for its actions towards minority groups in the region. Uh, Shirzat Baudun, a former head of the Xinjiang Department of Justice, has been sentenced to death with a two-year reprieve on the charge of splitting the country, according to a statement released uh, Tuesday on the Xinjiang government website. Mm, ideological crimes. <laughs> By, yeah, from the special part of the criminal code. <laughs> Baudun had conspired with a terrorist organization, had taken bribes and carried out separatist activities. Wang Langtao, vice president of the Xinjiang Higher People's Court, said at a press conference, Baudun, who was found guilty of colluding with the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, uh, listed as a terrorist group by the United Nations, after meeting a key member of the group in 2003, according to state news agency Xinhua. Yeah, and you they, only found out now, come on. They spent, they spent some time digging that one up. <laughs> uh, the US removed the group from its list of terror groups last November, saying there was no credible evidence that the E-Team uh, continues to exist. Mm -hmm. Baudun uh, also illegally proved information to foreign forces, as well as carrying out illegal religious activities at his daughter's wedding. What the mm -hmm. hell did he do? Uh, the court statement uh, said Satar Sawood, former director of the Xinjiang Education Department, so chief of the Gulags, was also sentenced to death uh, with a two year reprieve after being found guilty of crimes of separatism and taking bribes. Saud was found guilty of incorporating ethnic separatism, violence, terrorism and religious extremism content into textbooks in the Uyghur language, officials said. Uh, the court said the textbooks had influenced several people to participate in attacks in the capital Urumqi, uh, including riots that resulted in at least 200 deaths in 2009. Uh, others became key members of a separatist group headed by former colleague, uh, college teacher Ilham Torti, a uh, Uyghur economist jailed for life on separatism charges in 2014. Rights groups believes at least one million Uyghurs and other mostly Muslim minorities have been incarcerated in camps across Xinjiang. The U.S. says genocide has been inflicted on the Uyghurs and other Muslim minorities in the region, while Beijing has denied all allegations of abuses and has insisted that its policies in Xinjiang are necessary to counter violent terrorism, uh, sorry, extremism. China keeps data on its use of death penalty secret, although rights group uh, Amnesty International estimates the country is the top executioner globally, with thousands executed and sentenced to death each year. A death sentence with a reprieve is usually commuted to a life sentence. Okay, so let's understand. Uh, they are... Uh, so so if, you, so if you just separatism, it's a life sentence. But if you also take bribes, <laughs> you, 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 you go straight to the sword. Yes. Okay, I, I don't know how uh, I don't know how the Chinese keep you. I know the Saudi Arabia method, which uh, is with the sword. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the, the Chinese Depending in the public square. <laughs> the Chinese are usually either using firing squad or one bullet behind the head, like Mao mm. style. Oh, um, yeah, that makes sense. And uh, definitely, they wouldn't be using the sword in Xinjiang because, <laughs> well, because, because of Islamic for, conditions. For obvious <laughs> reasons, right? Well, but, but they want to be culturally inclusive. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, they. they the Muslims will get included into the <laughs> Han uh, culture, right? So, uh, you know, one bullet is enough. Mm -hmm. uh, on a more serious note, um, um, very likely the charges are bullshit. I mean, oh, he met with someone from the East Turkestani movement, uh, what, 18 years ago? Mm -hmm. it's, and it's, for it's, some reason, uh, the whole techno, techno dictatorship that China has set up only found out about this now? No, they, they definitely kept it. Uh, no, it, it was something for uh, yeah, kept on the file for blackmail. Come mm, on, either either that one or they may or or it or they already made it up. Or yeah, it could be entirely made up. Mm -hmm. But you know, even if it were true, I mean, that that's your main allegation, really. Yeah. Right. Yeah, as far as far as I remember, yeah, the ETIM did exist, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, and and back when ISIS was still popular, they did send mm -hmm. some. Thirty-ish mm -hmm. or forty-ish Uyghur Muslims uh, to fight for ISIS, be 
but uh, that's that's about it. Yeah, but that was twelve years ago, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Uh, and six or seven or eight years ago. Mm -hmm. and now the the East Turkestani movement, the only ones uh, still claiming that it exists, not even China claims that it still mm -hmm. exists. The only ones still sort of claiming that they exist is Uzbekistan, but that's because Uzbekistan has had some. Uh, activity that kind of resembles uh, the East Turkestani movement as late as 2019. Mm -hmm. Now, whether those are, and again, the, even the Uzbek authorities, they're like, it could be those people or it could be someone else, but it kind of resembles a bit too much. So, uh, so in, the, in that aspect, um, it's kind of a global agreement that probably that movement no longer exists and remnants mm -hmm. of it, maybe they try to resurrect it, but it seems to be increasingly more difficult. And it mm -hmm. kind of makes sense considering that, uh, okay, in Uzbekistan, at the very least, they're not under that strict surveillance, but uh, most of their bases were and are in Kyrgyzstan and Xinjiang, right? And uh, Kyrgyzstan is not particularly friendly mm -hmm. uh, to these kinds of movements and Xinjiang even less so, <laughs> right? So um, <clears throat> as a result, uh, that's why I'm a very skeptical of uh, the allegations brought by the CCP. Now, the reason I'm bringing this story up is because this one kept the agenda in the last week or so on WeChat uh, with a lot of sarcasms, right? Uh, I mean, average citizens, and some of those comments, uh, probably the government censor is not smart enough, and you know, some of them uh, remained up even uh, many hours after being posted. Um, to the tune of, of course that is the case. So we, we, the party would never lie. And uh, yeah, of course the justice minister in Xinjiang was in fact an East Turkestani terrorist. Yeah, of course that makes perfect <laughs> sense. <laughs> right? uh, so, um, but this is the um, issue that is drummed up more by the domestic propaganda, countering extremism. It's uh, it's uh, foreigners in our midst that uh, uh, are creating the trouble. So they're not really rallying up for war yet anytime. Uh, and it kind of makes sense because um, look at it from, uh, from Beijing's perspective. It's not like they have a great image right now, internationally, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it would be hard for them to fish for allies, right? Um, not to mention that uh, even you know, more traditional allies are now in some sort of trouble, right? Mm -hmm. uh, even smaller ones, let's take smaller yeah, ones. Yeah, you, you, you can't rely, you're not gonna rely on North Korea, period. Yeah, you cannot rely on North Korea. Vietnam you, will never, uh, will never side with you. Russia, the, Russia has its own problems. Russia so. has a lot of domestic problems for sure. Mm. Iran is uh, locked between uh, enemy nations. Yeah, mm. Iran cannot really help unless they speed up their nuclear pro program and it doesn't seem to be going that well. <laughs> because every time they sort of seem to uh, to go, go to a breakthrough, then some random explosion happens <laughs> and the breakthrough uh, collapses. The, the breakthrough is, get, is delayed a few years. Yes, <laughs> yes, and that explosion sometimes has Hebrew letters on it, but you know, it sometimes happens. Uh, uh, yeah, right? And uh, it sometimes says Kishmir Yedishetuchus, right? Uh, so or, it, it, sounds, it just happens, right? Or, or, or a centrifuge blows up and it blows up saying Oi <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and by the way, this is openly acknowledged. I mean, just mm -hmm. recently, like three or four days ago, the Israeli justice minister basically said, yeah, the Mossad has something to do with the latest explosion in Iran. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not like it's a conspiracy or anything. It's very openly acknowledged. So you can't rely on Iran. Uh, Burma slash Myanmar, right, mm -hmm. just had a military coup and the military is definitely not a, a pro-Chinese force. Uh, it's not like the civilian government was necessarily very pro-Chinese, but at least you could negotiate with those. With the Burmese military, you can't, mm -hmm. because you can't, period, right? Uh, well, it's Nepal. Okay, yeah, okay, Nepal, <laughs> well, I guess. Well, 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 you, you, you may be able to use them as cannon fodder if it would be, if it would be a, a battle on land, but not even then, because there are not that many. Yeah, but uh, I mean, uh, it, you, 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 buy, you simply buy them with food. Yeah, <laughs> you don't it, even have to pay them. It's very difficult. What, I, what I'm saying is mm -hmm. that it would be very difficult for Beijing to fish for allies. And uh, generally, for uh, when you start a conflict like that, you really need a few. It doesn't. You don't even have to necessarily use them in warfare, 
but you really need a few allies just so you can divert attention to use for propaganda purposes to say that look mm -hmm. it's a coalition it's not just the will of xi jinping and what kind of mm -hmm. like russia does right right russia has a few places that it can say that it are its allies right so it would be syria it would be iran it would be armenia it would be mm -hmm. you know, uh, things like that Right. Uh, it's it's not necessarily or Belarus, of course. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that you know if uh, Russia, let's say, tomorrow decides to go full igloo in eastern Ukraine, it's not like they will call in troops from Belarus. No, they won't. But the idea is that you know it's a coalition and it's a little bit more complicated. It, it, it's mm -hmm. easy to sell it because you still need at least a few places in the world that where you don't have an outright negative image. China is not in that position now. It probably will be in a year or two. But not now. So mm. that's why I'm thinking that it's uh, if there's going to be a rallying up for war, um, it's not going to be this year. That's what I'm saying. Mm. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Because that's... Yeah, um, it may not be uh, that, ne that necessary because of that, because there's also another aspect. Mm. The, the perceived superiority of... Uh, of the Han Chinese themselves, which is <laughs> which is where the, the entire ethnic the entire ethnic cleansing in Xinjiang began. Yes, and uh, and I'm not sure there will be exactly a necessity for a, for a coalition or allies, be they be they close or far away, in in order to achieve such a thing. But again, that that depends on. Uh, also, look at it from an economic perspective. It's not profitable, and the CCP really needs money. First mm -hmm. and foremost, uh, it, it still has a lot of big expenses, um, like their uh, gigantic railway pro projects, which most mm -hmm. of them, yes, are built with a military uh, goal in mind, but you still mm -hmm. have to build them, mm -hmm. and that costs money. And the, the and that costs a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, some of them are like in the hundreds of billions, right? Mm -hmm. They're building a, a, a fast railway from Beijing to Tibet. That's not mm -hmm. cheap, right? Yeah, not 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 to mention. Uh, not, not to mention humongous expensive because you're building in you know, one of the highest altitudes region of all the yeah, world. Yeah, it's not a friendly r r relief, right? Mm, uh, landscape. Yeah. It's just not. Yeah. And uh, and they've already started working on it, right? But that's an ongoing expense and that's a lot of money. And, you know, the CCP can't uh, print out of thin air that much money. They have to uh, make some of it somewhat honestly, right? They have to <laughs> get it somehow. And getting it somehow, well, it's through commerce. And, you know, commerce is not a great friend of warfare. And mm -hmm. the other way around, true. So uh, that's why I'm saying it's not yet yeah. profitable. I don't think it will ever be, but it's definitely not profitable now. Why ruin that? And not to mention, they can make a lot of money via the so-called vaccine diplomacy, although not so much as we've seen lately. Even the uh, Chinese health <laughs> minister came and said, actually, <laughs> well, some of our jobs are kind of 0% efficiency. <laughs> uh, <laughs> tough. Tough. It just yeah. so happened, right? So th there are a lot of other projects that can help the CCP now that don't involve warfare, that's what I'm saying. Um, which is why I think the... Uh, well, how do you put it? Uh, how do you put it? Our empire, right, should be focused on sabotaging those rather than be focused so much on the military, uh, where it's the least likely chance of seeing some action this year. Mm. Okay, maybe next year will will be a different context, but this year it's uh, the very unlikely to see any kind of action. Mm. Mm. All right, moving further to the south, uh, you know, cnianews.com.au, transport workers union versus Cantas, airline accused of using pandemic as excuse to sack workers, the court hears. Australian air giant Cantas allegedly saw COF-19 pandemic as an opportunity to rid itself of workers who enjoyed benefits carried over from its time as a government entity, a court has heard. The Transport Workers Union has taken the iconic airline to the federal court over its decision in November to cut more than 2,000 grounds ground handler staff and outsource the jobs to contractors. Mm -hmm. Uh, the union is attempting to overturn the decision and claims <clears throat> the move to dump baggage handlers, ramp workers and cabin cleaners in order to use third-party ground services at 10 Australian airports breached the Fair Work Act. Cantas maintains the move was legal and claims it was forced to act due to the devastating impact on the pandemic, of the pandemic on aviation and tourism, saying it would save the company more than $100 million per year. Jesus. 
On Monday, the union's barrister Mark Gibeon SC told the court uh, Cantas had been endeavoring to re-gear its workforce to one without legacy conditions since its privatization in 1990. That sounds like news from Romania here. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Gibeon alleged the airline seized on a shutdown brought on by the pandemic as a transformational opportunity to shift staffing towards labor hire and contractors. It has been a long-term motivation of Cantas to obtain a workforce that didn't enjoy the previous conditions and that has been the subject of long-term dispute by its members undertaking this work, he said. The pandemic was seen as a window of opportunity in order to achieve that outcome. I've heard that rhetoric before. <laughs> the union claims up to 2,500 workers at 10 airports in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide, Darwin, Cairns, Townsville, Alice Springs and Canberra lost their jobs as a result of the move. In response, Cantas barrister Neil Young uh, told the court the decision was solely a business one made as the company bled money due to the pandemic's crippling impact on the aviation industry. <clears throat> Mr. Young said the call was made by Cantas domestic and international chief executive Andrew David and would save the company $103 million per year due to a third-party provider is more efficient and competitive offer read cheaper. The decision <laughs> to outsource was, we say, a necessary response to the devastating effect uh, the pandemic had had upon Contas's business, Mr. Young said. Effectively, each business unit ran a microscope over its operations, looking for cost savings so as to reduce the airline's overall cost base and increase its flexibility. Without those measures, its ongoing solvency and ability to survive and emerge would have been threatened. The move would also bring operations into line with the Flying Kangaroos staffing at 55 other airports where they already use specialist third-party ground service, he said. Mr. Young described this financial impact on the cough call from Cantas as extremely severe, outlining its losses of $2.7 billion last financial year and revealing it was already down $1.5 billion since July. Those financial figures are extreme, but they don't really reflect the gravity of the situation, but for the cost reduction strategies put in place across the group, he said. Several current and former high-ranking uh, Cantas executives, including Mr. David, are set to be called as witnesses in the hearing before Justice Michael Lee. Yeah. Can you imagine the salaries those guys were paid in order to save uh, $100 million? That, in, that includes the contract uh, the contract with the third parties for those airports. Yeah. Uh, so in order to save $100 million Australian dollars, but still, that's it, quite a, still like a, quite still a lot, lot of money. That, that, that means we're in the, somewhere around uh, 75 ish million, dollars, million US dollars. Million US dollars, right. Uh, it's a huge sum for twenty five for two thousand five hundred people. Yeah. So uh, and again, that's you know seventy five uh, U million U S dollars cheaper mm -hmm. by using contractors. Yeah. So Christ <laughs> Almighty, how much money did, did, did those people get paid? <laughs> I mean, um, well, I, I'm pretty sure at least those guys. Uh, for example, Alice Springs is literally in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's a regional airport. Similar to those that you see in the middle of nowhere in the U in the US mm. as well. So, you know, to convince a person to live in the wilderness, you would have to pay them a significant salary. But still, yes. not, in the, not exactly a salary to the tune of a million a year. Yes, I mean it, it, it is um, egregious, and uh, you know, I'm not a big fan of Cantas specifically because they mm. were shilling for the. Oh, you're not uh, getting experimental vaccines in your body, then you're not allowed to fly. Oh, yeah, that's that also another thing that I wanted to cover. The, what was was a contest that company mm -hmm. that, that that said that we're not going to fly passengers if, don't, if they don't get their COVID vaccine passport? Suddenly they shut up about it. Uh, <laughs> gee, I, gee, I wonder why. Um, now, Qatar Airways tried try to... The, the, they, they flew the first flight only for vaccinated people. I'm sure it will be the only flight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and, and everybody was wearing masks. Uh, yeah, of course. Ero ironically. Of course. Yes, uh, because you know, the, the, you know, this particular fluffy cough has brought the uh, clown world to a whole <laughs> different level. Uh, now, admittedly, most of this uh, clownery cannot survive, and that's why it usually happens once, and then it slowly and quietly fades away. Because uh, you know, you cannot argue against uh, against checkouts. You, you just can't. I mean, you know, the socialists yeah. tried it; they failed. Those with the unions tried it; they failed. Everyone trying to argue against checkouts. Usually, the Shekelim wins. And even if temporarily you win against Shekelim, it's usually a matter of maybe years, usually months, 
until mm -hmm. eventually Shaklim come back with vengeance and you still lose. <laughs> mm -hmm. But in this case, so, you know, as much as I despise Cantus for their initial shilling, uh, in this particular instance, I can't say that they're the bad guys in this equation. They mm -hmm. have a point. Um, for, the, for the Australians watching us, uh, the, the reason I was saying what, while I was reading the piece of news, I'm like, this, this gives a lot of Romania vibes. Maybe I could have said mm. this gives a lot of Eastern Europe vibes, vibes. We've had these kinds of scandals in Eastern Europe from 1990 and all the way till like 2005. And then they kind of stopped. Mm -hmm. uh, and not just with uh, national air, air carriers and whatever, mm. but generally, you know, car manufacturers, clothes manufacturers, whatever, all sorts of state institutions that got privatized somewhere between 1990 and 1995, maybe a little bit later for some of them. And uh, with, the, with the employees uh, grandfathered into mm -hmm. the new entity that was either partially private or entirely private, uh, under the agreement that the, those would keep their benefits until they retire or whatever. Mm, which uh, proved out to be disastrously expensive. <laughs> yes. And that's why they got let go. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, I worked in a former state carrier, um, the telecommunications carrier, right? Mm, uh, it, it had yeah. been privatized for more than seven years when I joined, so, you know, I'm, uh, nothing whatsoever to do with the state, with the government. But there were quite a few employees, uh, right, colleagues, at least they said they were colleagues, I didn't, I never acknowledged them, <laughs> um, with, who were grandfathered into the new entity um, from back in the days when it was uh, the state monopoly on mm -hmm. it. And those people were just so incredibly useless, but very, very well paid. And the private management was bending over backwards to try to convince as many of those people as possible to just take a big lump sum of money and just fuck off from the company. <laughs> and at some point, the, man, the, the private management was getting so desperate that they would pay them even more than they would have made. So let's say they, would, uh, they were still uh, supposed to be working for the company another five years in which they would make, I don't know, let's say um, $500,000. The company would like, take a million and leave now, mm. please. <laughs> <laughs> because they couldn't be fired because of that agreement with the government mm -hmm. and they would have to be kept and so take a million and leave now just go because they they were they were costing the company more by messing things around by, by being a hindrance to the development of the mm -hmm. company and by, by and by and by occupying a space yes. where it could which could yes. be occupied by a more competent and more up-to-date person yes you know? yes and they, uh, so as a result of uh, i've seen these kinds of things happening in many sectors of the economy uh, as a result of, um, well, pro-union, pro-worker kind of policies that uh, were applied exactly where you shouldn't be applying them, right? Because again, uh, these kinds of policies, maybe they make, a, make sense when, either when the company is entirely state-owned state and remains state-owned, or is entirely pr private and remains private. But when there is a transfer of property between the two, either through the state buys the company and starts owning, or the other way around, the private sector buys it from the state, that's exactly mm -hmm. where you shouldn't be applying that. Because uh, when these kinds of transfers of property happen, and uh, the management in particular, that's when the company goes through, well, a great reset, essentially. Mm -hmm. Because there is going to be an entirely different way of looking at the world and looking at the company. And grandfathering in employees in such a way that you know preserves benefits and makes them unfireable essentially uh that's a that's a way of um, bleeding the new entity dry um so you know, as much as i despise cantas i can't disagree with them here mm -hmm. it is what it is reuters uh, i believe this is the uh, last one yeah it is um, New Zealand introduces climate change law for financial firms in the world first. New Zealand has become the first country to introduce a law that will require banks, insurers and investment managers to report the impacts of climate change on their business, Minister for Climate Change James Shaw said on Tuesday. Now there's your problem, why do you have a Minister for Climate Change? All banks with total assets uh, more than 1 billion New Zealand dollars, insurers with more than 1 billion dollars in total assets under management, and all equity and debt issuers listed on the country's stock exchange 
will have to make disclosures. We simply cannot get to uh, net zero carbon emissions by 2050 unless the financial sector knows what impact their investments are having on the climate, Shaw said in a statement. This law will bring uh, climate risks and resiliency to the heart of financial and business decision making. No, it won't. Uh, the bill, which uh, has been introduced in the country's parliament and is expected to receive its first reading this week, requires financial firms to explain how they would manage climate-related risks and opportunities. Around 200 of the country's biggest companies and several foreign firms that meet the one billion NZ dollars threshold will come under the legislation. Disclosures will be required for financial years beginning next year once the law is passed, meaning that the first reports will be made by companies in 2023. The New Zealand government last September said it would make the financial sector report on climate risks and those unable to disclose would have to explain their reasons. The New Zealand, I'm sure there will be the Department of Explaining the Reasons. That, that's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, the New Zealand uh, government has introduced several policies to lower emissions during its second term including promising to make its public sector carbon neutral by 2025. That's easy, you, you all just resign. <laughs> it's very carbon neutral. And uh, by only zero emissions <clears throat> uh, public transport buses from the middle of this decade. There is no such thing as zero emissions public transport buses, period. They don't exist. Prime Minister Yan Whatever, uh, who returned to power last October, delivering the biggest election victory for the far left, uh, sorry, center left <laughs> Labour Party in half a century, had called climate change the nuclear free moment of our generation. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, so, as a rule, whenever this kind of disdainful nonsense becomes policy, and you, first of all, it doesn't usually last more than five years. I suspect this will have the same fate. Because eventually someone will vote for someone else and uh, they will have to come up with the conclusion mm -hmm. that the emperor is naked and this is <laughs> bullshit. But until that happens, right, I suspect, and uh, you know, 2023 is not far away from now, so you know, by 2024 it will be clear whether I was right or wrong. Uh, but I suspect all or most of the companies following under, uh, this piece of legislation will just... Uh, write this one off as another cost of compliance and we'll create something maybe it will be called the department for finding reasons to justify <laughs> not to be transparent but it will be basically somewhere within the internal bureaucracy of the company in the cost of compliance um portion of the excel table <laughs> I mean, another extra hundred thousand new zealand yeah, dollars or whatever yeah, it's it's there's not even an excel table they're just going to use the quickbooks mm -hmm. <laughs> table <laughs> yeah so what i'm saying is that um, uh, it's just another entry barrier uh it's not even a big one so you know it could be probably many smes would be able to afford it as well uh why because it's easier that's no, why. but it's, it's not even SMEs. It's go. It's going straight to the throat of the, of the those two hundred or so companies that actually have the, that actually do comply with the capital requirement, mm -hmm. uh, in order to report to uh, so, such a thing. Well, this puts the government in a pretty bad position because you're you 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 are exactly going into a mud pit and uh, and tr and trying try to tackle a titan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because and the reason they're going to do this is not because they necessarily don't give a shit about the topic. Now, of course, many of them don't. But even if you find uh, among those 200 companies, of course, there's going to be at least one or two or maybe 10 mm -hmm. who actually take this shit seriously. But even those will eventually have to end up to the conclusion that it's cheaper to create a department for finding reasons not mm -hmm. to be transparent for one simple reason. It's easier. Because you cannot require, mm. uh, especially an investment fund, right? Mm. To, to disclose the, the it, yeah, it, it's, it, it's even so, such a humongous bureaucratic process where you have to go and analyze this investment that you've done. It could be, it, it could be an investment of a hundred dollars. Well, okay, it doesn't exactly happen to invest a hundred dollars as a fund that has even that has one billion New Zealand no, dollars as capital base. But, but it could be 10,000. Yeah, it could, be, it, could, it could be anything from 10,000 to 100, 200 million. It would be impossible to, choose to send a person and do, or, or, or even hire someone who actually knows their stuff mm -hmm. in order to analyze what exactly is the, what exactly is the climate risk of this investment. <laughs> and okay, okay, okay so say, say that you can do this domestically. How exactly would you, how exactly would you have to analyze this for for any foreign investment, what are you gonna do? Are you, are you gonna sell one of those analysts uh, 
God knows where in uh, in the Philippines. In the, send, send them in the send them in the Philippines or send them to Svalbard. You know, you know, analyze what exactly. What exactly is the impact of this? Uh, what, how much water is consuming? How much water is polluting? How, how much CO two is it emitting? <laughs> yeah, and I don't know. And this is uh, this is me being ignorant. But I don't know how, if New Zealand has a similar legislation with the U.S. Right? In the U.S., <laughs> you can, as a federal government, uh, bother companies about their uh, investments abroad. Right. Uh, but uh, but even there, the primacy is, uh, you know, um, the focus of the legislation in the U.S. is uh, not to commit, you know, high treason or bribes or things like that. But generally, mm -hmm. the primacy is whether you ob observe the local laws first and then uh, some various conditions that the federal government sometimes imposed. And it's usually on very specific and pointed issues, not a blanket one like this one. Uh, I don't know if New Zealand has like something like that, but if it doesn't, then uh, basic law would tell us, you know, at the end of the day, the background is still in English common law. Basic law would tell us that it's very easily to action, uh, to, to sue the state, essentially, and say, yeah. I'm sorry, what the hell is your business? Can you prove that I broke a law in... <laughs> Well, Indonesia, for instance, right? Let's mm. say I'm, a I'm an investment fund and I make an investment in Indonesia to build, I don't know, a sweatshop. Oh, just saying. Can you prove that I broke the law there? I did it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can you prove that I broke the uh, World Trade Organization standards? No. Did I break human rights? No. Then what the hell is your problem? Mm. Oh no, the heating in the sweatshop is, um, you know, with, uh, by burning wood or I don't know, whatever. <laughs> well, I don't know how much CO2 emits. Because <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, I'm not there to see how much wood they're, they're burning. Yeah, it, it creates on top, of the, on top of the bureaucratic clusterfuck that's part of these. Uh, um, that part of these financial companies, because if, from a county point of view, they they function the complete opposite that uh, that a normal business functions. Mm -hmm. It it also it also piles up a huge amount of bureau of bureaucracy and paperwork that has to be filed in order to provide uh, explanations as to how much uh, how much CO two does this business emit or, or why exactly is the climate impact uh, which mm. you, which is. Which is very vague, uh, very vaguely defined uh, yes. by this and, article, and it could become a very complex kind of uh, mm -hmm. response, which may cost more to honestly assess and provide. Mm -hmm. uh, it will cost a lot more than to simply provide someone to come up with legal answers that could work around the law. Mm -hmm. Which is why I'm why I'm saying that most, if if not eventually all of the companies under this particular uh, piece of legislation, <laughs> will just create the the department of finding excuses yeah or or depending on uh, depending on how on how the on how the law functions in the in the case of new zealand uh, they could easily break up those two businesses into in, into different branches and, oh, yeah. and, and, and then at that point nobody will be compliant in order to have to yeah, answer it, to this if it if it ends up being that expensive yeah, to comply. It, eventually yeah. everyone will be having roughly 990 million New Zealand nine, dollars. 999 uh, nine, nine nine million New Zealand dollars capitalization. <laughs> now, you know, that doesn't apply to us, Tom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the same person owns 50 firms that are uh, like 990. Well, tough. It's a, just a pure coincidence, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, or if the sanction, presumably it would be a fine, right? If the fine mm. is not big enough, the companies be like, you know what, we're going to pay the fine. Cost of doing business. Cost of doing business, <laughs> and that's it, we're going to pay the fine. Mm. Uh, because uh, because it, it really is, um, I would go as far as to say it is retarded. Uh, because, again, I could understand it, um, even though I strongly disagree with it, but at least it would make sense if you were to impose such a condition domestically. But on any investment, they, but no, mm. because it, it, and not to mention it would break uh, one of those very fundamental principles of law that stopped all of these initiatives so far and will stop this one as well. Namely that you cannot force me, whether me is a physical person or a judicial uh, or an entity, be it LLC or investment fund or whatever, mm. you cannot stop me from... Uh, <clears throat> 
breaking the laws of this country while not being in this country. Right? Mm -hmm. um, to give an example, uh, in 2014, uh, some very smart ass, uh, big smart ass from the Swedish parliament had this uh, very noble idea of uh, attempting to punish Swedish citizens who would go to Denmark to visit, uh, well, a whorehouse, right, a brothel. Right. A brothel yeah. And uh, the question was, are Swedish citizens obliged to observe Swedish law while not being in Sweden? And the mm -hmm. answer is no, because they weren't breaking any law in Denmark. Prostitution is legal in, in uh, Denmark. Uh, and, you know, you cannot punish someone for breaking the Swedish law while not being in Sweden. Yeah, the, the only country that I know that, punish, that punishes such things is the United Arab Emirates for its, but just its citizens only. So you, if, if you are an Emirati citizen, you, you have to respect both the laws of your own country and the country that you're in at that moment. Uh, if, if, if you don't, you're fucked both where you, both where you committed it and back home, what are you going to get back? Yeah, I'm not sure. I guess it really does depend on the law because I'm not sure about the enforcement considering that there are many contradictions between the two. Mm. Uh, like for instance, or most recently, the, Emirate, the United Arab Emirates relaxed its conditions on alcohol, right? Mm. Uh, but you still need a license for it, um, right? It's very, it's much easier to get it now than it was mm. when you were living it, there. It's, uh, mm. it, it depends on the Emirates. Uh... I know, but um, uh, you know, in the concept of getting a license in order in order to drink alcohol doesn't exist in Europe. So, mm. did you break the Emirati law or not? <laughs> or do you have to go present your Emirati license to go to this, uh, go to this supermarket and buy a beer? Th that's what I'm saying. I mean, I, yeah, I, I it, think yeah, it depends. Yeah, but most likely it will be for particularly egregious fear. Like, for example, if you committed murder, then you get you get a jail sentence there, and then you get to get the jail sentence back. Ah, or, right, right. Or you're gonna get a jail sentence there because the law says so. Then you're gonna get the then get the death then, you're gonna, then you're gonna get the death penalty when you come back. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you're stupid enough to come get back, right? Uh, yeah. But what I'm saying is that, uh, and again, we're giving these examples because okay, this one is an administrative kind of le regulation, but the principle stays, mm -hmm. right? You cannot force me. When I, me being this time around of an investment fund, right? I take money from mm -hmm. my investment fund and go physically to Indonesia or Thailand or the Philippines or or Germany, whatever, doesn't matter, go somewhere else, right? And spend my money there as an investment this time around. You cannot force New Zealand conditions on my own money being spent somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That is none of your business. Because even, even if you have an economic treaty between the two countries, you can still not regulate that. And it makes perfect sense not to, because imagine if everyone were to do that. The, the judicial clusterfuck in uh, World Trade Organization arbitration courts would be mm -hmm. endless. Mm -hmm. You just cannot do that. It, I don't care if you want to. Logistically speaking, it cannot be done. As a result, you won't do it. I don't care what Jacinda Ardern says in public, it's just not doable. Yeah, sure, domestically, I'm sure it will apply uh, for a while, not for long, but <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. And at least you can observe it there, you can, uh, uh, you can do enforcement for sure, you can send inspectors, whatever, that's doable. But attempting to police investments for climate crimes, <laughs> <laughs> thousands upon thousands of kilometers away from the... Mm. You're gonna do what? Come on. Yeah, no, <laughs> and not to mention the all exhaustive argument of uh, of of trying to control climate change by doing this bollocks. Well, let's see. Well, well, well let's see. How much will it hurt the climate? You know, in in order to in order to simply make the paper required to be compliant for such a thing. Uh, Right. Be because you, it's def it's def you're definitely not going to send uh, an electronic document uh, out of, of thousands of tens of thousands of pages mm -hmm. for each business as to how much is affected the how much is, how much is affected the environment based on some uh, arbitrary measurements uh, with no scientific backing, by the way. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure the criteria will be very, very precise, and there will be no ar no arbitrary nonsense whatsoever mm -hmm. because we know that the Labour Party is very capable of producing. Mm -hmm. a, come on. Come on, it's just not gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. I'm sure they'll try. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Jacinda fe feels like she has a, a strong mandate to do so, and I'm sure her government will try. What I'm saying is, it's not gonna work. <laughs> and, and by the way, even if you make it entirely electronically, 
how much electricity would be consumed to produce that kind of documentation? Wouldn't that hurt the environment? Can I can I put that one as well to say the <laughs> government is at fault for this one, and maybe maybe subtract it from no. the impact of my own investment? No, uh, it, no, or, 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 you, or you could find uh, okay some sort of nebulous sounding term uh, which could which could be the which could be the the effect on climate for 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 government governmental compliance <laughs> yeah that, that's right right the by impact on government on uh, regulatory compliance upon climate or uh, mm -hmm. yeah uh, mm -hmm. If we try hard enough, we can find a very nice euphemism for saying the, the government sucks balls. <laughs> right. All right. That will be pretty much it for the 13th episode. Um, two weeks from now, see you again on the sofa, basically. Uh, very likely also on this sofa, at mm -hmm. least for a while. Uh, we're back on this sofa. Um, any other things that have to be said? Please. Oh yeah, give shaker, give shaker. Yeah, uh, you know we are. Uh, there is an old Romanian movie that uh, has a very famous line that uh, the, the hand that doesn't tell a story doesn't get shaker. So you know, we've said well, roughly five hours of stories. So now give shaker. <laughs> All right. With all that being said, thanks a lot for watching. Cheers. Cheers.